There are only two precious things on earth. The first is love. The second, a long way behind it, is intelligence. Gaston Berger Life has no meaning but what we give it. I wish a few more of ye would give it a little. Elminster of Shadowdale Verba volant scripta manent Prelude Of course, Lord Morngrim, Leo replied, gesturing up the stairs with a ladle that was still dripping jalanth sauce. He's in his study. You know the way. Morngrim nodded his thanks to Elminster Scribe and took the dusty stairs two at a time, charging urgently up into the gloom. The old mage's instructions had been quite... He came to a halt, dust swirling around him mockingly. The cozy little room held the usual crammed shelves, worn carpet, and comfortable chair, and Elminster's pipe was floating, ready above the side table. But of the old mage himself... There was no sign. Morngrim shrugged and dashed up the next set of stairs to the spell chamber. A glowing circle pulsed alone on the floor there, cold and white. The small circular room was otherwise empty. The Lord of Shadowdale hesitated a moment and then mounted the last flight of stairs. He'd never dared disturb the old mage in his bedchamber before, but the door was ajar. Morngrim peered in cautiously, hand going to his sword hilt out of long habit. Stars twinkled silently and endlessly in the dark domed ceiling over the circular bed that filled the room. But that resting place hadn't been slept in since the dust had settled. The room was as empty of life as the others, unless he was invisible or had taken on the shape of a book or something of the sort. Elminster was nowhere in his tower. Morngrim looked warily all around, hairs prickling on the backs of his hands. The old mage could be anywhere, on worlds and plains only he and the gods knew of. Morngrim frowned, and then shrugged. After all, what did anyone in the realms, besides the Seven Sisters, perhaps, really know about Elminster's plans or his past? I wonder, the Lord of Shadowdale mused aloud as he started the long walk back down to Leo, where Elminster came from, anyway. Was he ever a young lad? Where and what was the world like then? It must have been great fun growing up as a powerful wizard. Prologue it was the hour of the casting of the cloak when the goddess Shar hurled her vast garment of purple darkness and glittering stars across the sky. The day had been cool, and the night promised to be clear and cold. The last rosy embers of day glimmered on the long hair of a lone rider from the west, and lengthening shadows crept ahead of her. The woman looked around at the gathering night as she rode. Her liquid black eyes were large and framed by arched brows, stern power and keen wits at odds with demure beauty. Whether for the power or the beauty there, most men did not look past the honey-brown tresses curling around her pert white face, and even queens lusted after her beauty. One at least did, of a certainty. Yet as she rode along, her large eyes held no pride only sadness. In the spring, wildfires had raged across all these lands, leaving behind legions of charred and leafless spars instead of the lush green beauty she recalled. Such fond memories were all that was left of Hallangorn Forest now. As dusk came down on the dusty road, a wolf howled somewhere away to the north. The call was answered from near at hand, but the lone rider showed no fear. Her calm would have raised the eyebrows of the hardened knights who dared ride this road only in large, well-armed patrols, and their wary surprise would not have ended there. The lady rode easily, a long cloak swirling around her, time and again flapping around her hips and hampering her sword arm. 
Only a fool would allow such a thing. But this tall, lean lady rode the perilous road without even a sword at her hip. A patrol of knights would have judged her either a madwoman or a sorceress, and reached for their blades accordingly. They'd not have been wrong. She was mere Jala, dark eyes, as the silvern sigil on her cloak proclaimed. Mere Jala was feared for her wild ways as much for the might of her magic, but though all folk feared her, many farmers and townsfolk loved her. Proud lords in castles did not. She'd been known to hurl down cruel barons and plundering knights like a vengeful whirlwind, leaving blazing bodies in dark warning to others. In some places, she was most unwelcome. As night's full gloom fell on the road, Mirjala slowed her horse, twisted in her saddle, and did off her cloak. She spoke a single soft word, and the cloak twisted in her hands, changing from its usual dark green to a russet hue. The silver mage sigil slithered and writhed like an angry snake and became a pair of entwined golden trumpets. The transformation did not end with the cloak. Mirjala's long curls darkened and shrank about her shoulders. Shoulders suddenly alive and broadening with roiling humps of muscle. The hands that donned the cloak again had become hairy and stubby-fingered. They plucked a scabbard blade out from the pack behind the saddle and belted it on. Thus armed, the man in the saddle arranged his cloak so its newly shaped herald badge could be clearly seen, listened to the wolf howl again, closer now, and calmly urged his mount forward at a trot over one last hill. Ahead lay a castle where a spy dined this night, a spy for the evil wizards bent on seizing the stag throne of Athalantar. That realm lay not far off to the east. The man in the saddle stroked his elegant beard and spurred his horse onward. Where the most feared sorceress in these lands might be met with arrows and ready blades, a Lord Herald was always welcome. Yet magic was the best blade against a wizard's spy. The guards were lighting the lamps over the gate as the herald's horse clottered over the wooden drawbridge. The blade on his cloak and tabard were recognized, and he was greeted with quiet courtesy by the gate guards. A bell tolled once within, and the knight of the gate bade him hasten in to the evening feast. Be welcome in Moreland Castle if ye come in peace. The herald bowed his head in the usual silent response. "'Tis a long way from Tavare, Lord Herald. Ye must know hunger,' the knight added less formally, helping him down from his mount. The herald took a few slow steps, awkward with saddle stiffness, and smiled thinly. Startling dark eyes rose to meet those of the knight. "'Oh, I've come much farther than that,' the herald said softly, nodding a wordless farewell." and strode away into the castle. He walked like a man who knew his way, and welcome well. The knight watched him go, face expressionless in puzzlement. An armsman nearby leaned close and murmured, No spurs, and no esquires or armsmen. What manner of herald is this? The knight of the gate shrugged. If he lost them on the road, or there's some other tale of interest, we'll know it soon enough. See to his horse. He turned, then stiffened in fresh surprise. The herald's horse was standing near and watching him, for all of the world as if it were listening to their talk. It nodded and took a half-step to bring its reins smoothly to the armsman's hand. The men exchanged wary glances before the armsman led it away. The knight watched them for a moment before shrugging and striding back to the mouth of the gate. There'd be much talk on watch later, whatever befell. Out in the night nearby, a wolf howled again. One of the horses snorted and stamped nervously. Then a window in the castle above flickered with sudden light, magical light from a battle spell, and the battle was joined. There was a terrific commotion within, scattering plates and overturned tables, shrieks of serving maids, and roars of flame. Next moment, these sounds were joined by the shouts of the knights in the courtyard below. That had been no herald, and from the sound and smell of it, others within the castle were not what they seemed either. 
The knight gritted his teeth and clenched his sword, starting for the keep. If Moreland fell to these wicked spell slingers, would the stag king fall next? And if all Athalantar fell, there would be years upon years of sorcerous tyranny. Aye, there would be ruin and misery ahead. And who could ever rise to oppose these mage lords? Part 1 Brigand 1. Dragonfire and Doom Dragons? Splendid things, lad, so long as ye look upon them only in tapestries or in the masks worn at revels, or from about three realms off. Astragarl Hornwood, Mage of Elambar, said to an apprentice, Year of the Tusk. The sun beat down bright and hot on the rock pile that crowned the high pasture. Far below, the village cloaked in trees lay under a blue-green haze of mist, magic mist, some said, conjured by the mist mages of the fair folk, whose magic worked both good and ill. The ill things were spoken of more often, of course, for many folk in Helden did not love elves. Elminster was not one of them. He hoped to meet the elves some day, really meet, that is, to touch smooth skin and pointed ears, to converse with them. These woods had once been theirs, and they yet knew the secret places where beasts laired and such like. He'd like to know all that some day, when he was a man and could walk where he pleased. El sighed, shifted into a more comfortable position against his favorite rock, and from habit glanced at the falling slopes of the meadow to be sure his sheep were safe. They were. Not for the first time, the bony, beak-nosed youth peered south, squinting. Brushing unruly jet-black hair aside with one slim hand, he kept his fingers raised to shade his piercing blue-gray eyes, trying vainly to see the turrets of far-off splendid Athelgard in the heart of Hastarl by the river. As always, he could see the faint bluish haze that marked the nearest curve of Delambir, but no more. Father told him often that the castle was much too far off to be seen from here, and from time to time added that the fair span of distance between it and their village was a good thing. Elminster longed to know what that meant, but this was one of the many things his father would not speak of. When asked, he settled his oft-smiling lips into a stony line, and his level gray eyes would meet Elminster's own with a sharper look than usual, but no words ever emerged. El hated secrets, at least those he didn't know. He'd learn all the secrets someday, somehow. Someday, too, he'd see the castle the minstrel said was so splendid, mayhap even walk its battlements. Aye. A breeze ghosted gently over the meadow, bending the weed heads briefly. It was the year of flaming forests in the month of Eliasius, a few days short of Elind. Already the nights were turning very cold. After six seasons of minding sheep on the high meadow, El knew it'd not be long before leaves were blowing about, and the fading would truly begin. The shepherd lad sighed and shrugged his worn, patched leather jerkin closer about him. It had once belonged to a forester. Under a patch on the back, it still bore a ragged, dark-stained hole where an arrow, an elfin arrow, some said, had taken the man's life. Elminster wore the old jack, scabbard buckles, tears from long-gone lord's badges and worn edges from past adventures, for all the dash its history made him feel. Sometimes, though, he'd wished it fit him a little better. A shadow fell over the meadow, and he looked up. From behind him came a sharp, rippling roar of wind he'd never heard before. He spun around, his shoulder against the rock, and sprang up for a better view. He needn't have bothered. The sky above the meadow was filled with two huge bat-like wings, and between them a dark red scaled bulk larger than a house. Long taloned claws hung beneath a belly that rose into a long, long neck, which ended in a head that housed two cruel eyes 
and a wide, gaping jaw lined with jagged teeth, as long as Elminster was tall. Trailing back far behind, over the hill, a tail switched and swung. A dragon. Elminster forgot to gulp. He just stared. Vast and terrible, it swept toward him, slowing ponderously with wings spread to catch the air, looming against the blue northern sky. And there was a man on its back. Dragon at the gate, Elminster whispered the oath unthinkingly, as that gigantic head tilted a little, and he found himself gazing full into the old, wise, and cruel eyes of the great worm. Deep they were, and unblinking, pools of dark evil into which he plunged, sinking, sinking. The dragon's claws bit deeply into the rock pile with a shriek of riven stone and a spray of sparks. It reared up twice as high as the tallest tower in the village, and those great wings flapped once. In their deafening thunderclap, Elminster was flung helplessly back and away, head over heels down the slope as sheep tumbled and bleated their terror around him. He landed hard, rolling painfully on one shoulder. He should run, should... Swords! He spat the strongest oath he knew as he felt his frantic run being dragged to a halt by something unseen. A trembling, quivering boiling arose in his veins. Magic! He felt himself turning, being pulled slowly around to face the dragon. Elminster had always hoped to see magic at work up close, but instead of the wild excitement he'd expected, El found he didn't like the feel of magic at all. Anger and fear awoke in him as his head was forced up. No, did not like it at all. The dragon had folded its wings and now sat atop the rock pile like a vulture. A vulture as tall as a keep, with a long tail that curled half around the western slope of the meadow. Elminster gulped. His mouth was suddenly dry. The man had dismounted and stood on a sloping rock beside the dragon, an imperious hand raised to point at Elminster. Elminster felt his gaze dragged, that horrible, helpless feeling in his body again, the cruel control of another's will moving his own limbs, to meet the man's eyes. Looking into the eyes of the dragon had been terrible, but somehow splendid. This was worse. These eyes were cold and promised pain and death. Perhaps more. El tasted the cold tang of rising fear. There was cruel amusement in the man's almond eyes. El forced himself to look a little down and aside, and saw the dusky skin around those deadly eyes and coppery curls and a winking pendant on the man's hairless breast. Under it were markings on the man's skin, half hidden by his robe of darkest green. He wore rings, too, of gold and some shining blue metal, and soft boots finer than any L had ever seen. The faint blue glow of magic, something Father had said only Elminster could see and must never speak of, clung to the pendant, the rings, the robes, and the markings on the man's breast, as well as to what looked like the ends of smoothed wooden sticks protruding from high slits on the outside of the man's boots. That rare glow rippled more brightly around the man's outstretched arm, but Elminster didn't need any other secret sign to know that this was a wizard. What is the name of the village below? The question was cold, quick. Heldon? The name left Elminster's lips before he could think. He felt spittle flooding his mouth, and with it a hint of blood. Is its lord there now? Elminster struggled, but found himself saying, I-I. The wizard's eyes narrowed. Name him. He raised his hand, and the blue glow flared brighter. Elminster felt a sudden eagerness to tell this rude stranger everything. Everything. Cold fear coiled inside him. Elthrin, Lord. He felt his lips trembling. Describe him. He's tall, Lord, and slim. He smiles often and always has a kind w What hue is his hair? The wizard snapped. B brown Lord, with gray at the sides and in his beard, he's— The wizard made a sharp gesture, and Elminster felt his limbs moving by themselves. He tried to fight against them, whimpering, but already he was wheeling about and running. He pounded hard through the grass, helpless against the driving magic, stumbling in haste, 
charging down the grassy slope to where the meadow ended, in a sheer drop into the ravine. As he churned along through the weeds and tall grass, El clung to a small victory. At least he'd not told the wizard that Elthrin was his father. Small victory indeed. The cliff edge seemed to leap at him. The wind of his breathless run roared past his ears. The rolling countryside of Athalantar below looked beautiful in the mists. Headlong Elminster rushed over the edge and felt the terrible trembling compulsion leave him. As the rocks rushed up to meet him, he struggled against fear and fury, trying to save his life. Sometimes he could move things with his mind. Sometimes, please, gods, let it be now. The ravine was narrow, the rocks very near. Only last month a lamb had fallen in, and the life had been smashed from it long before its broken, law-limbed body had settled at the bottom. Elminster bit his lip, and then the white glow he was seeking rose and stole over his sight, veiling his view of rushing rocks. He clawed at the air with desperate fingers and twisted sideways, as if he'd grown wings for an instant. Then he was crashing through a thorn bush, skin burning as it slashed open a dozen times. He struck earth and stone, then something springy, a vine, and was flung away, falling again. Ugh! Onto rocks this time, hard. The world spun. El gasped for breath he could not find, and the white haze rose around his eyes. Gods and goddesses preserve. The haze rose and then receded, and then, from above, came a horrible snapping sound. Something dark and wet fell past him, to the rocks unseen in the gloom below. El shook his head to clear it and peered around. Fresh blood dappled the rocks close by. The sunlight overhead dimmed. Elminster froze, head to one side, and tried to look dead. His arms and ribs and one hip throbbed and ached, but he'd been able to move them all. Would the wizard or the dragon come down to make sure he was dead? The dragon wheeled over the meadow, one limb of a sheep dangling from its jaws, and passed out of his view. When its next languid circle brought it back over the ravine, two sheep were struggling in its mouth. The crunching sounds began again as it passed out of sight. Elminster shuddered, feeling sick and empty. He clung to the rock as if its hard, solid strength could tell him what to do now. Then the rippling roar of the dragon's wings rose again, El lay as still as possible, head still twisted awkwardly. Letting his mouth fall open, he stared steadily off into a cloudless sky. The wizard in his high saddle gave the huddled boy a keen look as the dragon rushed past, and then leaned forward and shouted something Elminster couldn't catch, which echoed and hissed in the mouth of the ravine. The dragon's powerful shoulders surged in response, and it rose slightly, only to drop down out of sight in a dive so swift that the raw sound of its rushing wings rose to a shrill scream, a dive toward Heldon. El found its feet, wincing and staggering, and stumbled along the ravine to its end, hissing as every moment made him ache. There was a place he'd climbed before. His fingers bled as they scraped over sharp rocks. A terrible fear was rising inside him, almost choking him. At last he reached the grassy edge of the meadow, rolled onto it, gasping, and looked down at Heldon. Then Elminster found he still had breath enough to scream. A woman shrieked outside. A moment later, the incessant din of hammering from the smithy came to a sudden, ragged stop. Frowning, Elthrin Aumar rose from the farm tallies in haste, scattering clay tiles. He sighed at his own clumsiness as he snatched his blade down from the wall and strode out into the street, tearing the steel free of the scabbard as he went. Tallies that wouldn't balance all morning, and now this. What was it now? The lion sword, oldest treasure of Athalantar, shone its proud flame as he came out into the sunlight. Strong magics slumbered in the old blade, and as always, it felt solid in Elthrin's hand hungry for blood. It flashed as he looked quickly about. Folk were shrieking and running wildly down the street, faces white in sheer terror. Elthrin had to duck out of the way of a woman so fat that he was astonished she could run at all, one of Tesla's seamstresses, and turned to look north at the dark bulk of the high forest. 
The street was full of his neighbors running south down the road past him. Some were weeping as they came. A haze, smoke, was in the air whence they'd come. Brigands? Orcs? Something out of the woods? He ran up the road, the enchanted blade that was his proudest possession naked in his hand. The sharp reek of burning came to him. A sick fear was already rising in his throat when he rounded the butcher's shop and behind it found the fire. His own cottage was an inferno of leaping flame. Perhaps she'd been out, but no, no. Amrythale, he whispered. Sudden tears blinded him, and he wiped at them with his sleeve. Somewhere in all that roaring were her bones. He knew some folk had whispered that a common forester's lass must have used witchery to find a bridal bed with one of the most respected princes in Athalantar, but Elthrin had loved her, and she him. He gazed in horror at her pyre, and in his memory saw her smiling face. As the tears rolled down his cheeks, the prince felt a black rage build inside him. Who has done this thing? he roared. His shout echoed back from the now-empty shops and houses of Helden, but was answered only by crackling flames, and then by a roar so loud and deep that the shops and houses around trembled, and the very cobbles of the street shifted under his boots. Amid the dust that curled up from them, the prince looked up and saw it, aloft, wheeling with contemptuous laziness over the trees an elder red dragon of great size, its scales dark as dried blood. A man wrote it, a man in robes who held a wand ready, a man Elthrin did not know, but a wizard without a doubt, and that could mean only one thing. The cruel hand of his eldest brother Belor was finally about to close on him. Elthrin had been his father's favorite, and Belor had always hated him for it, the king had given Elthrin the lion sword. It was all he had left of his father now. It had served him often and well. But it was a legacy, not a miracle spell. As he heard the wizard laugh and lean out to hurl lightning down at some villager fleeing over the pack fields, Prince Elthrin looked up into the sky and saw his own death there, wheeling on proud wings. He raised the lion sword to his lips, kissed it, and summoned the lean, serious face of his son to mind, bleak-nosed and surrounded by an unruly mane of jet-black hair. Elminster, with all his loneliness, seriousness, and homeliness, and with his secret, the mind powers the gods gave few folk in Faroon. Perhaps the gods had something special in mind for him. Clinging to that last slim hope, Elthrin clutched the sword and spoke through tears. Live, my son, he whispered. Live to avenge thy mother and restore honor to the stag throne. Hear me. Panting his slithering way down a tree-clad slope, still a long way above the village, Elminster stiffened and fetched up breathless against a tree, his eyes blazing. The ghostly whisper of his father's voice was clear in his ears. He was calling on a power of his enchanted sword that El had seen him use only once, when his mother had been lost in a snow squall. He knew what those words meant. His father was about to die. I'm coming, father, he shouted at the unhearing trees around. I'm coming! And he stumbled on, recklessly leaping deadfalls and crashing through thickets, gasping for breath, knowing he'd be too late. Grimly, Elthrin Aumar set his feet firmly on the road, raised his sword, and prepared to die as a prince should. The dragon swept past, ignoring the lone man with the sword as its rider pointed two wands and calmly struck down the fleeing folk of Helden with hurled lightning and bolts of magic. As he swept over the prince, the wizard carelessly aimed one wand at the lone swordsman below. There was a flash of white light, and then the whole world seemed to be dancing and crawling. Lightning crackled and coiled around Elthrin but he felt no pain. The blade in his hands drew the magic into itself in angrily crawling arcs of white fire until it was all gone. The prince saw the wizard turn in his saddle and frown back at him, holding the lion sword high so that the mage could see it, hoping he could lure the wizard down to seize it, and knowing that hope vain. 
Elthrin lifted his head to curse the man, speaking the slow, heavy words he'd been taught so long ago. The wizard made a gesture, and then his mouth fell open in surprise. The curse had shattered whatever spell he'd cast at Elthrin. As the dragon swept on, he aimed his other wand at the prince. Bolts of force leaped from it and were swept into the enchanted blade, which sang and glowed with their fury, thrumming in Elthrin's hands. Spells it could stop, but not dragon fire. The prince knew he had only a few breaths of life left. O oh, Mistra, let my boy escape this, he prayed as the dragon turned in the air with slow might and swept down on him. And let him have the sense to flee far. Then he had no time left for prayers. Bright dragon fire roared around Elthrin Amar, and as he snarled defiance and swung his blade at the raging flames, he was overwhelmed and swept away. Elminster burst out onto the village street by the miller's house, now only a smoking heap of shattered timbers and tumbled stones. A single hand, blackened by fire that had breathed death through the house and swept on, protruded from under the collapsed chimney, clutching vainly at nothing. Elminster looked down at it, swallowed, and hurried on around the heap of ruin. After only a few paces, however, his running steps faltered, and he stood staring. There was no need for haste. Every building in Heldon was smashed flat or in flames. Thick smoke hid the lower end of the village from him, and small fires blazed here and there where trees or wood piles had caught fire. His home was only a blackened area and drifting ashes. Beyond, the butcher's shop had fallen into the street, a mass of half-burnt timbers and smashed belongings. The dragon had gone. Elminster was alone with the dead. Grimly, Elminster searched the village. He found corpses tumbled or fried among the ruins of their homes, but not a soul that yet lived. Of his mother and father there was no sign, but he knew they'd not have fled. It was only when he'd turned, sick at heart, toward the meadow, where else could he go, that he stepped on something amid the ashes that lay thick on the road, the half-melted hilt of the lion sword. He took it up in hands that trembled. All but a few fingers of the blade were burnt away and most of the proud gold. Blue magic coursed no longer about this remnant. Yet he knew the feel of the worn hilt. El clutched it to his breast, and the world suddenly wavered. Tears fell from his sightless eyes for a long time as he knelt among the ashes in the street, and the patient sun moved across the sky. At some point he must have fallen senseless, for he roused at the creeping touch of cold, to feel hard cobbles under his cheek. Sitting up, he found dusk upon the ruin of Heldon, and full night coming down from the high forest. His numb hands tingled as he fumbled with the sword hilt. Elminster got to his feet slowly, looking around at what was left of his home. Somewhere nearby, a wolf called and was answered. Elminster looked at the useless weapon he held, and he shivered. It was time to be gone from this place before the wolves came down to feed. Slowly he raised the riven lion sword to the sky. For an instant it caught the last feeble glow of sunset, and Elminster stared hard at it and muttered, I shall slay that wizard and avenge ye all, or die in the trying. Hear me, mother, father, this I swear. A wolf howled in reply. Elminster bared his teeth in its direction, shook the ruined hilt at it, and started the long run back up to the meadow. As he went, Saloon rose serenely over the dying fires of Heldon, bathing the ruins in bright, bone-white moonlight. Elminster did not look back. He awoke suddenly in the close darkness of a cavern he'd hidden in once when playing Seek the Ogre with other lads. The hilt of the lion sword lay hard and unyielding beneath him. Elminster remained still, listening. Someone had said something very nearby. No sign of a raid, no one sorted, 
came the sudden grave words, loud and close. Elminster tensed, lying still and peering into the darkness. I suppose all the huts caught fire by themselves then, another deeper man's voice said sarcastically. And the rest fell over just because they were tired of standing up, eh? Enough, Bellard. Everyone's dead, I. But there's no sword work, not an arrow to be seen. Wolves have been at some of the bodies, but not a one's been rummaged. I found a gold ring on one lady's hand that shone at me clear down the street. What kills with fire, then, and knocks down cottages? Dragons, said another voice, lower still and grim. Dragons, and we saw it not? The sarcastic voice rose almost jestingly. More than one thing befalls up and down the Delambere that you see not, Billard. What else could it be? A mage? Aye. But what mage has spells enough to scorch houses and haystacks and odd patches of meadow, as well as every stone-built building in the place? There was a brief silence, and the voice went on. Well, if you think of any other good answer, speak. Until then, if you've sense, we'll raid only at dawn, before we can be well seen from the air, and not stray far from the forest for cover. Nay, I'll not sit here like some old woman while others pick over all the coins and goods, only to be left fighting with wolves over the refuse. Go then, Ballard. I stay here. Aye, with the sheep. Indeed. That way there may be something for you to eat, besides cooked villager, when you're done. Or were you going to herd them all down there and watch over them as you pick through the rubble? There was a disgusted snort, and someone else laughed. Helm's right as usual, Bell. Now belt up. Let's go. He'll probably have some cooked up for us by nightfall, if you speak to him as a lover would instead of always wagging the sharp tongue— what say, Helm? The grim voice answered. No promises. If I think something's lurking that might be drawn by a smoke plume, the meat'll be cold. If any of you sees a good cauldron there, big and stout, mind, have the sense to bring it back, will ye? Then I can boil enough food for us to eat all at once. And your helm'll smell less like beans for a while, eh? That, too. Forget not now. I'll not waste my hands on a pot, Ballard said sullenly, if there's coins or good blades to be had. No, no, Helmhead, carry thy loot in the pot, see? Then you can bring that much more, nay? There were chuckles. He's got you there, Bell. <laughs> Again? Aye, let's be off. Then there came the sounds of scrambling and scuffling. Stones turned and rolled by the mouth of the cave, and then clattered and were still. Silence fell. Elminster waited for a long time, but heard only the wind. They must have all gone. Carefully he rose, stretched his stiff arms and legs, and crept forward in the darkness around the corner, and almost on to the point of a sword. The man at the other end of it said calmly, And who might ye be, lad? Run from the village down there? He wore tattered leather armor, rusty gauntlets, a dented, scratched helm, and a heavy, stubbly beard. This close, Elminster could smell the stench of an unwashed man in armor, the stink of oil and wood smoke. Those are my sheep, Helm, he said calmly. Leave them be. Thine? Who be ye hurting them for, with all down there dead? Elminster met the man's level gaze and was ashamed when sudden tears welled up in his own eyes. He sprang back, wiping at his eyes, and drew the lion sword out of the breast of his jerkin. The man regarded him with what might have been pity and said, Put that away, boy. I've no interest in crossing blades with ye, even if ye had proper steel to wield. Ye had folk down... He pointed with the sideways tilt of his head, never taking his eyes from Elminster. In Helden? I, El managed to say, voice trembling only a little. Where will you go now? Elminster shrugged. I was going to stay here, he said bitterly, and eat sheep. Helm's eyes met the young, angry gaze calmly. 
A change of plans must needs be in order, then. Shall I save you one to get you started? Sudden rage rose up inside Elminster at that. Thief! He snarled, backing away. Thief! The man shrugged. I've been called worse. Elminster found his hands were trembling. He thrust them and the ruined sword back into the front of his jerkin. Helm stood across the only way out. If there were a rock large enough... You'd not be so calm if there were knights of Athelantar near. They kill brigands, you know, Elminster said, biting off his words as he'd heard his father do when angry, putting a bark of authority in his tone. The response astonished him. There was a sudden scuffling of boots on rock, and the man had him by the throat, one worn old gauntlet bunching up the jerkin under Elminster's nose. I am a knight of Athelantar, boy, sworn to the stag king himself. Gods and goddesses watch over him. If there weren't so gods cursed many wizards down in Hastarl, kinging it over the lot of us with the hired brigands they call loyal armsmen, I'd be riding a realm at peace, and doubtless ye'd still have a home, and thy folks and neighbors would be alive. The old gray eyes burned with an anger equal to Elminster's own. El swallowed but looked steadily into them. If you're a true knight he said. Then let go. Warily, with a little push that left them both apart, the man did so. Right then, boy. Why? Helminster dragged out the sword hilt again and held it up. Recognize ye this? he said, voice wavering. Helm squinted at it, shook his head, and then froze. The lion sword, he said roughly. It should be in Uthgrail's tomb. How came you by it, boy? He held out his hand for it. Elminster shook his head and thrust the ruined stub of blade back into his jerkin. Tis mine. It was my father's and— He fought down a tightness of unshed tears in his throat and went on. And I think he died wielding it yestereve. He and Helm stared into each other's eyes for a long moment, and then El asked curiously, Who's this Uthgrail? Why would he be buried with my father's sword? Helm was staring at him as if he had three heads and a crown on each one. I'll answer that, lad, if ye'll tell me thy father's name first. He leaned forward, eyes suddenly dark and intent. Elminster drew himself up proudly and said, My father is, was, Elthrin Aumar. Everyone called him the uncrowned lord of Heldon. Helm let out his breath in a ragged gasp. Don't, don't tell anyone that, lad, he said quickly. Do you hear? Why, Elminster said, eyes narrowing. I know my father was someone important, and he... His voice broke, but he snarled at his own weakness and went on. He was killed by a wizard with two hands who rode on the back of a dragon, a dark red dragon. His eyes became bleak. I shall never forget what they look like. He drew out what was left of the lion sword again, making a thrusting motion with it, and added fiercely, One day, he was startled to see the dirty knight grin, not a sneering grin, but a smile of delight. What? El demanded, suddenly embarrassed. He thrust the blade out of sight again. What amuses ye so? Lad, lad, the man said gently. Sit down here. He sheathed his own sword and pointed at a rock not far away. Elminster eyed him warily, and the man sighed, sat down himself, and unclipped a stoppered trail flask of chased metal from his belt. He held it out. Will ye drink? Elminster eyed it. He was very thirsty, he realized suddenly. He took a step nearer. If ye give me some answers, he said, and promise not to slay me. Helm regarded him almost with respect and said, Ye have my word on it, the word of Helm Stoneblade, Knight of the Stag Throne. He cleared his throat and said, And answers I'll give too, if ye favor me with just one more. He leaned forward. What is thy name? Elminster Amar, son of Elthrin. Only son? Enough, Elminster said, taking the flask. You've had your one answer. Give me mine. The man grinned again. 
Please, Lord Prince, just one answer more. Elminster stared at him. Do ye mock me, Lord Prince? Helm shook his head. No, lad, Prince Elminster, I pray ye I must know. Have ye brothers, sisters? Elminster shook his head. None, alive or dead. Thy mother? Elminster spread his hands. Did you find anyone alive down there? He asked, suddenly angry again. I'd like my answers now, Sir Knight. He took a long, deliberate drink from the flask. His nose and throat exploded in bubbling fire. Elminster choked and gasped. His knees hit the stony ground hard. Through swimming eyes, he saw Helm lean swiftly forward to rescue him and the flask. Strong hands helped him to his seat and gently shook him. Fire wine not to thy liking, lad? All right now? Elminster managed a nod, head bowed. Helm roughly patted him on the arm and said, Well enough. Seems thy parents thought it safest to tell ye nothing. I agree with them. Elminster's head came up in anger, but through swimming eyes he saw Helm holding up one gauntleted hand in a gesture that meant halt. Yet I gave my word, and you are a prince of Athalantar. A knight keeps his promises, however rashly made. So speak, Elminster said. How much do you know of thy parents, thy lineage? Elminster shrugged. Nothing, he said bitterly, beyond the names of my parents. My mother was Amrythale Goldsheaf. Her father was a forester. My father was proud of this sword. It had magic, and was glad that we couldn't see Athelgard from Helden. That's all. Helm rolled his eyes, sighed, and said, Well, then, sit and learn. If ye'd live, keep what I tell thee to thyself. Wizards hunt folk of thy blood in Athalantar these days. Aye, Elminster told him bitterly. I know. Helm sighed. I... My forgiveness, Prince, I forgot. He spread gauntleted hands as if to clear away underbrush before him and said, this realm, Athalantar, is called the Kingdom of the Stag after one man, Uthgrail Almar, the Stag King, a mighty warrior, and thy grandsire. Elminster nodded. That much I suspected from all thy prince talk. Why then am I not in rich robes right now in some high chamber of Athelgard? Helm gave him that grin of delight again and chuckled. Ye are quick and as irons of nerves, as he was, lad. He reached an arm behind him, found a battered canvas pack, and rummaged in it as he went on. The best answer to that is to tell things as they befell. Uthgrail was my lord, lad, and the greatest swordsman I've ever seen. His voice sank to a whisper, all traces of smile gone. He died in the year of frosts, going up against orcs near Jander. Many of us died that wolf winter, and the spine of Athalantar went with us. Helm found what he was looking for, a half-loaf of hard gray bread. He held it out wordlessly. Elminster took it, nodded his thanks, and gestured for the knight to say on. That brought the ghost of a smile to Helm's lips. Uthgrail was old and ready to die. After Queen Sindril went to her grave, he fell to grimness and waited for a chance to fall in battle. I saw it in his eyes more than once. The orc chieftain who cut him down left the realm in the hands of his seven sons. There were no daughters. Helm stared into the depths of the cavern, seeing other times and places, and faces Elminster did not know. Five princes were ruled by ambition and were ruthless, cruel men all. One of these, Falodar, was interested in gold above all else and traveled far in its pursuit, to hot Kalimshan and beyond, lad, where he still is, for all I know, but the others all stayed in Athalantar. The knight scratched himself for a moment, eyes still far away, and added, There were two sons more. One was too young and timid to be a threat to anyone. The other, thy father, Elthrin, was calm and just, and preferred the life of a farmer to the intrigue of the court. 
He retired here and married a commoner. We thought that signified his renunciation of the crown. So I fear did he. Helm sighed, met Elminster's intent gaze, and went on. The other princes fought for control of the realm. Folk as afar from here as Elambar, on the coast, call them the Warring Princes of Athalantar. There's even songs about them. The winner thus far has been the eldest son, Balor. The knight leaned forward suddenly to grip Elminster's arms. You must hear me in this, he said urgently. Balor bested his brothers, but his victory has cost him, and all of us, the realm. He bought the services of mages from all over Faroon to win him the stag throne. He sits on it today, but his wits are so clouded by drink and by their magic that he doesn't even know he barks only when they kick him. His mage lords are the true rulers of Athalantar. Even the beggars in Hastarl know it. How many of these wizards are there? What are their names? Elminster asked quietly. Helm released him and sat back, shaking his head. I know not, and I doubt any folk in Athalantar do, below sword captains of the stag, except perhaps the house servants of Athelgard. He cast a keen look at Elminster. Sworn to avenge thy parents, prince? Elminster nodded. Wait, the knight told him bluntly. Wait until you're older, and have gathered coins enough to buy mages of thy own. You'll need them, unless you want to spend the rest of your days as a purple frog swimming in some palace perfume bowl for the amusement of some minor apprentice of the mage lords. Though it took all of them to do it, and they had to split apart Worm Tower stone by stone, they slew old Shandrith, as powerful an archmage as you'll find in all the lands of men, two summers back. He sighed, and those they couldn't smash with spells, they slew with blades or poison. Theskin, the court mage for one, he was the oldest and most trusted of Uthgrail's friends. I will avenge them all, Elminster said quickly. Before I die, Athalantar will be free of these mage lords, every last one, if I have to tear them apart with my bare hands, this I swear. Helm shook his head. No, prince, swear no great oaths. Men who swear oaths are doomed to die by them. One thing hunts and hounds them, and so they waste and stunt their lives. Elminster regarded him darkly. A wizard took my mother and father, and all my friends, and the other folk I knew. It is my life to spend how I will. Helm's face split in that delighted grin again. He shook his head. You're a fool, prince. A prudent man had footed out of Athalantar and never looked back, nor breathe a word of his past, his family, or the lion sword to a soul. Mayhap to live a long and happy life somewhere else. He leaned forward to clasp Belminster's forearm. But ye could not do that and still be an Omar. Prince of Athalantar, so ye will die in the trying. He shook his head again. At least listen to me then, and wait until ye have a chance before letting anyone else in all Faroon know ye live, or ye'll not give one of the mage lords more than a few minutes of cruel sport. They know of me? Helm gave him a pitying look. Ye are a lamb to the ways of the court indeed. The wizard ye saw over Helden doubtless had orders to eliminate Prince Elthrin and all his blood before the son they knew he'd sired could grow old and well-trained enough to have royal ambitions of his own. There was a little silence as the knight watched the youth grow pale. When the lad spoke again, however, Helm got another surprise. Sir Helm, Elminster said calmly, tell me the names of the mage lords and ye can have my sheep. Helm guffawed. In faith, lad, I know them not, and the others I run with will have thy sheep whate'er befalls. I will give thee thy names of thy uncles. You'll need to know them. Elminster's eyes flickered. So tell. The eldest, thy chief enemy, is Belor, 
a big bellowing bully of a man for all he's seen but nine and twenty winters, cruel in the hunt and on the field, but the best trained to arms of all the princes. He's shorter of wits than he thinks he is, and was Uthgrail's favorite, until he showed his cruel ways and o'er and o'er again his short temper. He proclaimed himself king six summers ago, but many folk up and down the Delamere don't recognize his title. They know what befell. Elminster nodded. And the second son? Tis thought he's dead. Elthon was a soft-tongued womanizer whose every third word was false. All the realm knew him for a master of intrigue, but he fled Hastarl a step ahead of Belor's armsmen. The word is some of the mage lords found him in Kalimshan later that year, hiding in a cellar in some city, and used spells to make his death long and lingering. The third, Elminster was marking them off on his fingers. Helm grinned at that. Colin was killed before Belor claimed the throne. He was a sneaking, suspicious sort, and always liked watching wizards hurl fire and the like. He fancied himself a wizard, and was tricked into a spell duel by a mage commonly thought to be hired for the purpose by Althon. The mage turned Colin into a snake, fitting, and then burst him apart from within with a spell I've never recognized or heard named. Then the first mage lords Belor had brought in struck him down in turn, for the safety of the realm. I recall them proclaiming death for treason in the streets of Hestarl when the news was cried. Helm shook his head. Then came your father. He was always quiet and insisted on fairness among nobles and common folk. The people loved him for that, but there was little respect for him at court. He retired to Heldon early on, and most folk in Hastarl forgot him. I never knew Uthgrail thought highly of him, but that sword ye bear proves he did. Four princes thus far, Elminster said, nodding as if to nail them down in memory. The others? Helm counted on his own grubby fingers. Oathglass was next, a fat man full of jolly jest, who stuffed himself at feasts every night he could. He was stouter than a barrel and could barely wheeze his way around on two feet. He liked to poison those who displeased him and made quite a push through the ranks of those at court, downing foes and any who so much as spoke a word aloud against him, and advancing his own supporters. Elminster stared at him, frowning. You make my uncle seem like a lot of villains. Helm looked steadily back at him. That was the common judgment up and down the Delambere, aye. But I'd report to ye what they did. If ye come to the same judgment as most folk did, doubtless the gods will agree with ye. He scratched himself again, took a pull from his flask, and added, When Belor took the throne, his pet mages made it clear that they knew what Oathglass was up to and threatened to put him to death before all the court for it. So he fled to Dalnir and joined the huntsmen who worship Malar. I doubt the Beast Lord has ever had so fat a priest before, or since. Does he still live? Helm shook his head. Most of Athalantar knows what befell. The mage lords made sure we all heard. They turned him into a boar during a hunt, and he was slain by his own underpriests. Elminster shuddered despite himself, but all he said was, The next prince? Felodar, the one who went off to Kalimshan. Gold and gems are his love. He left the realm before Uthgrail died, seeking them. Wherever he went, he fostered trade betwixt there and here, pleasing the king very much, and bringing Athalantar what little name and wealth it has in Faroon beyond the Delambir Valley today. I think the king would have been less pleased if he'd known Felodar was raking in gold coins as fast as he could close his hands on them, trading in slaves, drugs, and dark magic. He's still doing that as far as I know at least chin-deep in the intrigues of Kalimshan. Elm chuckled suddenly. He's even hired mages and sent them here to work spells against Belor's mage lords. Not one to turn thy back on for even a quick breath? Elminster asked wryly, and Helm grinned and nodded. 
Last, there's Nrime, the youngest, a timid, frail, sullen little brat, as I recall. He was brought up by women of the court after the queen's death, and may never have stepped outside the gates of Athelgard in his life. He disappeared about four summers ago. Dead? Helm shrugged. That, or held captive somewhere by the mage lords, so they have another blood heir of Uthgrael in their power, should anything happen to Belor. Elminster reached for the flask. Helm handed it over. The youth drank carefully, sneezed once, and handed it back. He licked his lips and said, You don't make it sound a noble thing to be Prince of Athelantar. Helm shrugged. It's for every prince himself to make it a noble thing, a duty most princes these days seem to forget. Elminster looked down at the lion sword, which had somehow found its way into his hands again. What should I do now? Helm shrugged. Go west to the Horn Hills and run with the outlaws there. Learn how to live hard and use a blade and kill. Your revenge, lad, isn't catching one mage in a privy and running a sword up his backside. The gods have set ye up against far too many princes and wizards and hired lickspittle armsmen for that. Even if they all lined up and presented their behinds, your arm would grow tired before the job was done. He sighed and added, You spoke truth when you said it'll be your life's work. You have to be less the dreamy boy and more the knight, and somehow keep well clear of mage lords until you've learned how to stay alive more than one battle, when the armsmen of Athalantar come looking to kill you. Most of them aren't much in a fight. But right now, neither are ye. Go to the hills and offer your blade to the outlaws at least two winters. In the cities, everything is under the hand and the taint of wizards. Evil rules, and good men must needs be outlaws, or corpses if they're to stay good. So be ye an outlaw and learn to be a good one. He did not quite smile as he added, if ye survive, travel Faerun until ye find a weapon sharp enough to slay Neldrin, and then come back and do it. Slay who? Neldrin Hawkline, probably the most powerful of the mage lords. Elminster eyed him with sudden fire in his blue-gray eyes. Ye said ye knew no names of mage lords. Is this what a knight of Athalantar calls truth? Helm spat aside into the darkness. Truth? He leaned forward. Just what is truth, boy? Elminster frowned. It is what it is, he said icily. I know of no hidden meanings. Truth, Helm said, is a weapon. Remember that. Silence hung between them for a long moment, and then Elminster said, Right, I've learned thy clever lesson. Tell me then, O oh wise knight, how much else of all ye've said can I trust about my father and my uncles? Helm hid a smile. When this lad's voice grew quiet, it betokened danger. No bluster about this one. He deserved a fair answer well enough. The knight said simply, All of it, as best I know. If ye are still hungry for names to work revenge on, Add these to thy tally, Mage Lord Seldenor Stormcloak and Cadelm Olathstar. But I'd not know the faces of any of the three if I bumped noses with them in a brothel bathing pool. Elminster regarded the unshaven stinking man steadily. Ye are not what I expected a knight of Athalantar to be. Helm met his gaze squarely. Ye thought to see shining armor, prince? Astride a white horse as tall as a cottage, courtly manners, noble sacrifices. Not in this world, lad, not since the queen of the hunt died. Who? Helm sighed and looked away. I forget ye know not of your own realm. Queen Sindrel Hornweather, your grand dam, Uthgrail's queen and mistress of all his stag hunts, he looked into the darkness and added softly, She was the most beautiful lady I've ever seen. Elminster got up abruptly. My thanks for this, Helmstone Blade. 
I must be on my way before any of thy fellow wolves return from plundering Helden. If the gods smile, we shall meet again. Helm looked up at him. I hope so, lad. I hope so. And let it be when Athalantar is free of mage lords again, and my fellow wolves, the true knights of Athalantar, can ride again. He held out his hands. The flask was in one, and the bread in the other. Go west to the Horn Hills, he said roughly, and take care not to be seen. Move at dusk and dawn and keep to fields and forest. Wear armsmen on patrol. Out there they slay first and ask thy corpse its business after. Never forget, the blades the wizards hire are not knights. Today's armsmen of Athalantar have no honor. He spat to one side thoughtfully and added, If ye meet with outlaws, tell them Helm sent you, and ye're to be trusted. Elminster took the bread and the flask. Their eyes met, and he nodded his thanks. Remember, Helm said, tell no one thy true name, and don't ask fool questions about princes or mage lords either. Be someone else till tis time. Helminster nodded. Have my trust, Sir Knight, and my thanks. He turned with all the gravity of his twelve winters, and strode away to the mouth of the cavern. The knight came after, grinning. Then he said, Wait, lad, take my sword. Ye'll need it. Best ye keep that hilt of thine out of sight. The boy stopped and turned, trying not to show his excitement. A blade of his own. What will ye use? Elminster asked, taking the heavy plain sword that the knight's dirty hands put into his. Buckles clinked and leather flapped, and a scabbard followed it. Helm shrugged. I'll loot me another. I'm supposed to serve any prince of the realm with my sword, so... Elminster smiled suddenly and swung the sword through the air, holding it with both hands. It felt reassuringly deadly. With it in his hands, he was powerful. He thrust at an imaginary foe, and the point of the blade lifted a little. Elm gave a fierce grin. Aye, take it and go. Elminster took a few steps out into the meadow, and then spun around and grinned back at the knight. Then he turned again to the sunlit meadow, the scabbarded blade cradled carefully in his hands, and ran. Helm took a dagger from his belt and a stone from the floor, shook his head, and went out to kill sheep, wondering when he'd hear of the lad's death. Still, the first duty of a knight is to make the realm shine in the dreams of small boys. Or where else will the knights of tomorrow arise? and what will become of the realm. At that thought, his smile faded. What will become of Athelantar indeed? 2. Wolves in Winter Know that the purpose of families, in the eyes of the Morning Lord at least, is to make each generation a little better than the one before. Stronger, perhaps, or wiser, richer, or more capable. Some folk manage one of these aims. The best and the most fortunate manage more than one. That is the task of parents. The task of a ruler is to make or keep a realm that allows most of its subjects to see better in their striving down the generations than a single improvement. Thorndar Erlin High Priest of Lathander, Teachings of the Morning's Glory, Year of the Fallen Fury. He was huddled in the icy white heart of a swirling snowstorm, in the hammer of winter, that cruel month when men and sheep alike were found frozen hard, and the winds howled and shrieked through the horn hills night and day, blowing snows in blinding clouds across the barren highlands, it was the year of the lore masters, though Elminster cared not a whit. All he cared about was that it was another cold season, his fourth since Helden burned, and he was growing very weary of them. A hand clapped him on one thick-clad shoulder. He patted it in reply. Sargeth had the keenest eyes of them all. 
His touch meant he'd spotted the patrol through the curtain of driving snow. L watched him reach the other way to pass on another warning. The six outlaws bundled up in layers upon layers of stolen and corpse-stripped cloth until they looked like the fat and shuffling rag golems of fireside fear tales, kicked their way out of the warmth of their snowbank, fumbled to draw blades with hands clad in thick-bound rags, and waddled down into the cleft. Wind struck hard as they came down into the narrow space between the rocks, howling billowing snow around and past them. And Garl struggled to keep his feet as the wind tugged at the long lance he bore. He'd taken it from an armsman who'd needed it no more. And Garl had brought him down with a carefully slung stone before the leaves had started to fall. The outlaws chose their spots, flopped down to kneel in the snows, and dug in. Snow streamed around and passed them, and as they settled into stillness, it cloaked them in concealing whiteness, making them mere lumps and billows of snow in the storm. God damn all wizards, the voice borne by the winds seemed startlingly close. So did the reply. None of that, ye know better than such talk. I might, my frozen feet don't. They'd much prefer to be next to a crackling fire back in... All of our feet had rather be there. They will be, God's willing, soon enough. Sorting outlaws will warm ye, if you're sharp-eyed enough to find any. Now belt up. Perhaps, Elminster commented calmly, knowing the wind would sweep his words behind him, away from the armsmen. The gods have other plans. He could just hear an answering chuckle from off to his left. Sargeth. A moment more... Then he heard a sharp query, crunching snow and the high whinny of a startled horse. The brothers had attacked. Argel struck first, and then Beirold gave the call, from behind if he could get there. It came, a roar as much like the triumph call of a wolf as Beirold could make it. Horses reared, cried out, and bucked in the deep snow on all sides. The patrol was on top of them. Elminster rose up out of the snow like a vengeful ghost, sword drawn. To lie still could mean being ridden over and trampled. He saw a flicker of light through the whirling whiteness as the nearest armsman drew steel. A moment later, Angarl's awkwardly bobbing lance took the armsman in the throat. He choked, sobbed wetly around blood as the horse under him plunged on, and then he fell, head flopping, taking the lance with him. Elminster wasted no time on the dying man. Another armsman off to the right in the swirling storm was trying to spur past him through the cleft. L ran through the slithery snow as fast as he could, the way the outlaws had shown him, rocking comically from side to side to keep from slipping in the light drifts. All of the outlaws looked like drunken bears when they ran in deep snow. As slow as he was, the horse was even slower. Its hooves were slipping in the potholes that marked the trail here, and it danced and stamped for footing, nearly tossing its rider. The armsmen saw Elminster and leaned forward to hack the outlaw. Elminster ducked back, let the blade sing past, and charged in at the man's leg, clawing with one hand as he blocked a return of the man's blade with the edge of his own. The overbalanced man in armor howled in rising despair, waved his free arm wildly in a vain attempt to find a handhold in empty air, and crashed heavily from his saddle, bouncing in the snow at Elminster's feet. L drove his blade into the man's neck while the spray of snow still shielded the man's face, shuddered as the man spasmed under his steel, and then flopped back into the snow limp. Four years ago he'd discovered he had no love of killing, and it hadn't grown much easier since. Yet it was slay or be slain out here in the outlaw haunted hills. Elminster sprang away from the man, glancing about in the confusion of swirling snows and muffled tumult of churning hooves. There was a grunt, a roar of pain, and the heavy thudding of body and armor striking snow-cloaked ground off to the left, followed by a wail that ended abruptly. Elminster shuddered again, but kept his blade up warily. This was when outlaws who'd grown tired of their fellows sometimes decided to make a mistake under the cloak of the storming snow, and bring down someone who was not an armsman of Athalantar. El expected no such treachery from his companions, but only the gods knew the hearts of men. Like most in the Horn Hills, 
Those who revered Helm Stoneblade and hated the Mage Lords, at least, this band made no war on common folk, not wanting to bring down the wrath of the wizards on farmers whose stable straw sometimes served as warm beds and whose frozen and forgotten pot roots could be dug up by men near starvation. The outlaws avoided their neighbors out here in the hills. Even so, they had learned never to trust them. The armsmen of Athalantar paid fifty pieces of gold per head to folk who'd guide them to outlaws. More than one outlaw had been taken by trusting overmuch. The cold lesson was to trust nothing that lived, from birds and foxes whose alarmed flight could draw the eyes of patrols, to peddlers who might go after the gold and speak of fires, or watching men they'd seen deep in the hills where outlaws were known to lurk. Sargeth strode up through the endless fall of snow, which drifted straight down now as there came a sudden lull in the winds. He was grinning through the cloud of vapor that curled about his mouth. All dead, El, a dozen armsmen, and one of them was carrying a full pack of food. Elminster, called Eladar among the outlaws, grunted. No mages? Sargeth chuckled and laid a hand on El's arm. He left bloody marks, the gore of some armsmen now lying still in the snows. Patience, he said. If it's wizards you want to kill, let us slay enough armsmen, and by all the gods the mages will come. Elminster nodded. Anything else? Around them the wind screamed with fresh strength, and it was hard to see through the driven snow. One horse hurt. We'll butcher it and wrap it in their cloaks here. Haste now. The wolves are as hungry as we. And Garl's found a dozen daggers or more, and at least one good helm. Barold's collecting boots as usual. Go you and help Nind with the cutting. Elminster sniffed. Blood work, as always. Sargeth laughed and clapped him on the back. We all have to do it to live. Look upon it as preparing yourself several good feasts, and try not to gnaw on too much raw meat as you usually do unless you like icing your backside on the snow and feeling kitten-weak, that is. Elminster grunted and headed through the snow where Sargeth pointed. A happy shout jerked his head around. It was Beorold, leading back a snorting horse by the reins. Good, it could drag their spoils some way before they would have to kill it to end the trail its hooves would leave. Around them, the whistle of the wind began to die, and with it, the snowfall faltered. Curses came from all around. The outlaws knew they'd have to work fast indeed if it turned cold and clear, for even the weak wizards posted to the keeps out here had magic that could find them from afar when the weather was clear. By the favor of the gods, another squall came in soon after they left the cleft. Even someone already tracking them wouldn't be able to follow. The outlaws struggled on, following Sargath and Beorold, who knew every slope of the hills, here even in blinding snow. When they came to the deep spring that never froze, a place they knew the wizards watched by magic from afar, Beorold spoke a few soothing words to the horse, then swung his forester's axe with brutal strength and leaped clear of its kicking hooves as it fell. The outlaws left the steaming remnants of the carcass for the wolves to find. Then they rolled in deep drifts to clean off the worst of the gore and went on. North into the driving storm, up ravines narrow and dark, to wind cavern where icy breezes moaned endlessly into a lightless cleft. Each man in turn bent and ducked through the narrow opening, by memory crossed the uneven cave beyond and found the faint glowstone rock that marked the mouth of the next passage. They walked into the hollow dark until they saw the faint light ahead of another glowstone. Sargath tapped the wall of the passage slowly and deliberately six times, paused, and then tapped once more. There came an answering tap, and Sargath took two steps and turned into an unseen side passage. The outlaws followed him into the narrow tunnel. It smelled of earth and damp stone, and descended steeply beneath the horn hills. Light grew somewhere ahead, ale-hued faint light from a cavern full of luminous fungi. As they came out into it, Sargeth said his name calmly to the darkness beyond, and the men who stood there set down their crossbows and replied, All back safe? All safe.
and with meat to roast, Sargeth said triumphantly. Horse, a second voice asked sourly, or chopped armsmen. They exchanged chuckles before proceeding down another passage, through a cavern where daggers of rock jutted from floor and ceiling like the frozen jaws of some great monster, to a shaft in which vivid red light glowed. A stout ladder led down the hole into a large cavern always wreathed in steam. The light and the vapor came from rocky clefts at its far end, where folk sat huddled in blankets or lay snoring. With each step, the dank air grew warmer until the weary warrior stood beside the scalding waters of the hot spring and welcoming hands reached up to pat or clasp theirs. They were home in the place proudly called Lawless Castle. It was a good place, furnished with heaped blankets and old cloaks. Dwarves had shown it to Helm Stoneblade long ago, and from time to time the outlaws still found firewood, prepared torches, or cases of quarrels left in the deeper side passages next to the privies the outlaws used. The wrinkled old outlaw woman Maury had told El once that they'd never seen the dwarves. But they want us here. The stout folk like anything that weakens the wizards, for they see their doom in men growing over strong. We already outbreed them like rabbits, and if ever we o'er match elven magic, they'll be staring at their graves. Now she looked up through her warts and bristles at the arriving band, grinned toothlessly at them, and said, Food, valiant warriors? Aye, Engarl joked, and when we feasted, we'll give ye some to replace it. He chuckled at his jest, but the dozen or so ragged outlaws awake around them only snorted sourly in reply. They'd no food left, but four shriveled potatoes Maury had kept safe in the filthy folds of her gargantuan bosom for the last two days, and had taken to chewing on the bitter glow fungi to still aching stomachs while they waited for one of the bands to bring back meat. Now they hustled to get a fire going and drag out the cooking frame of rusting sword blades woven together in a rough square. The band stamped the last snows from their boots and unwrapped their bloody bundles. Maury leaned forward, slapping outlaw hands away to see what had been brought to her table. Sargath's band was the best. All of them knew that. L, the worst blade in it, but the fastest on his feet, was glad to be a part of it and kept silent when his fellows fought or blustered. They were too cold and exhausted most of the winters to afford dispute among themselves. Once a wizard had found Wind Cavern and died in a hail of crossbow quarrels. But otherwise, Elminster had seen the hated mages of Athalantar little in the passing years. The outlaws struck at patrols of armsmen so often that the magelings had stopped riding with them. A smiling red-bearded rogue they all knew as Javel blew to make the fire catch and said with satisfaction, We caught another two coming from Dares earlier this night. That had best be enough for a time, Sargeth grunted in reply as he and his companions shed gauntlets, headgear, and the heaviest of the furs and scraps of scavenged leather they wore. Or they'll think her night comfort lasses are working with us and burn them out, or lie ready with a mage to work our own trap on us. Javel's smile went away. He made a face and nodded slowly. Ye see the right road as usual, sir. Sargeth merely grunted and held his hands to the growing warmth of the kindling fire. Armsmen from Heldreth's Horn, the outermost fortress of Athalantar, had gone out to buy the favors of village lasses for as long as the keep had stood. A dozen summers back, some maids had converted an old farm into a house of pleasure and sold their guests wildflower wine besides. The outlaws had slain more than a few armsmen riding home from there drunken and alone. Aye, tis best we leave the lustlorn alone for a time, and catch him again in spring. What, and leave them to slay and pillage until spring? How many more warriors can you afford to lose? The wizard's voice was cold, colder than the chill battlements where they stood, looking out over the ice-cloaked waters of the Unicorn Run. The swordmaster of Sarn Torel spread strong, hairy hands and said helplessly, None, Lord Mage, that's why I dare send no more. 
Every man who rides west of here's going to his death and knows it. They're that close to open defiance now. And I've the law to keep in the streets here, too. If caravan merchants and peddlers are fool enough to go from realm to realm in the deep snows, let them look to their own hides, I say, and leave the bandits to freeze in the hills without our swords to entertain them. The wizard's gaze then was even colder than his voice had been. The swordmaster quailed inwardly and firmly took hold of the stone merlin in front of him to keep from stepping back a pace or two and showing his fear. He dropped his own gaze to the frozen moss clinging to cracks and chips in the stone and wished he were somewhere else, somewhere warmer where they'd never heard of wizards. I do not recall the king asking for your view of your duties, though I've no doubt he'll be most interested to find how creatively they cleave from his own, came the mage's voice, silken soft now. The swordmaster forced himself to turn and stare into dark eyes that glittered with malice. "'Tis your wish, then, Lord Mage?' he asked, stressing the word just enough that the wizard would know that the swordmaster thought the king a wiser warrior than all his strutting mage lords, and would have no such view of his swordmaster's prudence. "'That I send more armsmen to patrol from the horn?' The wizard hesitated, then as softly as before asked, "'Let me know your wish, swordmaster.' Perhaps we can come to some agreement. The swordmaster took a deep breath and held those dark, deadly eyes with his own. Send to the horn a cutter full of mages, apprentices even, providing that one mage of experience commands them. Twenty armsmen, all I dare spare, ride with them to the horn, and from there act as necessary to hunt these outlaws with magic and destroy them. They stared at each other for a long, chill moment, and then, slowly, Mage Lord Cadeln Olathstar smiled, thinly, but the swordmaster had wondered if the man knew how. A stout plan indeed, swordmaster. I knew we could agree on something this day. He looked north over the snow-clad farms across the river for a moment, then added, I hope a suitable sledge can be speedily found rather than one that comes not or must be built and finds us still preparing come spring. The swordmaster pointed down over the battlements with one gauntleted hand. See the logs there by the mill? One of those cutters beneath them can be free by tonight, and a pair of the huts we used to cover the wells lashed atop it before morn. The wizard smiled softly, a snake contemplating prey that cannot escape. Then in the morn they'll set out. You shall have twelve mages, swordmaster, one of them Mage Lord Landoral Valadarm. The warrior nodded, wondering privately whether Landoral was a fumbling dolt or someone who had simply earned Cadeln's displeasure. He hoped for the latter then this Landoral might at least be useful if the gods' cursed outlaws attacked the cutter. The two men smiled tightly at each other there on the battlements, and then both turned their backs deliberately to show they dared to, and strode slowly away with the show of casual unconcern. Their every step told the world they were strong men, free of all fear. The battlements of Sarn Torel stood still and silent, unimpressed, as they would stand when both men were long in their graves. It takes a lot to impress a castle wall. Elminster was happily blowing on scorched fingers, licking the last scraps of horse flesh from them, when one of the watchers burst into the cavern and gasped out, Patrol! Found a way in! Killed a Jelen and probably more! Some of them ran back to tell where we lair! All over the cavern men swore and scrambled to their feet, shouting, Sargath cut through the din with a bellow. Crossbows and blades, all but Mori. The lads and the wounded stand guard in the glow cavern. All the others with me, now. As they ran through the darkness, swearing and wringing their weapons off the unseen stone in their haste, Sargath added, Brerist, Eladar, try to get clear of the fight here and go after those who are running back to the wizards. You're the fastest afoot of all here old enough to swing a real blade. I need those armsmen all dead or we will be. I, Elminster and Brerist, panted, 
and went through the mouth of Wind Cavern in a roll. The quarrel that sought their lives hissed past and struck the rock within easy reach of Sargith's head. The second one missed entirely, but Elminster came to a stop behind a snow-cloaked boulder in time to see the third take Sargith in the eye and drive him back like a crumpled bag of bones to slide down the rock wall, twitching. Elminster laid his drawn dagger beside him in the snow, snatched up the old mended crossbow that had fallen from Sargith's hands, and cranked at it for all he was worth. The windlass clattered loudly, but outlaws were rushing past and firing their own bows now, and shouts told him that some of their bolts were finding their marks. Loaded at last. Tempest aid my aim, Elminster murmured, scratching his finger on his dagger tip until blood came to seal the prayer to the war god. Then he laid the ready bow down, whipped off the helm he wore, and waved it on one side of the boulder. A quarrel hissed past. Elminster scooped up the bow and was around the boulder in an instant. As he'd expected, the armsman was standing to watch his target die, so Elminster had a clear shot at his face, past a knot of howling, hackling outlaws and coolly slaying armsmen. El aimed carefully and missed. Cursing, he leaped back, but Brerist came past him with a loaded crossbow of his own, set himself, and fired carefully. The armsman had started to turn away, seeking cover. His face sprouted a quarrel, his head spun around, and he staggered back and fell. Elminster threw down his bow, snatched up his dagger, and sprinted through the snow, dodging desperately fighting men. He was still a few hundred running paces short of the first rock large enough to shelter behind, when an armsman rose from behind the second rock, ready crossbow in hand, to aim into the fray in front of the cavern. Seeing Elminster, he swung his weapon around hurriedly. There was no way he could miss. Elminster skidded to a desperate stop, then changed direction and dived into the nearest snowbank. He landed hard in a flurry of snow, slid across unseen smooth rock, and flipped over, expecting to feel the thump of death striking home at any moment. It didn't come. El wiped snow from his face and looked up. Brerist, or one of the other outlaws, had been lucky. The armsman was curled over the top of his rock, barehanded and groaning, a shaft through his shoulder. Thank ye, Tempest, Elminster said with feeling, took two running steps, and flung himself right over the top of the first boulder, heels first, to crash down on whomever might be there. The armsman was on his knees, struggling with a jammed windlass, Elminster's landing smashed him to the ground like a rag doll, and El dragged his dagger across the man's throat a breath later. For Elthrin, Prince of Athalantar, he whispered, and found himself blinking back sudden tears as his father's face came to mind. Not now, he told himself desperately, and ran on toward the next boulder. The wounded man saw him and struggled to get aside, groaning. Elminster drove his dagger home and snarled, For Amrythale, his princess, then he ducked down, scooped up the man's loaded bow from where it had fallen, and looked up in time to fire it into another armsman who had just risen from cover with a spear in his hand. Ahead, another armsman took an outlaw quarrel in the hand, screamed, and fell back behind his rock, sobbing. The clash of arms back by the cavern had ceased. El risked a look back and saw only dead men. They lay in bloody heaps in front of the cavern and just a few paces away lay Brerist, both hands clutching forever at a quarrel that stood out of his heart. Gods, Sargith and Brerist both, and everyone, if those armsmen got word back to the wizards. How many armsmen were there? Four dead for sure, Elminster thought as he ran forward, crouching low, plus all those by the cavern. The hail of quarrels hissing up and down the ravine had ceased. Was everyone dead? No. The sobbing armsmen, and perhaps two more, lay ahead somewhere in these rocks. There had to be at least two patrols here, and they'd not even sent more than three from each patrol, perhaps only three in all, to report to the wizards. To have any hope of catching them, he'd have to find the horses these had come on. And, of course, some of the missing armsmen, two at least, were holding the horses below. Elminster crawled around the boulder, keeping low, and took four daggers and a spear from the two dead men. An outlaw quarrel hissed out of the cavern and almost took him from behind. He sighed and crawled on in the snow. 
He had almost reached the sobbing armsman when another rose from behind a rock to aim carefully at the cavern mouth. Elminster cast the spear. It was in the air before the man caught sight of him. The armsman didn't have time to change his aim. His bow hurled a quarrel harmlessly down the ravine as the spear took him in the breast, plucking him away from his rock, and flung him back to crash down on his shoulders in the snow, bouncing and arching in agony. Elminster's charge took him onto the armsman's bloody chest, and he stabbed down again with his bloody dagger. For Eltrin, Prince of Athalantar, he snarled as he dealt death, and the warrior under his knees managed a startled look before all light fled from behind his eyes. Elminster flung himself aside in a roll. Quarrels and spears from both ends of the ravine crossed in the air above the dead warrior where he'd been kneeling. Scrabbling in the snow, Elminster slew the man who was still clutching his bleeding hand. For my mother, am Rythale. Panting, he took up the man's bow and ducked behind a rock to catch his breath and ready the weapon. His boots bristled with spare daggers now, and the bow was soon loaded. He crouched low, cradled it in his arms, and came around the last rock with his finger on the trigger. No one was there. Elminster stood frozen for a moment, and then knelt down. Another outlaw quarrel hummed past to fall into the empty snows below the ravine. El watched it go, and then looked up. He could climb the shoulder of the ravine and from above see where the armsmen had gone. The snow had stopped falling and the wind had died, leaving the hills around white and smooth with fresh fallen snow. Everyone could see him as he climbed, too, I. But then Tyche put a little hazard into everyone's life. Elminster sighed as he plucked the quarrel from its groove and slid it down into one of his boots. He left the bow cocked as he slung it across his back by the carry strap and scrambled up the slope. He'd not climbed more than his own height before a quarrel tore into the snow a handspan away from his head. El snatched at it, kicked himself free of the snowy rocks and frozen grass, and slid back down the slope, feigning lifelessness. The quarrel came with him as he crashed on his face in the snow trying to keep his bow unbroken. Tears blinded him for a moment, but his nose didn't seem broken. He blinked them away and spat out snow while he slid the bow free. It was unbroken. He loaded it, emitting a drawn-out rattling groan to cover the sounds he made. An armsman with the second crossbow ready rose out of a snowy thicket nearby, looking for the man he'd hit. He and Elminster saw each other at the same instant. Both fired, and both missed. Elminster found his feet as the quarrel sang past him. Would he forever be running around this ravine panting and slipping? snatched daggers from his boots and ran toward the thicket, blades flashing in both fists. He was afraid the warrior had a third bow cocked and ready. He was right. The armsman rose again with a triumphant smile on his face, and Elminster flung a dagger at him. The man's smile tightened in fear, and he fired in haste. The quarrel leaped at Elminster, who flung himself desperately over backward. As he fell, his knife met the quarrel with a clang and a spark, the dagger spun wildly away, and the quarrel burned past Elminster, ripping open his chin and thrusting his head around. El roared in pain and fell on his knees, hearing the crunching of the armsman's boots behind him as the warrior came running. Elminster turned, shaking his head to clear it, and growling at the pain. The man was scant paces away, sword raised to slay, when El flung the dagger in his other hand into the man's face. It clanged harmlessly off the nose guard of the armsman's helm, but the man's swing missed the diving youth, the sword striking the snowy ground and the rocks beneath. The warrior roared and fell heavily on top of Elminster's left hand. Elminster screamed. God's the pain! The man rolled about atop his hand, kicking at the snow to get a grip with his boots. Elminster sobbed, and the world turned green and yellow and swam fuzzily. He grabbed at his belt with his free hand. Nothing there. The man grunted. Elminster felt the hot breath of the armsman turning to face him and bring his blade down. His weight drove the hidden bulk of the lion sword on its thong bruisingly into Elminster's chest. Desperate, Elminster tore at the throat of his jerkin. His fingers found the hilt of the sword. Over long nights in his first winter in the hills, He'd sharpened the broken stub of the blade until it had a keen, raw-edged point, 
but beyond the kiosk, the weapon wasn't even as long as his hand. Its puny length saved him now. As the armsman's face glared into his inches away, and his elbow swept his sword up for a gutting thrust, Elminster thrust the lion sword up and into his eye. For Elthrin, Prince of Athalantar, he hissed, and as the hot rush of blood drenched him, found himself sinking into red, wet darkness. He was floating somewhere, dark and still. Whispers rose and fell around him, half heard through a slow rhythmic thudding. Elminster felt the pain of his hand and an answering ache all around. In his head? Yes, and the white glow was rising and pulsing now, the one he saw when he gathered his mind. The glow grew and the pain lessened. Ah, thus, Elminster pushed with his mind, and the white radiance faded. He felt a little tired, but the pain receded. He pushed again, and again felt weaker, but now the pain was almost gone. So, he could push pain aside. Could he truly heal himself? Elminster bent his will, and suddenly all his aches and hurts returned and he could feel cold, hard ground beneath his shoulders and the wet stickiness of sweat all over. From the place of whispers, he swam up, up, and burst out into the light. The sky was blue and cloudless overhead. Elminster lay on his back on the snowy rocks, stiff, cold, and aching. Gingerly, he rolled to one side and looked around. No sign of anyone or any movement. Good because his head swam and pounded, and he had to duck down again to catch his breath. The darkness again rushed up to claim him, and it felt so good, his head so heavy. A little later he rolled over. Snow vultures flapped heavily into the air, circled over the ravine and squalled complaints at him. The last armsman lay dead beside him, the lion sword in his face. Elminster winced at the sight, but put his hand to the blade, turned his head away, and pulled it free. Wiping it in the snow, he squinted at the dimming sky, steel gray now, with the last light of day ebbing behind full clouds, and got up. He had a task to finish if he wanted to live. He felt weak and a little numb. Down the ravine in the open space in front of the wind cavern, eight or more armsmen and more than twice that many outlaws lay dead quarrels protruding from most of the still forms. The vultures were circling overhead, and wolves would be here soon. Hopefully they'd find enough to feed on without entering the caves where the weak would guard until armsmen came to hack them down. He'd have to slay more armsmen to prevent that, and he was getting sick of killing. El grinned weakly as he went down the ravine averting his eyes from the sprawled dead he passed. Some brave outlaw warrior he was, at the mouth of the ravine was a large trampled area, trailing off into tracks of horses coming and leaving. The armsmen must have given their fellows up for dead. Elminster's shoulders sagged. He couldn't outrun horses in this deep snow. He and the other survivors were doomed. Unless he gathered all the bows and blades he could, took them to the last outlaws waiting in the darkness, and made the caves a death trap for the armsmen. Still, some would survive to identify the lair for later forays. And besides, what if they began by hurling a fire spell into the caves? No. Elminster flopped down onto a boulder to think. His sudden descent saved his life. A crossbow quarrel hummed just over his head to vanish into a snowbank close by. The youngest prince of Athalantar, perhaps the last prince of Athalantar, dived hastily off his boulder into the snow face first and floundered about in the chilly stuff until he was huddled behind the rock. He peered up whence the bolt had come. Sure enough, high on the shoulder of the ridge overlooking the ravine was one armsman. They'd left one behind to pin the outlaws in their lair or track them if they burst out in numbers. Of course, that was why so many of the outlaws wore crossbow quarrels. Elminster sighed. Some crafty woods warrior he was. Well, this armsman's horse would be somewhere just below him, around the other side of the ridge. 
If he could get to it and ride out of bowshot in time, aye, and frogs might fly too. Elminster frowned and tried to recall where the crossbows had fallen. That last armsman who'd almost slain him. Yes, he'd had three bows and dropped them all after firing in that thicket there. El sighed once, then started to crawl on his belly in the snow. A quarrel hissed past him again. Close, but hopefully there'd be no time for a second shot. Tempus and Tyche aid me. I feel the need of both of ye, Elminster muttered, hurrying in the cold, powdery snow. And then he was in the thicket, crouching low as a third crossbow bolt rattled snow off the trunks around him, cracked against a sapling, and fell broken into the snow somewhere off to the left. How different battle was from what the traveling minstrel sang about. That thought brought him to the first and second bows, lying in deep snow. They were wet, but if the gods smiled, would still fire true until they dried. They'd doubtless twist a bit then. A belt box and the scattered quarrels it had held were strewn beside the bows. Elminster calmly worked the dead man's windlass. From the ridge above, he could hear the faint clatter of the living armsman's own bow winch. The third bow lay fallen a few paces in front of the thicket. Elminster didn't dare go out to get it. When both bows were loaded and fully ready, Elminster started to worm his way sideways in the thicket. A quarrel dusted snow from a tree back where he'd been. Elminster grinned tightly and stepped forward for a good look. The armsman had just bobbed down to get his second bow. El set down one of his own and raised the other, aimed at where the man had sunk out of view. The moment he saw movement there, he fired. Tyche was with him. The man rose right into the path of the quarrel. Elminster heard his startled gasp, saw him throw his hands up, and watched the man's crossbow crash and cartwheel down the snow-clad slope into the ravine. A moment later, thudding heavily, the body of the armsman followed it. Elminster unloaded his second bow, fired it empty to leave its workings loose, then snatched up all three bows and the belt box of quarrels and hurried around the ridge. There was the horse, alone and unguarded, thank the gods. In a few breaths, Elminster had tied his gear to a seemingly endless collection of saddle straps and thongs and was in the saddle urging the patrol mount to follow the armsman's trail. It went willingly enough, but slipped and slid in the snow in something a little faster than a trot and a lot slower than a gallop. The tracks ahead were clear and easy to follow, so Elminster kicked his heels at the horse's flanks and urged it on. He had to get to Heldreth's horn before any wizard there caught sight of him by some sort of scrying spell and dealt death from afar. Soon he was riding hard, the crossbows bouncing bruisingly at his back, and the mist of his breath streaming back behind him into the darkening air. Night was coming down fast over the hills. He had to succeed. The lives of the outlaws trapped back at Lawless Castle depended on it. As he rode, he smiled at the sudden memory. His father's careful lessons on the duty of every man and maid in the kingdom from farmer to king. If Elthrin had dwelt longer on the duties of king and prince than on those of a farmer or miller, Elminster had thought this only right. The duties were so much grander, the power mightier, the responsibilities heavier than those of all others. He'd not for a moment suspected that he was a prince or would become one when Elthrin died. He recalled clearly his father's words. A king's first duty is to his subjects. Their lives are in his hands, and he must always look to their brightest, surest future in what he does. All depend on him, and all are lost if he neglects his duties or governs by whim or willful heart. Obedience is his due, aye, but he must earn loyalty. Some kings never learn this and what are princes but young willful lads learning to be kings? What indeed, father? Elminster asked the wind of his passing as he rode hard for the horn. The wind did not deign to reply. 3. All too much death in the snows If in winter ye walk when snow is deep, beware when ye talk for afar echoes creep. Old Sword Coast Snow Rune 
Tyche, at least, had heard his prayers. As Elminster rode down a dusky valley along the clear trail the armsmen had left, he caught sight of them gathered below, building fires, and the trails in the snow made it clear they'd met with and joined another patrol instead of going down to the keep, which was still a good ride away. Night would find them very soon, deep in the hills, and they'd halted to make camp. Thank ye, Tyke, Eli told the wind wryly as he pulled his weary mount to a halt. All his foes were gathered together and would soon halt within his reach. As with all the gifts of Lady Luck, this one was double-edged. All he had to do was kill the five armsmen who'd fled from Lawless Castle and all the others they'd met with down there. For a fleeting moment, he wished he were some great mage to send swift death screaming down upon the gathered camp below, or to ride a dragon down to rake, burn, and scatter. Elminster shivered at that memory of Heldon and touched the lion sword where it rode on his thong inside his jerkin. Prince Elminster is a warrior, he told the wind with grand dignity, and then chuckled. More soberly, he added, he kills a man to warm up helps cut up his horse and eat it, then goes out into a battle and slaughters eight more. As if that's not enough, he's now about to sweep down alone on a score or more ready-armed armsmen. What else could he be but a warrior? A fool, of course, a cold voice answered from very near. Elminster whirled around in his saddle. A dark-robed man was standing watching him, standing on empty air, booted feet well above the unbroken snow. El's hand, stabbed to his belt, found one of the salvaged daggers he'd thrust there and hurled it. It spun end over end, flashing as it caught the light of the newly kindled campfires below, and plunged straight through the man to bury itself deep in the snows beyond. Only half the man's mouth smiled. This is but a spell image, fool, he said coldly. You come riding hard, following the trail to our camp. Who are you, and why come you here? Elminster frowned, feigning ignorance as his thoughts raced. Have I reached Athalantar yet? He eyed the mage and added, I seek a mage lord to pass on a message. Are ye such a one? Unfortunately for you, I am, the man replied. Prince Elminster... Oh, yes, I heard your proud little speech. You are Elthrin's son, then, the one we've been seeking. Elminster sat very still, thinking. Could a wizard send a spell through his image? A cold inner voice answered, Why not? Best keep moving in case. He urged the horse with his knees until it trotted ahead, then turned it, circling. That is the name I have taken to bring doom down on a certain mage lord, he said, passing the image. It turned in the air and watched him in easy silence. Hmm. Other mage lords, Elminster added darkly, have plans of their own. The watching wizard laughed. Well, of course they do, boastful boy. Always have had. See me shiver at your sinister words? Do you dance and play cards, too? Elminster felt himself flush with anger. To ride so hard only to be taunted by a wizard from afar while armsmen, no doubt, rode out to encircle him and bring him down at leisure. He spurred away from the wizard, flinging only the calm reply, Yes, of course I do, over his shoulder as he went. He rode hard back the way he'd come but turned up the nearest easy slope to gain a height to look back. The wizard's image hadn't moved, but as he watched, it winked out and was gone, leaving behind only the circle of beaten snow where he'd ridden around it. Aye, there, below, two bands of mounted armsmen were setting out, riding hard in different directions to curve about and ring him in with swords and bows. Full night was falling, but the stars were bright overhead, and Saloon would rise all too soon. How far could that wizard see him? Two plans sprang to mind. Somehow ride wide around them all on his weary mount and sweep down on the camp, hoping to find the wizard and take him with quarrels before he could loose a spell. That's what a bard or teller of tales would expect him to do, to be sure. 
It sounded the work of a reckless fool even to his own ears. The other plot was to get into the path of one band, dig into the snow with all his bows ready, and let his horse run free. If one band of armsmen followed it, he'd have time, perhaps, to take those coming toward him down with his bows, somehow get one of their mounts, and then attack the camp. Then, somehow victorious over a wizard who knew he was coming, he'd set forth on the trail of the other armsmen and take them down one by one with quarrels. It sounded almost as wild. He quoted a line of a ballad he'd once heard. Princes rush in, shouldering fools aside, and find glory, and turned his horse to the right to intercept the band of armsmen he could see better. He thought he counted nine riders, no telling how many were in the other group. His tired horse stumbled twice on the ride and nearly fell when they blundered into a pocket of deep, loose snow. Gently, El murmured to it, suddenly feeling his own aches and weariness in full. All he could do in his mind was numb the pain for a time, and, he touched his chin thoughtfully, stop bleeding. He was no invincible warrior. So, this attack required a fool, not an invincible warrior. But then riding away would be a fool's act, too, even with the comfort of standing up for the memory of his mother and father, and for a day when wizards would not rule Athelantar and the knights would ride again. The knights will ride again, he told the wind. It whirled his words away unheard behind him as he came to a good place for the ambush he planned, a narrow gully on the lee slope of a snow-swept rise, and brought his horse to a halt. Getting down stiffly, he'd not been on a horse much since Heldon burned, and his legs were reminding him of that all too sharply. El unslung his bows and took what he'd need. Grant me luck, he told the wind, but as before, it made no reply. Taking a deep breath of the sharp air, he slapped the horse's rump and roared. The beast bolted, paused to look back, and then trotted off into the snow. Elminster was alone in the night. Not for long, by the gods. Nine armsmen in full armor were riding this way after his blood. Elminster knelt in the snow just below the crest of the rise and worked his windlass like a frenzied wits. By the time he had all three bows loaded and ready, he was gasping for breath and could hear the creak of leather and jangle of metal on the wind. The armsmen were coming down upon him. Lying in the snow, breath streaming back over his shoulder, he arranged the bows, planted four daggers in the snow for ready snatching, and waited. His life hung in the hope that they'd not have bows ready themselves and wouldn't see him in time. Elminster shook his head at his own recklessness and found his mouth suddenly dry. Well, whatever befell, it wouldn't be long now. There was a sudden thunder of hooves, shouts, and the clash of arms. What could be? And suddenly Elminster had no time for speculation as an armsman burst into view, galloping hard, crouched low over the neck of his horse. The Prince of Athelantar raised his bow carefully, steadied it, and fired. The horse plunged on, rearing and giving a high grunt of alarm as it saw the steep descending slope. With no time to veer or slow, it felt the man on its back fall sideways, hard, pulling on its reins. It reared, fighting the reins that were tugging its head around. Its hooves skidded on the snow, and it crashed atop its rider. Together they slid down the hill. The horse sprang up and pranced away, shaking its head as if to clear it. The man lay still in the trampled snow. No more horsemen rode into view and from over the brow of the snow-clad rise came the shouts and steely skirl of battle. Elminster frowned in puzzlement, and then took up his daggers, thrusting them back into his belt. Holding his second bow ready, he advanced cautiously until he could see over the crest. Mounted men were circling and hacking at each other in the night gloom atop the hill. One group was clad in motley garb, the odds and ends of half a hundred mismatched armors, it seemed, and whereby all the gods had they come from. The other group were armsmen, outnumbered more than two to one and fast losing. As Elminster watched, one soldier of Athelantar broke free of the fray, spurring his horse desperately, and set off across the hills at a gallop. The prince of Athelantar set his feet in the snow, raised his bow, and fired. The quarrel passed over the armsman's shoulder, and fleeing warrior galloped on. 
Elminster cursed and ran back for his third bow. Scooping it up, he sprinted along the edge of the hill. The distant armsman was smaller now, but coming into clear view as his horse climbed the unbroken snow of the next slope. Elminster aimed carefully, fired, and saw his quarrel speed true. The armsman threw up his arms, tried to clutch at his back with both hands, and fell off his saddle. The horse went on without him. I didn't think we had any bowmen with us this night. Elminster turned in delighted recognition at that cheery voice. Helm! The leather-jawed knight wore the same tattered leather armor, rusty gauntlets, dented helm, and stubby beard Al remembered, and probably, by the smell of him, hadn't taken them off or washed any part of him since that day on the meadow above Heldon. He rode a mean-looking black horse that was as scarred as its rider, and the long curved sword in his fist was nicked and shining darkly with fresh blood. How came you here? Elminster asked, grinning with the sudden hope that he might not die this night after all. The knight of Athalantar leaned forward in his saddle. We've just come from Lawless Castle, he said with raised brows. Quite a few good men lying dead back there, but Maury couldn't find Eladar among them. When I ran out of armsmen to kill, I came here. Elminster replied gravely. They found the castle, and I had to slay the rest before they had a chance to report it. They went to a camp, those fires there, and there's another band of armsmen, probably larger than this one, over there somewhere. He pointed into the night. They were circling to take me. Helm bellowed, Anthrar, to me, over his shoulder, and then said, Join us then, and we'll ride them down together. There are empty saddles in plenty to spare. Elminster shook his head. My business lies yonder, he said, pointing with a nod of his head toward the unseen camp, with wizards. Elm's fierce grin faded. Are ye ready yet? he asked quietly. Really, lad? Elminster spread his hands, crossbow in one. There's one down there, at least, who knows who I am and what I look like. Helm frowned and nodded urged his mount forward, and clapped Elminster on the shoulder. Then I hope to see ye alive again, prince. As his horse circled, he asked, Would a wild outlaw charge into camp be any help? El shook his head. Nay, Helm, just ride down those armsmen. If ye get every last one of them, Lawless Castle may be safe for a winter or two yet, so long as all outlaws have the sense to abandon it this summer. When the snows are gone, the wizards will be sure to scour these hills with all the spells and swords they can muster. Helm nodded. Wise talk. Let us meet again among the living. He raised his blade in salute. Elminster lifted his bow in response, and spurred away as the snow began to fall again. Soft flakes drifted down endlessly. Elminster ate a handful of snow to get a drink, recovered his bows and readied them and set out over the hills toward the camp. He walked in a wide curve to the right, hoping to come on it from the other side, though with spells, couldn't wizards see in all directions? Well, no doubt they run out of magic the same way armsmen run out of quarrels. He'd just have to count on their not scrying for a lone boy on foot in the snows. If he saw this night through, El reflected, he'd owe the gods much indeed. Tripods of halberds held the flickering storm lanterns high. Snow whirled endlessly down into their bright radiance where, at the heart of the camp, the wizard Kaladar Theron frowned down at a sphere of glowing light that hung in the air before him. Though the night was cold, sweat beaded off his brow from the effort of keeping the sphere in existence, and in a breath or two he'd have to hold it together while he cast another spell into it, a spell of many leaping lightnings that, if he managed the casting, would burst forth from the distant sphere linked to this one, a sphere bobbing like a pale ghost over the snow-clad hills not far away, just in front of the hard-riding outlaw band. The mage lord muttered the incantation that would link the two spells and felt the power rising within him. He spread his hands in exultation and noted without looking the awed faces and hasty retreat of his bodyguards. He almost grinned as he began calling up the lightnings. Two intricate gestures, a grand flourish, and the speaking of a single word. 
Now for the taking up of the pins, then a rub of the rod of crystal with the fur, and last, the crowning incantation. His hand swept down. The crossbow bolt intended for his heart struck him in the shoulder, numbing his arm and spinning him around. The sphere collapsed in a crackling burst of lightnings that drowned out the mage lord's startled scream of pain. The wizard sank down, clutching at his shoulder as another quarrel hissed past him. An armsman flung himself headlong into the well-trodden snow to avoid it, and his fellows drew their blades and ran toward the source of the quarrels. Coolly, Elminster watched them come, his last bow raised. There, as he suspected, out of a tent came another robed man, not much older than he was but with a wand in his hand, looking around for the source of all the commotion. Carefully, Elminster put his last ready quarrel in the man's throat. Then he dropped his bow, unbuckled the bulky belt box of quarrels and let it fall, and drew his own steel. Angry armsmen were rushing to meet him. Elminster charged them, a sword in one hand and a dagger in the other. The first man tried to beat his blade aside and run him through, but Elminster locked their blades together, pushed until they were face to face, steel shrieking in their ears, and drove his dagger into one of the man's eyes. Shoving the convulsing corpse away, the prince ran on toward the next man, shouting, For Athelantar! This armsman stepped to the left, yelling to a companion to head to the right and close. L flung a dagger at the second man's face. Helm was right. Some of these warriors weren't much good. This one threw up both gauntleted hands to shield his face, and Elminster's low thrust left him groaning over the blade in his guts. As L tugged his steel free, the next armsman approached warily. Elminster bent, plucked the dagger from the belt of the feebly moving man he'd just felled, and ran to one side. The surviving foe was still circling when Elminster sped away, back toward the camp. A man in gleaming armor met him just inside the circle of light, a halberd in his hands. Elminster ran for the blade, battled it aside with his own, and stabbed. The armor turned his point aside, but then he was passed, charging right into a tripod of halberds. They toppled, and the lantern they held shattered and sent a tent ablaze with a sudden roar. Men shouted, in the intense leaping light El saw the mage lord stagger away, the quarrel still in his shoulder, but men with gleaming swords were running toward him, between him and the wizard. Elminster snarled and turned sharply to the right, dodging between tents and away from the light. He blundered right into a man coming out of one tent and stabbed frantically. The surprised armsman toppled onto the canvas without a sound. Wearily, Elminster headed out into the night. If he could circle back to his bows and— But armsmen were close behind him and running hard. Well, at least there were no bowmen in camp, or he'd be dead already. Elminster hurried over a hill and dropped down out of sight of the raging flames that now marked the camp. Looking back, he could see two men following. He slowed to a walk and began his wide circle. Let them draw nearer and save him the breath. Panting, he topped another ridge and saw men gathered below, and horses. Helm's band. Some of them looked up and started toward him with swords drawn, but Helm saw him and waved. Eladar! Done? One wizard dead, but the other just wounded, El managed to gasp. Half the camp is after me, too. Helm grinned. We were resting our horses and looting armsmen. Some of them were wearing armor much too good for him. Change your mind about that charge? El nodded wearily. Seems a better idea now, he said, breathing heavily. Helm grinned, turned, and gave quick orders, and then pointed out a horse. Take ye that one, Eladar, and follow me. Leaving four outlaws behind with the loot and extra horses, the ragged knights of Athalantar rode along the way Elminster had come. One had scrounged a short horse bow. As they crested the hill, he drew and loosed, shoulders rolling smoothly, and one of the armsmen who'd been following Elminster clutched at his throat and fell over in the snow, kicking. The others turned and fled. With a whoop, one of the knights broke into a gallop, waving his sword as he urged his horse on, riding an armsman down and chopping another with his blade. The man fell and did not rise. Ye seem to bring us luck, Helm shouted as they rode. Care to lead us to break down the walls of Hastarl? Elminster shook his head. 
I grow tired of death, Helm, he shouted back, and I fear the better ye do, the more the wizards will hurl this way come spring. A few dead outlander merchants are one thing, entire patrols of armsmen slaughtered are another. They dare not let it go unpunished, or folk all o'er the realm will know, and remember, and get ideas. Helm nodded. All the same, it feels good to hit out and really do some damage to these wolves. Ah, ye did quite a job, he delightedly pointed ahead at the blazing tents. Hope you left the food tents alone. Elminster could only chuckle as they galloped in among the running, shouting defenders. The knights hacked armsmen as their horses reared, trampled the wounded and the fleeing, and the camp soon grew quiet. Helm shouted for order. Let us have watch guards there and there and there, in pairs and in the saddle, well out beyond the light. The rest of ye six to a tent, and report back what ye find. No destroying stuff, mind. If ye find a live wizard or someone else to fight, call it out. The knights bent willingly to work. There were glad shouts when the kitchen tent was found to have several full metal sledges of meat, potatoes, and keg beer. Grim-faced knights also brought Helm some spell books and scrolls, but of the wounded wizard there was no sign, and there was no man who served mage lords left alive in the camp. Right, we stay here this night, Helm said. Pick at all the horses ye can find, and let's make a feast and eat. In the morn we'll take all we can, scuttle back to the castle, and rig these tents in the ravine by Wind Cavern as shelter for the horses. Then... All pray to Oral and Talos for fresh snows to cover our tracks. There was a general roar of approval, and Helm leaned close to Elminster and said, Ye wanted to leave the hills, lad, and I can't help but think ye've read the wizards aright. I need these books and other mage stuff hidden, and I was thinking of that cavern in the meadow above Heldon. There's loose stones enough to wall em in there, ye know where, and ye can hunt deer and the like until summer when I'll come looking for ye again. If armsmen sniff about, go into the high forest and hide there. They never dare go very far in. He scratched his chin. You'll never carry the brawn to be a horse warrior, lad, and I'd say you've done better than most at learning to shoot quarrels and swing swords and shiver in caves as an outlaw. Perhaps the alleys and crowds of Hestarl will do ye better as a place to hide now and be closer to mage lords who aren't alert for your blood, to learn what ye can of them before ye decide ye must strike out. The knight turned keen eyes on the young prince. What say? Elminster nodded slowly. Aye, good plan, he murmured. Helm grinned, clapped him on the shoulder, and then caught him as Elminster sagged over sideways into the snow the world spinning in a sudden green and yellow haze again. The darkness of utter exhaustion rushed up to claim him, and El felt himself swept away. Damned soft ride these armsmen have, Helm commented briskly the next morning as they sat eating smoked beef and hard bread spread with garlic butter. Groans and satisfied belches from all around them told them that most of the long hungry knights had gorged themselves. Snores from among empty casks betrayed how certain others had spent the dark hours. Elminster nodded. Helm looked at him sharply. What's on your mind, lad? If I never have to kill a man again, t'will be too soon, Elminster said quietly, looking around at bloodstains in the trampled snow. The knight nodded. I could see it in your eyes last night. He grinned suddenly and added, Yet ye took care of more trained and ready warriors yester eve than many men managed to slay in a long career of soldiering. Elminster waved a hand. I'm trying to forget it. Sorry, lad. Feeling up to the trip afoot, or would ye rather ride? The one's easier, as long as ye can find hay enough for the horse, and they eat like proper pigs, mind— but they'll draw eyes your way in a hurry, especially when you cross the run in Upshin. Try to do that with a few wagons, and look like you're part of the group, however you go. If anyone sees the spell books and scrolls you're carrying, twill mean your death. The knight scratched at his beard and went on. The other way, though, is slow and hard, even if you can keep warm, 
and mind, to get feet wet is death in this winter. I'll walk, Elminster said. I'll take a bow and as much food as I can stagger along with as well. No armor, so long as I can get good gloves and a better scabbard. Helm grinned. A legion of dead armsmen will graciously provide. Elminster could not manage to return the grin. He'd killed more than a few of them, men who should be riding proudly for Atalantar right now. Free from the orders of wizards, it all came back to the mage lords. They are the ones who have to die, he whispered to himself, for Atalantar to live. Helm nodded. Nice phrase, that. They must die for Athalantar to live. A good battle cry. Think I'll use it. Elminster smiled. Just to be sure the folk hearing it know who the they is. Helm gave back a twisted smile. That's a problem many have had down the years. The fox that had followed him for the last few miles took a final look at Elminster, its dark eyes glistening and then scampered away through frozen ferns. El listened to its retreat, wondering if the fox were a mage lord spy, but somehow knowing it was not. When the creature was long gone, he moved on as quietly as he could through the trees around the back of the inn paddock. Seek the feed hatch by the haystack, Helm had said, and there was the hay against the back wall of the stables. The structure kept out most of the snow by means of a long, sagging roof on pillars that had only a nodding acquaintance with the word straight, just as Helm had described it, the back way into Wood's Edge Inn. Elminster moved closer, hoping there were no dogs awake to sound an alarm. None yet. Elminster silently thanked the gods as he crept over the low gate on the inside of the paddock, slipped around the haystack, and found the hatch. Only its own weight held it shut. He didn't even have to put down his sword to open it and climb in. When he'd drawn the hatch closed behind him, the stable was very still and warmer than the night outside. A horse shifted and kicked idly against the side of its stall. Elminster studied the stable and noted one stall filled with shovels, rakes, buckets, and hanging coils of lead rain, another with straw. Sheathing his blade and taking down a long tined fork, El probed carefully into it, but there was nothing solid beneath to wake or snarl, so he lifted the wooden pin and went in. It was the work of but a few breaths to burrow into the straw. He settled himself so he was hidden from view and settled against the cold by a thick blanket of hay. Relaxing, Elminster called on his will to take himself down to the floating place of whispers to sink down amid white radiance and sleep. Straw rustled and scratched his hands as he lurched up out of it. Elminster's eyes flew open. He was rising up through the straw, flying. His head struck the beam overhead hard. My apologies, Prince, came a cold, familiar voice. I fear I've wakened you. Elminster felt himself being turned in the air to hang in emptiness facing the wizard, who stood in the corridor between the stalls, smiling darkly. The blue glow of magic pulsed brightly around the man's hands and encircled a pendant at his throat. Anger rose in Elminster as he tried to grab the lion's sword but found his arms wouldn't move. He was at the mercy of this mage lord. He tried to speak and found he could. Who are ye? he asked slowly. The mage sketched an elaborate bow and said pleasantly, Kaladar Theorin, at your service. Elminster felt himself being pulled forward in the air and at the same time saw a long tined pitchfork rising from where it leaned against the side of the stall and turning one of its sharp points toward his left eye. Slowly, lazily, it drifted nearer. Elminster stared past it at the wizard, fighting down an urge to swallow. There is little of fairness in thy fighting, mage, he said coldly. The wizard laughed. How old are you, prince? Sixteen winters? And you still expect to find this world a fair place? Well, you are a dolt, he sneered. 
you fancy yourself a warrior and fight with sharpened pieces of metal. Well, then, I am a mage and do my fighting with spells. Where's the unfairness in that? The blue radiance of magic began to pulse strongly about the mage lord's hands, and the fork drifted closer. Elminster's throat was unbearably dry now. He swallowed despite himself. The wizard laughed. Not so brave now, are we? Tell me, Prince of Athalantar, how much are you willing to do for me, to be allowed to live? Live? Why won't ye kill me, wizard? I know ye want to, Elminster said, with more stern bravado than he felt. Other mage lords, the wizard quoted his own words mockingly, have plans of their own. He laughed coldly. As a prince of Athalantar, you have great value. If anything happens to Belor, or it becomes necessary that something should happen to him, it would be very handy to have my own pet princeling hidden away for use in the unpleasantness that would ensue. The fork drifted a little nearer. Of course, blindness won't hamper you when I transform you into... A turtle, perhaps? Or a slug? Even better, a maggot. You can feed on the gore of your friends the outlaws when we slay them. If we can't catch any, of course, you'll go hungry. The mage's taunting voice trailed off into cold laughter. Elminster found himself drenched with sudden sweat as cold fear wormed its way up into his throat. He hung in the air, trembling and helpless, and closed his eyes. An instant later, he felt them being forced open, and turned in their sockets until he was staring helplessly at the wizard. He found he couldn't speak any longer or make any sound short of the whistle of his breath. No screaming now, the wizard said pleasantly. We don't want you rousing the good folk of the inn but I want to see your face when the fork goes in. Elminster could only stare in horror at the tine of the fork looming closer, closer. Behind the wizard, a door swung silently open, and a stout man with a curling mustache leaned into the room, a heavy axe raised. He brought it down hard. There was a meaty thud, and the wizard's head lolled sideways as it was split. Blood flew and Elminster and the fork both fell abruptly to the floor. He was up in an instant, the lion sword in his hand, hurrying. Back, my prince, the man roared, throwing out one huge hand to ward him away. He may have spells linked to his death. The man himself took a pace back and watched the body narrowly, the bloody axe ready on his shoulder. Elminster watched, too, and saw the faint blue glows faded from everything except the mage's pendant, then slowly he walked out of the stall. That pendant is magical, he said quietly, but I can see nothing else. My thanks. The man bowed. An honor if you are what the mage lord called you. I am, Elminster replied. I am Elminster, son of Elthrin, who is dead. Helm Stoneblade said I could trust you. If you are the one called Broarn. The man bowed again. I am. Be welcome in my inn, though I must warn you, lord, that six armsmen sleep under this roof tonight, and at least one merchant who tells all he sees to magelings. This stable is palace enough, Elminster said with a smile. I've run from wizards and armsmen across half the Horn Hills to here, and was beginning to wonder where in the world I could be free of them. There is no place to hide from strong magic, Broorn said soberly. "'Tis why men hold these lands now, and not the fair folk. "'I thought elven magic o'ermatched that of men,' Elminster said curiously. "'If elven mages wielded it together, aye, but elves have little taste for war, "'and spend much of their time feuding with each other. "'Most of them are also—we would call it idle. "'They trouble themselves more about having a good time and less about doing things.' The innkeeper reached back through the door he'd come in by, produced a blanket, and tossed it over the side of a stall. Human wizards, no less, Broarn went on, 
stepping into the unseen passage beyond the door and reappearing with a covered serving platter and an old battered tankard as large as Elminster's head, but are always trying to find old spells or create new ones. Elven mages only smile, say they already know all they need to, or, if they're arrogant, say they know everything there is to know, and do nothing. Elminster saw a nearby stool and sat down. Tell me more, he said, please. What that mage said about my simple ways is true enough. I would hear more of the way of the world hereabouts. Roarn smiled and passed him the tray and the tankard. His smile broadened as Elminster lifted the lid, saw cold fowl, and dug in eagerly. Ah, but you have the wits to know that, Lord, where most don't. Here in Athalantar there's little to say. The mage lords have this land by the throat and don't mean to shift their grip. Yet, for all their heirs, they couldn't hold a magic apprenticeship at some places in the Southlands. Elminster looked up with his mouth full, but his eyebrows raised. The innkeeper nodded. Aye, the lands down there have always been rich and crowded, fair crawling with folk. The greatest realm is Kalimshan, the place those dusky-skinned merchants with their heads wrapped, who come here all bundled up in furs in spring and fall, come from. I've never seen them, Elminster said quietly. The innkeeper scratched at his mustache. You have been hidden away, lad. Well, to tell the tale short, there's a huge lawless land north of Kalimshan, all forests and rivers, where their nobles always go to hunt game, or went, that is. An archmage, that's a wizard stronger by far than these mage lords, Broarn paused to spit thoughtfully on the dead wizard at his feet, set himself up there, and now rules most of it. The Kalishar, it used to be called. I know not if he's renamed it, as he seems bent on changing all else. The Mad Mage, they call him, because he chases his whims so fiercely and doesn't care about what he destroys in the doing. Ilhundle's his name. Since he claimed the land, all the folk as didn't want to be turned into frogs and falcons have moved on, north, most of them. Elminster sighed. It sounds as if there's nowhere in all the world at peace for mages. Broarn smiled. It feels that way, my lord, it does. If you must hide from the mage lords, go up the unicorn run deep into the high forest. They fear the fair folk will rise against them there, and they're right on that. The elves fear to lose more land to the axes of Athalantar and will fight for every tree. If you need to hide only from armsmen... Wormwood right behind us here will do. They fear dragons. The mages know better. They slew the last dragon hereabout and took its hoard, some twenty winters gone, but can't get a simple folk to believe that. Elminster smiled. And if I want to stand and fight, how can I best a wizard? Broarn spread his large and hairy hands. Learn or hire stronger magic. El shook his head. How would ye trust anyone stronger in magic than mage lords? What's to stop them from just taking the throne themselves after they've slain these wizards? The innkeeper nodded and gave Elminster a nod of approval. A point, aye. Well, the other way is much slower and less sure. Elminster leaned forward on the stool and swept his hand up in a beckoning wave. So tell. Work from within as a rat gnaws away in the pantry. How does a man become a rat? Steal. Be a thief in the back streets and the low taverns and the markets of Hastarl, close to the wizard's backsides, and wait and watch and learn. Warriors have to stand tall and wave blades, and be seen and slain by any mageling that points a wand their way, and outlaws must needs come out to seize food all too often. You've probably seen enough of the wilderlands of your realm to satisfy your curiosity, "'Tis time to learn the ways of the city, of thieving. "'It prepares one for ruling, some say.' "'He lifted a corner of his mouth at his own jest. "'Besides, a warrior's way is no more, no less safe than being a thief. "'Any man can be overcome if caught alone, as you learned tonight. "'And if you wait long enough—' "'El grinned like a wolf over dinner, rose, "'and took hold of the mage lord's legs.' 
Have ye a shovel? Broarn returned the look. Aye, and a nice warm manure pile to dig with it, prince. They clasped each other's arms as one warrior to another. At least get some more food into you before you move on, Broarn grunted, handing a tray into the end stall. Elminster took it. Steam and a delicious smell were rising together from a bowl on the tray. Nay, he said, I should be— And then his stomach growled so loudly that he and the innkeeper both laughed. Mind you take that pendant with you when you go and hide it somewhere else, Broarn said sternly. I don't want mage lords tracing it here, digging it up from whatever clever hiding place you've chosen, and then trying to gently question me with their spells. It will leave with me, Elminster promised. It's under a stone on the road outside right now, where a road thief might have left it. Well enough, said Broarn. So I— He broke off and held up a hand to bid Elminster to silence. Then the innkeeper bent his head to the hatch at the back of the stables, listening intently. After a moment, he slid his hand back through the side door. It reappeared, clutching the old axe, raised and ready. Elminster drew the broken lion sword and sank down in the stall, holding up a large armload of straw to conceal himself, though betraying steam rose idly from the tray. The hatch opened in well-oiled silence. Broarn stood calmly just inside it and broke into a smile at about the same time a familiar voice said, Waiting up for me, dearest? Weren't expecting me? In with you, Helm while there's still some warmth in my stables, the innkeeper growled in reply, stepping back. I brought friends, the knight said as he stepped into the room looking dirtier than ever. He scowled as Elminster rose in his stall, straw in his hair and sword in hand. Is this how far you've got? I thought you'd be well across the river by now, he said. Elminster shook his head, losing his grin fast. The mage lord who escaped us at the camp found me here somehow. Probably he can trace the spell book and nearly slew me. Broarn cut him down with that axe. Helm turned to regard the innkeeper with new respect. A slayer of mage lords now. He circled Broarn as if viewing a lady in a bold new gown, then nodded approvingly. Tis a most exclusive brotherhood, ye know. Besides the lad here and meself, its only members are the dead and a few living mage lords. Why the helm? Broarn broke in bluntly. Why are you here? I've armsmen in the house, as you should know. As they'd been talking, night after outlaw night had slipped in through the hatch, crowding into the end stalls. So many of them wore armor scavenged from the soldiery of Athalantar that it looked as if a half-dozen or more rather scruffy armsmen stood in the stable now. There is a matter of some small urgency, I, Helm said more soberly, which is why Maury's shivering in a sledge outside with another twenty-odd brave blades. They took Lawless Castle? The innkeeper sounded shocked. Nay, we fled from it before they could trap us there. The mage lords sent a large band of armsmen out of Sarn Torel, guarding over a dozen mages. They've slain twenty or more wild swords we know of, and tortured at least one with spells. They know where the castle is by now, and are heading straight for it. So you brought them here. My thanks, Helm, Broarn said bitterly and sketched a courtly bow. They'll have no way of knowing we did any more than steal a horse or two. Helm said firmly. We're leaving very soon, now that ye and the lad here, a country boy named Eladar, by the way, if he hasn't told you, the two men exchanged a fleeting, level look. Know the tidings. Eladar was right. We've been too good at killing armsmen, and now they're determined to slay the lot of us. The wizards daren't let such defiance succeed, or soon the whole realm will be up in arms. We must run. Any suggestions, wise innkeeper? Broarn snorted. Run to the Kalishar and get Ilhundel to teach you to be master mages so you can come back and fight these mage lords. Get a friendly mage to hide all of you as frogs before the mage lords can find you and do it swifter. Go to the depths of the elven realms and get them to hide you somehow. Call on the gods for miracles. I believe that about covers it. 
There's one other place, Elminster said quietly. The silence of utter astonishment fell on both Helm and Broorn. They turned as one to look at the lad in the scorched leather jerkin standing alone in his stall. He'd slid his sword into hiding and picked up the bowl of turkey soup Broorn had brought him. As they watched, he calmly took a spoonful, smiled, dipped his spoon into the bowl again, drew forth another spoonful, and blew on it to cool it. I'll slay ye, lad, if ye don't stop playing the fool, Helm growled, taking a step toward him. That's more or less what the mage lord said to me, Elminster remarked mildly. And look ye what befell him. Helplessly, Helm started to laugh, and that set Broarn and the other outlaws off into roars of mirth while Elminster assumed an air of innocence over his bowl and ladled several spoonfuls into his mouth fearing chances to do so later would be few. All right, lad, Broarn managed when he had breath enough. Give. Where to hide? Among a lot of folk that wizards dare not slay or upset too many of, or they'll have no realm left. And has Starl itself, Elminster said. Helm and a lot of the outlaw knights behind him stared at the youth with open mouths aghast. But ye'll attack the first mage ye see when ye step inside the gates, and we'll all perish right then, the battered knight protested. Elminster shook his head. Nay, he said. Watching sheep taught me patience, and hunting wizards is teaching me guile. Ye are crazed, one of the other outlaws muttered. Aye, another agreed. Wait a bit, still another protested. The more I think on it, the better it seems. Ye want death at your elbow every day when ere ye go out? I've got that now, and if I go to Hastarl, like the lad says, I might get me a warm house to sleep in or winters. Then they were all talking, arguing earnestly, until Broarn hissed, You will be quiet, to night after night, waving his axe under their noses for emphasis. When he had silence, the fat innkeeper said, if you make that sort of noise, I'll have armsmen up from their beds and in here to see what fun they're missing. Anyone want that? He let silence stretch for a moment or two, and then went on quietly. Some of you will want to remain in the hills or flee to other lands, but some may want to go with the lad here to his star. Whatever you decide, do it well back in the woods. I want all of you away from here before dawn. Helm, bring Maury and the homestuffs she's got in by the back door. She stays here. Don't let anyone help you who can't move quietly. Now, out, all of you, and may the luck of the gods cloak you and keep you. The meeting was breaking up. The time to strike was now. This deed would surely win him a rank among the mage lords. No more apprenticeship to fat old Harsker and real power at last. Sephardin Olin rose from the cold hillside, letting his eavesdropping spell fade away. He raised the wands in his hands, aiming at the hatch. Best to strike now before any of them left the place. Die, fools, he said with a smile, and then pitched forward like a felled tree as a stone the size of a war helm smashed into the back of his head. As the blood-spattered rock settled smoothly into the snow, the two fallen wands rose by themselves and gilded in a gentle arc through the trees to the next knoll, where a tall, lean woman stood watching them come with large, dark eyes. Her face was bone-white, and her hair a curling honey-brown. At one glance, a farmer would have bowed to her as a lady. She put out a hand to take the wands as they glided up to her, and her dark green cloak swirled about her as if moved by unseen hands. Silvern threads on its shoulders were worked in a mage sigil of linked circles. The sorceress watched the outlaws stride into the woods and waved a hand. Her body faded, rippled, and became just another of the shifting shadows here in the winter-stripped trees, cloaked and unseen save for her large liquid black eyes. They blinked once as they watched Elminster hug Helm in farewell before heading south, alone.
The soul is strong in you, Prince of Athalantar, their owner said quietly. Live then, and let us see what you can do. Part 2 Burglar 4. They come out at night. Thieves? Ah, such an ugly word. Think of them instead as kings in training. Ye seem upset, even disputatious. Well then, look upon them as the most honest sort of merchant. The character Oglar, the Thief Lord, in the anonymous play Shards and Swords, Year of the Screeching Vole. It was just one more in an endless string of hot, damp days in the early summer of the Year of the Black Flame. Folk in Hestarl had taken to lying more or less unclad on the flat stretches of their rooftops and their balconies after sunset, hoping for a breeze to blow over their skin and bring them some fleeting moments of comfort. This was good for both pleasure and business, the predictable pleasure and one business in particular. Ah, Farrell said softly, leaning forward to peer out of the slit window. The show of flesh beginneth again, so it doth. When you've finished drooling down the stonework, the slim, beak-nosed youth behind him said dryly, do ye hold the line while I go down? That'll be about dawn, I'd say, was the reply. I then, hold the line now and look later. Elminster cast a glance over the head of his fellow thief and squinted professionally. Ah, yes, quite a tattoo there, though how the man sees it with the curve of his belly between his eyes and where it is, only the gods can know. Farrell chuckled. Think of what it must have felt like getting it, too. He winced with an exaggerated flourish and added, But you're supposed to be looking at the maids, El, not at the men. Ah, I've got to learn to tell the difference. It gets me into more trouble, Elminster replied serenely. Then what he'd been waiting for befell. A large bank of clouds drifted across the moon. Without another word, he slipped through the narrow window, one hand on the rope harness, and was gone. Farrell settled the smooth leather rope slide securely on the sill, and with surprising strength, slowed the line gliding through it to a gentle, continuous movement until a sharp jerk told him to stop. He thrust a dagger into one of the holes in the wheel from which the rope unwound, then looked out the window. Directly under him, in the empty air beneath the outthrust upper room of the tower, Elminster calmly hung suspended outside the window of the room below. One of his hands, the hand wearing a wrapping coated with sticky honey cake, was on the tower wall. L was keeping himself to one side of the window, out of the view of the room's occupants. He peered in for what seemed a very long time before raising his hand in a signal, not looking up. Farrell passed the reachers down on their own lines. Hanging there in the quickening night breeze, Elminster took hold of them. Two long, thin wooden sticks with wrist braces at one end, like crutches, and sticky balls of precious sturge glue on their other ends. A hooked and pad-ended side prong jutted from one stick. L delicately used that prong to swing the shutters fully back, and then withdrew the reachers and waited patiently. No sound came from within, and after several long breaths, he reached out again. One stick slid in until its leather sleeve caught the sill. He balanced its weight there, and then slid it onward through its sleeve, probing delicately inside the room. When he drew it out, a gem gleamed on the sticky end. He backed the stick until he could slide his hand up to its tip, let it dangle from its line while he thrust the gem into the tube bag of stout canvas he wore around his neck, and then reached into the room with the stick again, slowly, smoothly, silently. Thrice more the sticks appeared, were emptied of precious cargo, and returned to the room. Farrell saw the youth below wipe sweating hands on dark, dusty leather breeches, and then lean forward again. He held his breath, knowing what that gesture meant. 
Eladar the Dark was about to try something especially reckless. Farrell mouthed a silent prayer to Mask, Lord of all thieves. Elminster reached into the bedchamber once more. His sticks slid over the bare, slumbering body of the young merchant's wife, only inches above the soft curves of her flesh, and paused over her throat. She wore a dark ribbon there, and below it, a pectoral of linked emeralds, topped by a spider of black wire whose body was a single huge ruby. Elminster watched the jewelry rise and fall ever so slightly with her slow and even breathing. If it was like others he'd seen, the spider could be unclasped to be worn alone as a cloak pin. If, a touch just so, a wiggle to be sure it was caught, and now so was he. This had to work or he'd be left with a stick twice as long as a man stuck to the breast of a naked woman who'd not stay asleep for very long. And a little lift, up and back, so. Don't brush her nose with it now. With infinite care and patience, El brought the reachers back out of the window. When he dropped the jewels into the bag and jerked the rope for Farrell to pull him up, he felt that the spider was still warm from her breathing. Elminster smelled the musky scent clinging to it, sighed soundlessly, and wondered fleetingly what women were like. "'With those we can live like idle rich blades for five ten days at least,' Farrell said, eyes shining in the dim light of their hovel hideaway. "'Aye,' Elminster said, "'and get noticed in three evenings. Just who'd you think we can sell that spider to in this city?' We'll have to wait for a discreet merchant who's got something to hide and knows we know it, leaving the city, and sell it to him then. Nay, we sell the ring with the emerald this night, before word gets out. No marks there to say it's hers for certain. Then we lie low, back to hanging around the black boots waiting for hire as dockhands and errand runners. Farrell stared at him for a moment, mouth open to protest, but then closed it in a smile and nodded. You've the right of it as usual, Eladar. You've the cunning of an alley cat, to be sure. Elminster struggled. I'm still alive, if that's what you mean. Let's go discover some place that serves drink to young blades with dry throats and loose purses. Farrell laughed, slid the bag back into the hollow stone block, clambered up the ragged stones of the crumbling chimney, and shoved the block the full length of his arm back into the dark hollow space between floor and ceiling. Withdrawing his arm from the splinter-edged hole, he replaced the dead, dangling, half-eaten rat they'd used to deter searchers and slid back down the chimney to the floor. Around them, the gloomy back room of the shut-up cobbler's shop stank from its occasional use as a toilet by cats, dogs, drunks, and stray street folk. The cobbler had died of black tongue fever early in the spring, the sane folk made no plans to disturb the place until at least a season had passed. Then it would be smoked to clear disease vapors and torn down. Then Farrell and Elminster planned to have a new and better loot cache among the ornamental roof spires of the proud houses near Hestarl's north wall. They had their eyes on a tall residence whose roof sported crouching, snarling, sculpted gargoyles. If one could be beheaded and hollowed out without anyone in the grand house beneath noticing, they'd have an ideal place. Aye, if. The two youths nodded to each other, knowing their silent thoughts had skulked along the same alley. Farrell peered out the watch hole and after a moment waved Elminster on. He stepped unconcernedly out into the narrow dark passage outside and slipped away. Farrell followed dagger drawn, just in case. It was a full breath later before any of the rats dared come out into the open to get at the moldy slab of cheese the young thieves had thoughtfully left behind. The kissing wench was a loud, crowded press of good folk, ribaldry and slapping and pinching, pursuit of a night's lust, roared jests and tossed coins, and reckless chase of wine-soaked oblivion. Farl and Eladar took their tankards to their favorite dark corner, just off the bar, where they could see who came in, but be seen only by the night-sighted and the determined. 
Their spot was occupied already, of course, by ladies whose names they knew well despite a persistent lack of the coinage necessary for more intimate acquaintance. The hour was too early for business to be brisk, so the evening lasses were sipping from glasses in their hands and rubbing scent into the backs of their knees and the crooks of their elbows, and there was still room to sit down on the benches. Game for an early kiss and cuddle? Ashanda asked disinterestedly examining her nails. She knew what their reply would be before it came. Nothing from the one with the unruly black hair and the beaky nose. And from Farrell? Nay, we just like to watch. He leered at her over his tankard. She gave him a mock, coquettish look, batting her eyes and putting two delicate fingers to her mouth in a shocked expression, and then replied, And most of them want a cheering audience. So that's a right. Just be sure to give way when we need the space on the benches, or it's my blade toe you'll be feeling. They'd seen her put her dagger-tipped boot into the shins of many a man, and once into the gut of a sailor who didn't know his own cruel strength. He'd ended up screaming his guts out, literally, on the tavern floor. Both thieves nodded hastily as the other girls tittered. Farrell gave one of them a wink, and she leaned forward to pat his knee. The movement made her low-cut silken bodice slide, smooth and cool, across Elminster's arm. He hastily transferred his tankard out of the way, feeling a stirring in him. Buddha Ira saw his swift movement and turned her head to smile up at him. Her scent, something of roses, not so strong as of some of the reeks the ladies used, wafted to his nostrils. Elminster shivered. Any time you have the coins, love— she breathed huskily. Elminster managed to get the back of his hand over his nose in time. Then his sneeze slopped beer down the side of his tankard and nearly knocked her sideways to the floor. Hoots and roars filled the corner. Buddha Ira gave him a glare and then softened it to an expression of sorrow when she saw that his distress and his stammered apology were genuine. She patted his knee and said, There, there. "'Tis all a matter of improving your technique, and that I can teach you. "'If you can afford her lessons,' another girl cackled, and there were chuckles all around. "'El wiped his streaming eyes on the back of his sleeves and nodded thanks to Buddha Ira. "'But she was already turning away to ask another girl where that coppery nail daub had come from "'and how much it had cost.' Farrell ran his fingers through the air above his ear and drew his hand down to stare in delight at a silver coin in his fingers, as if he'd never seen it before. Look at this, he said to Eladar. Mayhap there's another. There was. He held them up in triumph and said, I'm ready, Buddha Ira, and I'm willing, and I see you're free of guests at the m For two silver bits, she said in a flat, cold tone, that's the way I'm staying, my love. The laughter of the girls galed around them. Men with tall frosted flagons in hand drifted nearer to see what merriment was afoot, or a bench. Farrell looked crestfallen. I don't think there's anything more back there, but I didn't comb my hair this morn. His look changed to hopeful, and he ran his hands through his hair again, then shook his head. Nay, one of the girls made a sound of mock sorrow, but he held up his hand. Wait a bit, wait a bit. I've not checked all me hair, now have I? Farrell leered again and reached inside his dark shirt to scratch at his armpit. His fingers worked lustily and then paused. Farrell frowned, drew out an imaginary, at least so Elminster hoped, pinch of lice and examined them critically. Then he pretended to eat them, licked his fingers daintily, and when he was done, darted his hand into his shirt again, trying the other armpit. Almost immediately, his eyes grew round and wondering. Slowly, he drew out a gold coin. He sniffed at it, drew back in mock disgust, and then held it up with a laugh of triumph. See you? Now that, Buddha Ira purred, leaning forward again, is worth more than a sneeze. Have you another? Farrell looked hurt. Just how dirty do you think my armpits are, anyway? Tinkling, genuine laughter surrounded them. The ladies were amused. El watched impassively, 
Only a corner of his mouth crooked upward as Buddha Ira leaned forward until her darting tongue almost brushed Farl's ear and breathed, For just two silver bits more, I might be persuaded to make a pauper's exception just this once. For two silver bits more, Farl said with elaborate dignity, I might be compelled to accept your generous offer, good lady. Now, if someone in this august company would be so good as to lend me the trifling sum of, ah, uh, two silver bits? There were snorts and lazily rude gestures from the benches beside him. Elminster held out a hand. When he turned it over, two silver coins were stuck to his palm. Rather dubiously, Farrell bent and plucked them free, one after another. Elminster had used only a trifling touch of gum on each. By the time Farrell presented them to Buddha Ira with a flourish, they were quite clean. Buddha Ira beckoned for the gold first. When she had it, she reached into her own armpit and made the coin disappear into the little scented safe pouch most of the ladies wore there. Then she took the pieces of silver, spun them briefly in the air in expert fingers, held up the last one, and kissed it, eyes on Farl's. We have a deal, then, my lord of love. She leaned forward, eyes suddenly full of mystery, and like a silent and watchful snake, Elminster slid out from his seat beside Farl to give them room. Buddha Ira purred wordless thanks to him as she moved her lithe body into the vacated space and set to work. Elminster stepped away, shaking his tankard in little circular movements, to feel what little was left at the bottom of it, and froze. A slim finger was stroking him ever so softly. He looked down and caught his breath. They called Shandaith the shadow for the silence of her entrances and exits, more than once, Al and Farl had agreed she must be an accomplished thief, or if she wasn't, was as accomplished at skulking as the best of them. Her large, dark eyes looked up past his belt buckle at Elminster, and he felt the need to swallow, his throat suddenly dry. Coins to lend, Eladar the Dark? Have ye coins to spend? Her voice was husky, her eyes hungry. Elminster made a helpless little sound of knee deep in his throat and dipped his hand to his sleeve, whose cuff was stuffed with gold pieces. One or two, he managed, in a voice that was not quite steady. Her eyes danced. One or two, my lord? I'm sure I heard ye say three or four. Aye, four gold, one for each of the delights I'll give thee. She licked his hand the lightest of velvet touches in his palm. Elminster trembled. Then he was shoved rudely aside. Whirling, he found himself looking into the cold grin of a burly bodyguard in livery. The man held up spiked gauntlets in warning, and El saw another bodyguard beyond him. Between them, in his own little ring of light provided by a small oil lamp held above him on a curving pole by a weary servant, stood a short, pouty-looking man in flame-orange silks. His reddish hair fell in well-oiled ringlets to stain the silken shoulders of his open-fronted shirt. On his hairless chest was a lump of gold as large as a man's fist, a lion's head frozen in an endless, silent snarl as it hung on a heavy gold chain. Rings of many gems and metals glittered and flashed on his fingers, two and three baubles to each digit. El noted with disgust, and all of it real. He exchanged glances with Farl over Buddha Ira's shocked face, and then the man thrust his codpiece adorned with an openwork ivory and gold sheath that made it look like the figurehead of a very decadent Kalashite pleasure barge right into Shandaith's face. Too busy, my little lass, he drawled and snapped his fingers. The servant with the lamp put a purse in them and the man lazily spilled a dozen or so gold pieces down the front of Shandaith's gown. Or have you time enough for a real man with real gold to spend? How many years does my lord want to spend with me? Shandaith breathed in reply, lifting her hands in welcome. The man grinned tightly and gestured to his bodyguards. They reached out brutal spiked hands to clear the corner, ignoring the sudden shrill protests of the other ladies. 
One laid hold of Buddha Ira's ankle and hauled her off feral to a hard landing on the floor. She squealed in pain, and anger rode high in Farrell's face as he rose from the bench. Just who in Hastar do you think you are? He addressed the perfumed man. The bodyguard reached a menacing hand toward him, and Farrell snapped his own fingers like the man's master had done, and as if by a spell a dagger gleamed in them. He waved it warningly at the bodyguard's eyes, and the man hesitated. Jezebel is my name, came arrogant tones that obviously expected the name to awe everyone within hearing. Jezebel Othar, Farrell shrugged. Heard of any testers of cheap scent by that name, Al? he asked. Elminster waved a dagger of his own under the nose of the bodyguard who'd shoved him and slipped out from under the man's gauntleted hands. No, he said calmly, but one rat looks quite the same as another. That did bring little gasps and indrawn hisses of breath from around, and a little silence fell. The dandy's face turned dark with anger and his fingers tightened in Shandaith's hair as she knelt in front of him. Then a sick, lopsided, sneering smile slid onto Jezebel's face, and Elminster felt a little chill inside. This man meant their deaths, here and now. The bodyguards drifted nearer. This sounds like the sort of insult that a man of honor, the loud new voice that had broken in from behind them, dropped little quotes around that last word, and Jezebel paled in recognition and fresh anger. Can answer only with a formal duel, not a distressing brawl that will cost him at least two bodyguards. Jezebel and his men spun around to find another dandy, as well-garbed as the first, eyeing them with dancing amusement in his eyes. He too wore silks with crawling dragons embroidered on his puffed sleeves. A flagon was in his hand and to either side of him stood men in matching livery, slim swords in their hands. The needle-like blades were aimed at the crotches of Jezebel's bodyguards. A hush spread across the dark taproom, and men craned their necks to watch. Fair even, Jezebel, the newcomer said calmly, rubbing at the thin beginnings of a mustache with the lip of his flagon. Larissa spurn you again? Deladra insufficiently impressed with your... A uh, rampant glory? Jezebel snarled. Get gone, Thalorn. You can't strut in the safety of your sire's shadow forever. His shadow stretches longer than your father's, Jans. My men and I stopped for a drink, but the appalling stench drew us to this corner to see what had died. You really must stop wearing that stuff, Jans. Some chambermaid's likely to empty a piss pot out a window to try and wash your stink away. Your yapping tongue carries you ever closer to a waiting grave, Selimban, Jezebel spat. Now be gone, or I'll have one of my men spoil that pretty face of yours with a few shards of glass. I love thee too, Jezebel. Which of your men is it to be? My six would dearly love to know. From behind him, another pair of men in livery glided forward blades raised and glittering in the little dangling lamp that a trembling servant still held aloft on its pole. I'll not fight a duel with all these blades of yours around, Jezebel said, drawing himself up. I know your liking for convenient accidents. While you grandly slash at someone with that blade you've dipped in sleep venom, aren't you tired of such deceits, Jans? Doesn't using them remind you every even that you're a worm? Or is it so much part of your lovely nature that you don't even notice? Shut your lying mouth, Jezebel snarled. Or, or you'll get away with your little trick, yes? And stab all these lads and lasses around to work off your little rage, no doubt? And what would you be doing with them once they were asleep? Robbing them, of course. You have such expensive habits, Jans. But perhaps a little idle butchering... Or worse, I've noticed the ladies raising their rates down your street, Jans. Jansabel snarled wordlessly and charged forward. There was a flash of light and a spray of scattering sparks as the blades of the two nearest bodyguards met some invisible shield of magic around the charging dandy. And then Jansabel came to a sudden halt as Thalorn Selimban, moving without apparent haste, drew a blade and pointed it at Jansabel's nose. 
Tiny white lightnings spiraled along the steel as its own enchantment cut through Jansabel's shield. Around the two nobles, their bodyguards surged forward, blades out and up. Hold, men of Othar and Selamban, in the name of the king, came a sudden deep bellow from behind them all, in the direction of the bar. The livened men halted as their masters stiffened, and the crowd around parted as if before a drawn sword. A man with a short-trimmed graying beard came into view, a tankard in his hand. Swordmaster Aderbron, he identified himself flatly. I'll report any deaths or bloodletting here to the mage lords when I see them this night, and I'll also let them know if either of you disobey me, my lords. Now order your men out of this place and back to your homes, now. He stood hard-eyed, and the two dandies saw men drift up to stand at his back. Off-duty armsmen, to be sure, faces not quite masking their glee. If the dandies defied the swordmaster, the soldiers would do their level best to accidentally slay or maim them both, and none of their bodyguards would leave the tavern alive. My men have had enough to drink anyway, Thalorn said easily, but a vein was working near his jaw. He did not look in Othar's direction as he said almost gently to the men around him, You may go. I shall follow after I drink to the health of this excellent and dedicated officer, whose word I utterly support for the honor of Athalantar. For the honor of Athalantar, half a hundred men muttered in reply, waving their flagons and tankards half-heartedly. Unimpressed, the swordmaster watched the men go. Then, ignoring Thalorn Selimban's smile, he shot a cold look at Jansabel Othar and said, My lord... Sullenly, without a reply, Jansabel waved a hand at his men. Then he turned back to the shadow, who still knelt fearfully in the alcove, and said coldly, My lords, I was occupied before Selimban took it upon himself to interrupt. If you'll excuse me through there, Elminster murmured, pointing, is rather more private. I'm sure the folk who were sitting here before thy enthusiastic men shoved them aside— would like to resume what they were doing before thy interruption too, my lord. The dandy snarled at him, promised death again in his eyes, but the swordmaster said firmly, Take the young man's advice, Othar. He but tries to rescue your family name, and remind you of a few simple basics of courtesy. Othar did not look around, but his shoulders stiffened, and he turned without a word, fingers firmly wound in Shandath's hair, so that she gave a little shriek, and then hurried along on her knees to avoid being dragged. Elminster took a step forward, but the noble had already halted to fling the curtain wide. A light in here, he ordered curtly. The young alcove lass unhooded a slow wick lamp and blew it into brightness before slipping hurriedly away. The curtained pleasure alcove normally cost six gold falcons, but before the fury of the noble and the watchful gaze of the swordmaster, the young girl did not tarry to try for the price, and the bodyguards who stood to defend her and her demand kept to the walls and held their silence. Jansabel Othar surveyed the cushioned, draperied bed that almost filled the niche, nodded in satisfaction, and curtly waved Shandath to the bed. The curtains fell into place behind them with an angry switch. Farl reached up the wall with a slow, stealthy hand and dimmed the lamp there by pinching down its wick. He caught the eyes of a lady across the benches, and she did the same, dimming that side of the tap room into darkness. The swordmaster turned away, keeping Thalon Selimban carefully at his side. They went back to the bar together. Farl and El exchanged glances. Farl sketched the swell of an imaginary bosom with one hand, pointed at the curtain, and then jerked his thumb at himself. L blinked slowly once, and then pointed toward the jakes and touched his own chest. Farrell nodded, and L set out across the room to where he could relieve himself. If there was going to be creeping about or fighting, he'd best be more at ease. Had it been like this before the mage lords came to Hastarl? 
shouldering and slipping his way through drunken revelers into the dimly lit privy area. L wondered what the wench had been like when his grandfather sat on the stag throne. Were all men of power as cruel as the two nobles who'd almost begun a battle here? And just how were they more honorable or more villainous than Farl and Aladar the Dark, two young and impudent rooftop thieves? Just who stands better in the eyes of the gods, a mage lord, a dandified noble, or a thief? What's the choice between the lot of them? The first two have more influence to do ill, and the thief is at least honest or open about what he does. Hmm, perhaps these would not be safe questions to ask a priest or sage in Hastarl. The foul-smelling trough in front of him had no ready answers either, and he'd best get back out there before Farl did something reckless. If they were going to have all the armsmen in the city out looking for them, he wanted to know about it. When he returned along the far wall, Farl was sitting beside the curtain. He caught L's eye and then slipped smoothly behind it, keeping low. L took his seat, noted that the couple beside him were well beyond noticing what anyone else was doing, and followed. The two friends lay still, side by side and unseen on the dark carpeted floor, as the gasps in the dimly lit alcove grew louder and more urgent. Farl crawled slowly forward as the amorous sounds built to a height and reached up silently to lift the glass of wine, complimentary with higher of the alcove, its surface thick with settled dust, from its usual spot. Deftly, he tossed its contents over the lamp wick. The alcove was plunged into sudden, hissing darkness. Elminster rose from the carpet like a vengeful, striking snake and plunged one hand over the dandy's mouth from behind, reaching to stifle the man into slumber with the other. Farl's hands were already over the shadow's mouth. She jerked and burbled under him, fighting for breath enough to scream, but her eyes widened when she recognized the man atop her, and she stopped struggling. Elminster saw one of her slim hands cease its clawing, and reach up to stroke Farl's shoulder. Then he had no time left to spare for looking at anyone except the noble under him. Jansabel was oiled and perfumed, slippery under Elminster's hands. He'd never known the hard hours and harsh battle that the youth from Heldon had felt, but he was shorter and heavier, and fury lent him strength. He threw himself sideways, dragging Elminster with him, and tried to bite the fingers that were smothering him. Elminster drew back one arm, dagger-hilt foremost, and slugged the noble hard on the jaw. Jansabel's head snapped around, spittle and blood flying together. The dandy gave a little grunt, shook his head, and toppled over sideways on the bed, knocked senseless. One open eye stared up unseeing at Elminster. Satisfied, El spun to look behind them and be sure no one had noticed the sudden dousing of the light behind the curtain or heard the brief, unloving sounds. The hubbub of folk drinking continued unabated, and sudden soft sounds from beside him proclaimed that Farl was taking full advantage of the noble's generous payment to Shandaith. The gold coins lay on the floor around, freed when Othar had torn open her bodice. El ignored them to bend closer over the entwined couple, and delicately free a single distinctive earring from where the shadow's hair curled around her ear. Shandaith freed her lips from Farl's long enough to whisper a sharp, What? Elminster put a finger to his lips and murmured, To lure the other one. You'll see it again, I promise. Holding it cupped carefully in his hand, he slipped around the curtain again and made his way unhurriedly across the taproom. As he'd hoped, the Swordmaster and Thalon stood side by side at the bar. You'll appreciate, the officer was saying wearily, that sons of mage lords must set an example that makes the people feel they're close and among them, not aloof. Magic and those who wield it are feared enough if the kingdom is ever to be strong that— He broke off as Elminster glided up between them, displayed the earring and murmured, Cry pardon for the interruption, my lords, but I am sent on a mission of love. The lady Lord Othar was so anxious to make the acquaintance of confesses herself somewhat disappointed by his, uh, brief performance, and hopeful that another man of importance, such as yourself, my lord, 
would be made of rather sterner stuff. She bade me be sure to tell ye that she found thy tongue and bearing most impressive, and would know both better. Thalorn looked up at Elminster and grinned suddenly. The swordmaster shook his head, rolled his eyes, and turned away. The young noble's eyes went across the room to the curtain. Elminster nodded and strode toward it, Thalorn following through the way that the youth cleared. When they reached the curtain, El ducked a little look around it and held it a little aside. Thalorn peered in. A heap of clothing and bed draperies lay close by, beyond them, a single flickering stub of candle glimmered in the navel of the lady who lay bare to his sight on the bed. A silk half-mask hooded her face, and she was smiling through the swirl of long hair that lay across her mouth as she lounged with her arms clasped behind her head. "'Come in and be at ease,' she murmured. "'My lord?' Thalorn's smile widened, and he stepped forward. As the curtain fell into place behind them both, Elminster moved with the noble, raised his trusty dagger hilt, then clubbed down, leaping a little off the floor to put his strength behind the blow. Thalorn fell forward on the end of the bed like a chopped sapling. Farrell exploded from his concealment under heaped pillows to pull Shandaith's feet away before he crashed down atop them. Farrell and El grinned at each other, working swiftly. Rings that might carry spells they dared not take, and Shandaith was due her coins— they tossed them to her as she swiftly dressed and were rewarded with an enthusiastic kiss each. She was as beautiful as El had thought she'd be. Well, some other night, perhaps. They quickly stripped Selimban's clothes away, dragged the senseless Jansabel out from under the heap of draperies, and arranged the two naked lordlings in an embrace on the bed for others to find. Supporting the shadow between them as if she were faint, arms around her shoulders, they helped her out through the taproom, to the alley door by the jakes. A hopeful slug and snatcher glided out from a dark angle of walls, saw Farrell's warning gaze and Al's dagger gleaming ready, and drew back again. Without a word, the trio turned north toward old Hannibur's. The grizzled old baker lived alone over his shop. His weathered face, wooden foot, acerbic tongue, and natural stinginess made him unattractive to the ladies of Hastarl, most days he tossed drying, unbought bread ends and sometimes even whole loaves out his back door to the hopeful and hungry urchins who played there. Tonight his snores rumbled faintly out into the alley through the closed shutters of his bedchambers. Where are we going, my lords? Shandaith was still amused at the jest and grateful for the extra gold, but her voice held a note of alarm. She'd heard some things about her two young escorts. We must hide you before those beasts awaken and send their bodyguards out to collect what you neglected to give them. And your hide along with it, Farrell said in her ear, embracing her. Aye, but where? the shadow asked, putting her arms around him. Farrell pointed up at the window from which the snoring was coming. Shandaith stared at him. Are you crazed? she hissed in sudden anger. If you think I'm good. Farrell's hands glided to just the right places as he pressed his lips to hers. She struggled angrily for a moment, managing to utter some angry-sounding murmurs, and then went limp. Farrell promptly passed her to Elminster. Here, he said brightly. He turned away and hastily erected a pyramid of crates from the baker's litter of shipping refuse. Elminster stared at him and then down at the girl in his arms. She was soft and beautiful, if heavy, and was stirring already. In a breath or two, she'd return to her senses, and if Al knew anything about the shadow, she'd be very angry. He looked around gingerly for a place to put her. "'Tis Hannibur's lucky night,' Farrell said with a smile, as he swarmed back down the swiftly erected pyramid. Above, the shutters now hung open, and the snores roared out unmuted down the alley. He pointed at Elminster and at Shandaith, and then up at the window again. To be sure, El murmured in reply, mounting the crates with the limp shadow heavy on his back. Her delicate scent played at his nostrils, and he added under his breath, Luckier than me, I'll warrant. Then he was climbing carefully through the window, Farrell steadying Shandaith's limbs to prevent a fall or noise. She stirred as they crossed the bare board floor to Hannibur's bed. 
they drew back the patched woolen covers and laid her carefully beside the sleeping baker. Then they both turned away to stifle rising mirth. The old man wore a daringly cut frilly wanton wench's robe. Hairy vein-mottled flesh and bony knees protruded from the sheer silk. L bit his lip and staggered to the window, shoulder shaking silently. Farrell mastered himself sooner and delicately drew aside two sets of garments. Their owners stirred. Softly, he stroked two bodies and raced on cat-like feet for the window. L was already halfway down the crates outside. The two thieves giggled at each other as they hauled out the bottom crates. Everything above tumbled and fell, creating a din that ought to cut through even Hannibal's snores, and they raced away around a corner. Pausing for breath in a courtyard half hastarl away, Farrell said, Whew, a good evening's work. Pity I hadn't time to empty my tankard before that hippopotamus ass pushed his way in on you. Elminster grinned and handed him Shandaith's earring. Farrell smiled down at it. Well, at least we got some pay for all our thoughtful work. L's own grin widened as he dropped three heavy links of gold chain into Farrell's other hand. Twisted it open and shortened the thing by a few links, he said innocently. He was wearing his lion too low for the full effect anyway. Farrell burst into delightful laughter, and they clung together chuckling until Farrell caught sight of a nearby signboard. Let's go hoist a tankard, he puffed. What? Elminster's blue-gray eyes danced dangerously. Again? Three times, Saloon had risen over the high towers of Athelgard since that night, and talk of the two young and very friendly sons of mage lords was all over the city. The bodyguards of both were prowling through every tavern and bean-pot dining room in the poorer parts of Hestarl, obviously looking for a certain hawk-nosed, black-haired youth and his clever-tongued friend. So Eladar and Farl had judged it prudent to take a brief vacation until the searchers grew careless enough for accidents to happen to them, or until some street thief too desperate to be wise tried to rob one of them, and their search was diverted to new targets. Lying exposed to the gaze and bows of bored guards on the battlements of Athelgard made both the friends uneasy, so they had taken to chatting, relaxing, and plotting in the seclusion of the old walled burial ground at the other end of the city, an overgrown, disused place where the cracked and leaning stone vaults of wealthy families crumbled into rubble amid stunted trees that burst up through them and spread concealing branches in all directions. Proud names and thieves successful enough to buy wealth and station all came here in the end, all their boasts and plots and gold coins bought them no more than crumbling gravestones, inscribed with lies about their greatness and good character. Scant comfort, L thought, to the moldering bones beneath. In the tranquil shade of the tomb trees, the two friends lay atop the sloping roof of Ansildabar's last rest, knowing but not caring that the bones of the once famous explorer lay gnawed and exposed in the pillaged tomb beneath, and passed a wineskin back and forth as they watched the shadows cast by the lowering sun creep across leaning tombs and collapsed mausoleums, heralding dusk. I've been thinking, Farrell said suddenly, holding out his hand for the skin. Usually a bad sign, Elminster agreed affably, handing it over. Ha ha! Farrell replied. Between wild orgies, I mean. Ah, I'd been wondering what those momentary pauses were, Elminster said, extending his hand for the skin. Farrell, who hadn't yet drunk, gave him a hurt look and a stay gesture, and then drank deeply. Sighing with satisfaction, he wiped his mouth and held it out. Do you recall how much Buddha era was asking me for pleasure together? Elminster grinned. Aye. A low price, just for thee. Farrell nodded. Exactly. Gold pieces hand over fist these maids make. T'would be easy, I'm thinking, to find out where some of them hide their loot, and help ourselves while they were sleeping, or out busy at the taverns and rich merchants' clubs. Nay, El said firmly. Count me out of such plots. Fleece such sheep and ye'll do it alone. Farrell looked at him. Right. Consider the plot abandoned. Now tell me why. 
Elminster set his jaw. I'll not steal from those who barely have enough coins for food, let alone taxes or saving. Principles? Farrell rescued the nearly empty wineskin. I've always had them. Ye know that. El waved away the skin, and Farrell happily drained it. I thought ye wanted to slay all the wizards in Athalantar. Elminster nodded. All mage lords. Aye, I've sworn that oath. And slow, iron careful, I've set about fulfilling it, he replied, staring out over the river where a pole barge had just come into view in the distance, heading downstream toward the docks. Yet sometimes I wonder what else I should do, what more life should be. Roast boar feasts every night, Farrell said. So much coin to buy them that I'll never have to feel the bite of a knife or hide in rotting dun while armsmen poke into it with their halberds. Nothing more? Al asked. Nothing higher? What's the point? Farrell asked with a touch of scorn. There are priests enough all over Faroon to worry about things like that, and my empty stomach never tires of telling me what I should be tending to. Satisfied that the very last drop of wine had fallen into his mouth, he lowered the skin, rolled it, and thrust it through his belt. Then he looked across at his friend. Eladar the Dark was frowning at him. What gods should I worship? Farl shrugged, taken aback, and spread his hands. A man must find that out for himself. Or should. Only fools obey the nearest priest. Amusement came into the blue-gray eyes locked on his. What do priests do, then? Farl shrugged. A lot of chanting and angry shouting and sticking swords into people who worship other gods. In the same quiet, serious voice, Al asked, What use are faiths, then? Farl shrugged wildly, adopting a crazed who-can-know expression, but El's serious eyes stayed on him, and after a silence, Farl said slowly, Folk always have to believe there's something better somewhere than what they have right now, and that they just might get it, and they like to belong, to be part of a group, and feel superior to outlanders. It's why folk join clubs and companies and fellowships. Eladar looked at him. And go out and stick swords in each other in dark alleys, and then feel superior about it? Farl grinned. Exactly. He watched the pole barge scrape to a stop against a distant dock and said casually, If we're going to be facing death together many nights longer, It'd probably be a good thing if I knew this code of yours. I know you prefer shop guarding, dock work, and errand and package running to thieving, but who wouldn't? Crazed wits out looking for thrills, El said dryly. Farrell laughed. Leave me out of it for a breath or two and tell. Elminster thought for a moment. I won't slay innocent folk, and I don't like stealing from anyone except rich merchants who are grasping, unpleasant, or openly dishonest. Oh, and wizards, of course. You really hate them, don't you? Elminster shrugged. I... I've contempt for those who hide behind magic and lord it over the rest of us because someone taught them to read, or the gods gave them the power to wield magic or something. They should be using the art to help us all not keep folk down and lord it over them. If you were Belor right now, Farl said softly, what in the name of the gods could you do but obey the wizards? El shrugged. The king may be trapped, and he may not be. He never shows himself for us unwashed to get to know him. You know, the subjects he's supposed to be serving? So how can I tell? You said your parents were killed by a dragon-riding wizard, Farl said. Elminster looked at him sharply. Did I? You were drunk. I, not long after we met, I had to know if I could trust you, so I got you drunk. That night at the Ring of Blades, you wouldn't say anything except outlaw and kill mage lords. You kept repeating that. Elminster stared steadily at the shattered crown of a nearby vault. Every man needs an obsession, he said. He turned his head. What's thine? Farrell shrugged his shoulders. Excitement. If I'm not in danger or doing high hidden and important deeds, I'm not alive. Elminster nodded, remembering. It had been a cold, blustery day, 
muddy slush ankle-deep in the streets of Hestarl. Newly arrived and wandering wide-eyed, El turned down a blind alley only to find, when he spun about, that he was facing a line of hard-eyed grinning men blocking his way. A balding burly giant in worn leathers stood at their head, a padded stick in one hand and a canvas sack big enough to enclose Elminster's head, for that was its purpose in the other. They stalked down the alley toward him. El backed away, fingering the lion's sword and wondering if he could fight so many hardened men in such a confined space and hope to win. He took a stand in a corner, blade out, but they didn't slow their steady, menacing advance. The bald man raised his stick, obviously planning to strike aside the lad's sword while the others wrestled him down. But before he could, a calm voice broke in from overhead. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Shildo. He's Hawkland's meat already, marked and in use. See how bedazzled he is? And you know what Hawkland does to blades who meddle. The bald man looked up, face ugly. And who's going to say we did it? The slim youth crouching on the windowsill, hand crossbow sliding gently back and forth to menace one bravo after another, smiled and said, That's already been done, bald pate. Two breaths ago, Ann Terrell flew off to report. He left me to dissuade you because he recalls an old debt he owes you and what happened the last time a snatch band took the wrong man. Wasn't pleasant, was it, Shildo? Recall what Undarl said he'd do to you if you made another unfortunate mistake? I remember. Snarling, the bald man spun around and stalked off, breaking the line of bravos and waving at them to accompany him. When the alley was empty, Elminster looked up and said, Thank ye for a rescue. My life is thine, sir. Farl's the name, and no sir am I. I'm proud of that mind. Farl explained that meat was the name given to bumpkins, slaves, and other unfortunates used by mage lords for experiments that slew, twisted, transformed, or left them mind slaves. The wandering, obviously bewildered Elminster had looked like a prime snatch candidate, or a mind slave already in thrall. That's what I persuaded him you were, he said warningly. Thank ye, I think, El replied wryly. Why did that make a difference? I intimated you were the property of the most powerful mage lord. Shildo serves a rival whose power isn't great enough for open challenges yet. Shildo's under very strict orders not to provoke anything just now. He shifted on the snowy ledge and added, Want to put away that blade? We could go somewhere warmer I know of where they'll overcharge us for some hot turtle soup and burnt toast, if you'll pay. Gladly. Elminster said. If you'll tell me where I can find a bed in this city, and tell me what not to do, I'll do that, the laughing youth replied, jumping lightly down. You need to learn, and I like to talk. Better, you look like you need a friend, and I find myself in short supply of them right now, too, hey? Lead on, Elminster said. He'd learned much that day, and in the days since then but not where Farl had come from. The merry thief seemed part of Hestarl, as if he'd always been there, and the city echoed his moods and manner. The two had taken a liking to each other and stolen more than their own weights in gold and gems through a slow spring and much of a long hot summer. Musing about this damp city and the mage lords around him, Elminster found himself back on the sloping stone of the tomb roof, in the ebbing heat of a long, lazy summer day, he turned to look into his friend's face. More than once ye've said ye knew I came from Heldon. Farl nodded. The way you speak, up country for sure, and east. More, the winter when Undarl joined the mage lords. Talk went around the city that he'd impressed the others into accepting him in by riding a dragon he could command. At Lord Hawkland's bidding, he went to the village of Heldon to slay a man and wife there, and to show them what he could do. He had it tear the place stone from stone and burn all, even dogs running away across the fields. Undarl, Elminster repeated softly. Farl saw that his friend's hands were clenched, white and trembling. He nodded. If it makes you feel better, El, 
I understand how you feel. The eyes that Elminster turned on him blazed like a fire of blue steel, but his voice came with terrible softness as he asked, Oh, how? The mage lords killed my mother, Farrell said calmly. Elminster looked at him, the fire dying. What befell thy father then? Farrell shrugged. Oh, he's very well indeed. Elminster looked a silent question, and Farrell smiled a little sadly. In fact, he's probably up in that tower there right now. And if Tyche frowns on us, he'll have magic up that enables him to hear us when I use his name. Elminster looked up at the tower and said, Could he strike us with a spell from there? Farrell shrugged. Who knows what wizards have learned to do? But I doubt it, or certain men'd be falling on their faces all over Hestarl. Besides, the mage lords I know could never resist taunting their foes before smiting them down face to face. Then use his name, Elminster said deliberately, and mayhap he'll come down where I can reach him. After I do, Farrell replied softly, after I'm done tearing his tongue out by the roots and breaking all his fingers to stop his spells, then I'll let you have some fun. He shouldn't die in any great haste. So who is he? Farrell lifted one side of his mouth in a mirthless smile. Lord Hawkland, Master Mage Lord, Mage Royal of Athelantar to you. He turned his head to watch a fleet wing whirl from one broken pillar to another. I was illegitimate. Hawkland had my mother, a lady of the court, loved by many, they say, killed when he learned of my birth. Why do ye still live outside yon tower? Farrell stared into the past, not seeing the tombs ahead of him. His men slaughtered a baby, but the wrong one, some other poor brat. I was stolen by a woman my mother had befriended, a lady of the evening. Elminster raised his eyebrows. Yet ye proposed stealing from those same night maids. Farrell shrugged. One of them strangled my foster mother for a few coins. I've never found out who, but almost certainly one of the girls in the wench on. His voice mockingly assumed the pedantic tones of a sage relating a tale of awesome importance. The night when two mage lords' sons revealed their love to all Hastarl. Oh, gods, Elminster said quietly. And I felt sorry for meself a time or two. Farl, ye can tell you to belt up and not say whatever tearful mush you were about to spout, Farrell said serenely. When the feebleness brought on by my advancing dotage requires sympathy from thee, Eladar mage-killer, I shall not keep thee unapprised of the fact. His grandiose tones brought forth a chuckle from Elminster, who asked, What's it to be now, then? Farrell grinned, and in one smooth movement rolled on to his feet. Rest time's over, back to the wars, so you won't let me take advantage of ladies of the evening or innocent folk. Well, that's not a hard bind. There can't be more than two or three of the latter in all Hestarl, and we've hit the wizards and the high and mighty families over much. If we roost too often on the same perch, tis traps we'll find waiting, not piles of coins ready for the taking. This leaves us with two targets. Temples, nay, Elminster said firmly. No meddling with the affairs of gods. I'd rather not spend the rest of a short and unhappy life with most of those who hear all furious with me, to say nothing of their priesthoods. Farl grinned. I expected that. Well, then, there's but one field we've not touched. Rich merchants. He held up a hand to forestall Elminster's coming protest about plundering hard-working shopkeepers and said quickly, I mean those who lend coins and invest in back rooms and behind secure doors, working secretly in groups to keep prices high and arrange accidents for competitors. Ever notice how few companies own the barges that actually land here? And the warehouses, hmm? We've got to learn how these folks operate, because if we're ever to retire from plucking things out of the pockets of lesser folk, and no one's fingers stay nimble forever, you know, we'll have to join the folk who sit idle and let their coins work for them. Elminster was frowning thoughtfully. A hidden world, 
masked by what most see in the streets. Just as our world, the realm of thieves, is hidden, Farl added. Right, El said with enthusiasm. That's our battlefield, then. What now? How to begin? This night, Farl said, by handsomely bribing a man who owes me an old favor, I planned to attend a dinner I'd never be allowed into. He'd be serving wine there, but I'll be doing it in his place and listening to what I should not hear. If I'm right, I'll hear plans and agreements for quite a bit of quiet trade into and out of the city for the rest of the season. He frowned. There's one problem. You can't come. There's no way you can get close enough to hear anything without being caught. These folk have guards everywhere. I've no excuse for getting you into the place either. Elminster nodded. So I go elsewhere. An evening of idleness. Or have ye any suggestions? Farrell nodded slowly. Aye, but there's great danger. There's a certain house I've had my eye on for four summers now, "'Tis home to three free-spending merchants "'who deal in exchanging goods and lending coins, "'but never seem to lift a finger to do any real work. "'They're probably part of this chain of investors. "'Can you skulk about the place without being seen? "'We need to know where the doors and approaches "'and important rooms and the like are. "'And if you can overhear anything interesting while they dine—' "'El nodded. "'Lead me to the place.' just so long as ye don't expect any great tales when we meet on the morrow. I think it's only in minstrels' tales that folk sit around explaining things they already know for eavesdroppers to understand. Farrell nodded. Just slip in, see where things are, try to find out if there's anything of import befalling, and get you gone again as quietly as the thing can be done. I want no dead heroes in this partnership. It's too hard to find trustworthy partners." Ye prefer live cowards, eh? Elminster asked as they dropped lightly down from the roof of the tomb and set off through the rubble and tangled plants toward the bow they'd come in by. Farrell stopped him. Seriously, El, I've never found such fearlessness and honesty in anyone. To find it in one who has also endurance and dexterity, I've only one regret. Which is? Elminster was blushing furiously. You're not a pretty lass. Elminster replied with a rude noise, and they both chuckled and clambered up the tree that would afford them exit. I see only one worry ahead, Farl added. Hastarl grows rich under the wizards, and thieves are coming in. Gangs, as they grow larger, you and I will have to join or start one of our own to survive. Besides, we'll need more hands than these four if we're to tackle these backroom investors. And thy worry? Betrayal. That word hung in somber silence between them as they leaped down from the crumbling wall into a garbage-choked alley and watched the rats run. Elminster said softly, I've found something precious in thee too, Farl. A friend prettier than yourself? A friend I. Loyalty and trust too. More precious by far than all the gold we've taken together. Pretty speech. I've remembered another regret too. Farrell added gravely. I couldn't be there in the room to see Shandaith and old Hannibar waking up and seeing each other. They convulsed in shared laughter. I have noted, Elminster added a few helpless breaths later as they went on down the street, word of that meeting has not spread across Hastarl. A pity indeed, Farrell replied. They threw their arms around each other's shoulders and strode down the slippery cobbles the conquest of all Hestarl bright ahead of them. 5. To Chain a Mage To chain a mage? Why, the promise of power and knowing secrets, magic, if you will, greed and love, the things that chain all men, and some of the more foolish women, too. A Theiol of Evermeet Musings of a Witch Queen in Exile Year of the Black Flame The smell wafting up through the high windows was wonderful. In spite of himself, Elminster's stomach growled. He clung to the stone sill, frozen in an awkward head-down pose, and hoped no one would hear. The feast below was a merry one, 
Glass tinkled and men laughed, short barks of merriment punctuating the general murmur of jests and earnest talk. He was still too distant to hear what was being said. L finished the knot and tugged on it, firm. I then, into the hands of the gods. He waited for a burst of laughter and, when it came, slid down the thin cord to the balcony below. For the entire journey he was clearly visible to anyone at the board below who bothered to look up. He was sweating hard as his boots touched the balcony floor, and he could sink thankfully down into a sitting position behind the parapet, completely concealed from those at table. No outcry came. After a moment, he relaxed enough to peer carefully around. The balcony was dark and disused. He tried not to stir up dust that might force a sneeze or leave betraying marks behind. Elminster then bent his attention to the chatter below, and within a few words was sitting frozen in fear and rising excitement. His hand went unbidden to his breast where the lion sword was hidden. I've heard some sly whispers, Havelin, that you doubt our powers, a cold and proud voice said, words falling into a sudden tense silence, that we are meant to scare the common folk into obedience to the stag throne and are not real wizards daring to set foot outside our realm, that our spells may be showy but would avail little against thieves and the nightwork of competitors, leaving our shared investments unprotected. I've said no such thing. Perhaps not, but your tone now tells me that you believe it. Nay, put your blade away. I intend no harm to you this night. T'would be churlish to strike down a man in his own house, and the act of a fool to destroy a good ally and wealthy supporter. All I'd like you to do is watch a little demonstration. What sort of magic do you plan to spin, Hawklin? Havlin's tone was wary. I warn you that some here are not as protected by amulets and shields as I am, and have less reason to love you than I do. It would not be wise to make a man reach for a weapon at this table. I have no great violence in mind. I merely wish to reveal the efficacy of my magic by casting for you a spell I've recently perfected, which can compel any mortal whose name and likeness I know into my presence. Any mortal? Any living mortal. Yet before you name some old foe you'd like to get your hands on, I wish to show you the true power of the magic we wield here at Hastarl, the magic you've belittled as mere tricks and flame balls to cow the common folk. There was a strange high ringing and clanking sound. Behold this chain, came the cold voice of Neldrin Hawkland, mage royal of Athalantar. Set it down and withdraw. My thanks. There was a glassy shifting sound, and then the receding tread of soft and hasty feet. The clink of moving glass came again, and reflections of flame suddenly danced on the wall above Elminster. He peered at them narrowly, and saw that a transparent chain was rising by itself from the floor, rising and coiling upward to hang in the air and turn slowly in a great spiral. The cold voice of Hawkland spoke again. This is the crystal chain of binding, wrought in netheral long ages ago. Elves, dwarves, and men all searched for it and failed and thought it lost forever. I found it. Behold the chain that can imprison any mage and prevent his use of any magic. Beautiful, is it not? There were murmurs of response, and then the mightiest of the mage lords continued. Who is the mightiest mage in all Faroon, Havilan? You want me to say you, I suppose. In truth, I know not. You're the expert in matters magical, not me. This mad mage we hear about, I guess. Nay, think greater than that. Recall you nothing of the teachings of Mistra? Her? You plan to chain a goddess? Nay, a mortal, I said, and it's a mortal I have in mind. Stop all this grand questioning and tell us, a sour voice said. There's a time for cleverness and a time for plain talk and I think we fast reached the latter. 
Do you doubt my power? Nay, mage lord, I believe you have magic to spare. I told you to stop lording it over us with arrogant word games and behave more like a great mage and less like a boy trying to impress with his brilliance. These words ended in a sudden cry of disgust, and a murmur followed. Elminster risked a quick glance above the parapet to peer down, and as quickly ducked back below it again. He'd seen a man sitting at the table gaping in horror at his plate, and on it had been a human head staring unseeing at him. Behold, the head of the last man who tried to steal from your warehouse, beheaded by a spell plague I conjured. There, tis gone now, by all means enjoy the rest of your dinner, Nalith. It was only an illusion. I think you should tell us plainly too, Hawklin, said another older voice. Enough games. Well enough, the Mage Royal replied. Watch then, and keep silent. There was a brief muttering, a flash of light, and a high-pitched sound like the jangle of clashing crystal or tiny ankle bells. Tell everyone who you are. There was cold triumph in Hawkland's voice. I am called the Magister, came a new voice, calm but quavering with age. There were gasps from around the table, and Elminster could not restrain himself. This was the wizard who wore the mantle of Mistress Power, the greatest mage of all. He had to see. Slowly and cautiously he raised his head to peer over the parapet and froze, chilled by a sudden thought. If the mage lords controlled the most powerful magic in all Faroon, how could he ever hope to defeat them? Below stretched the long, gleaming feast table. All the men seated around it were staring at a thin, bearded, and robed man who stood upright in an area of radiance a little way down the hall. The hitherto empty spiral of chain was now revolving slowly around him. Little lightnings leaped and played among its coils as it turned, fed by the radiance around the magister. Do you know where you are? the mage royal asked coldly. This room I know not. Some grand house, surely, in Hastarl, in the realm of the stag. And what is it that binds you? Mage Lord Hawklin leaned forward as he spoke those eager words. Lamplight caught gem-adorned ward runes on his dark robes, and they flashed as he moved, drawing eyes to him. He looked lean and dangerous as he spread long-fingered hands before him on the table and half rose to challenge the wizard in the grip of the chain. The magister looked at the chain with mild curiosity rather like a man surveying sale goods after idly entering a shop with an unspectacular facade. He reached out to touch it, ignoring the sudden lightnings that spat and crackled, blinding white around his wrinkled hand, tapped it thoughtfully and said, It appears to be the crystal chain of binding, forged long ago in Netheril and thought to be lost. Is it that or some new chain of thy devising. I shall ask the questions, Neldrin Hawkland commanded grandly, and you will give answer, or I'll use this crossbow and Faroon will have a new magister. As he spoke, a cocked and loaded crossbow floated into view from behind a curtained door. Startled looks sped between the merchants sitting around the table. Oh, the old man said mildly. Is this a challenge, then? Not unless you defy me. Consider it a threat hanging over you. Obey or perish. The same alternatives any king gives his subjects. You must live in rather more barbaric lands than I am used to, the magister said in a dry voice. Can it be, Neldrin Hawklin, you have reshaped Athalantar into a tyranny of mages? I have heard things of you and your fellow mage lords, and they were not good things. I don't doubt it, Hawklin sneered. Now hold your tongue till I bid you speak, or a new magister will speak in your stead. 
Do you then seek to control when and how the magister speaks? The old man's tone seemed almost sad. I do. The crossbow drifted nearer, rising menacingly to hang above the table aimed at the old man's face. Mistra forbids that, the magister said quietly. And so I have no choice left. I must answer your challenge. His body suddenly boiled into billowing vapors, faded, and was gone. The chains hung around emptiness for a moment, and then crashed to the floor. The crossbow jerked as it fired, but the quarrel sped through the emptiness, leaping across the room to strike a hanging shield and rebound. It cracked against the stone wall in a corner, fell, and flew no more. Let all that is hidden be revealed, Mage Royal Hawkland thundered, standing with his arms raised. Then he recoiled. The old man melted out of the air right in front of his face, sitting calmly on nothing in the air just above the table. Half a dozen spells lashed out as alarmed wizards saw a chance to slay. Amid the leaping magic, terrified merchants upset chairs in their haste to bolt from the table. Food sprayed into the air as ravening flame, bolts of lightning, and mist-shedding beams of coldness cut the air, meeting in hissing chaos where the old man had been. He was gone, instants before deadly magic struck, if he'd ever been there at all. Those who live by the slaying spell, the magister said mildly from the balcony, Elminster whirled and gaped in terror as the man in robes suddenly appeared beside him, must expect in the end to die by it. He raised his wrinkled hands. From each finger a ruby ray of light stabbed out across the room. Solid things they touched boiled silently away. El gulped as he saw legs standing with no body left above them, and beyond a sobbing wizard crashed to the floor as his frantically running feet were suddenly gone from under him. Amid the screams and crashes, the rays slowly faded, leaving only spreading flames behind, where they'd scorched wood or singed tapestries. The rays were still dying away as men all over the room started to rise into the air, whole or in remains, floating slowly straight up, regardless of their struggle or frantic spell castings. Glass tinkled and sang as the chain also rose into the air, gliding and coiling like a gigantic snake. From somewhere nearby, Hawkland snarled an incantation in a high, frightened voice. The old man ignored him. The rising men came to a smooth halt at the same height as the balcony, and the chain wove its way among them, gleaming in the light of the fires below. There was a flash and a roar. Elminster dived for his life as Hawkland's spell smashed half the balcony into a splintered ruin of paneling and shattered stone. Desperately, the young thief clawed his way along a stone floor that was crumbling and collapsing under and behind him. With a shudder and then a gathering roar, most of the tiles of the broken balcony floor slid down to the stones of the feasting hall amid a cloud of dust. The rubble piled up in a heap around a lone, leaning pillar that had supported that end of the balcony moments before. Sprawled on the surviving remnant of the balcony, Elminster turned in haste to see the magister unconcernedly standing on empty air, surrounded by a ring of helpless, floating, frightened men. Is that the best you can do, Hawklin? The old man shook his head. You had no business even thinking you could ever grow mighty enough to challenge me, with such feeble powers and dull wits driving them. He sighed. Elminster saw the crystal chain had wrapped itself around the neck of one floating man. The man's head was turned with slow, terrible, unseen force until he hung helplessly staring into the old man's eyes. So you are a mage, Lord Malif, of long service, I see, and you fancy yourself too cunning to appear openly ambitious, yet you desire to rule over all and wait any chance to smite down these others and take the throne for yourself. And you have plans. Your reign would not be gentle. The magister waved a hand in dismissal, 
and the crystal links around the wizard's neck burst apart in tinkling shards. Moloch's headless body jerked once, and then hung limp and dripping. The shortened chain glided on to the next man. Only a merchant, eh? Othel Nariman, a panderer, smuggler, and dealer in scents and beer. The quavering voice seemed almost hopeful, but when it came again, it was a low, bitter tone of disappointment. You arrange poisonings. The coil of the chain burst again, leaving another hanging body behind. Someone wailed in terror, almost drowning out the frantic mutterings of several spell castings. The magister ignored it all as he watched the chain wind its deadly way on through the air. One man, a fat merchant gasping and staring in horror, was spared. He floated gently down to the floor, fell when the magic released him, and then scrambled up whimpering and fled from the hall. The next man was another mage who spat defiance and went to his death raging. When he was headless, pulses of purple radiance flared around his body. The magister studied them. An interesting web of contingencies, don't you think, Hawklin? The mage royal spat a word that echoed and rolled around the hall, and there was a sudden burst of flame. Elminster shrank back into the corner and hid his face, feeling a sudden wash of heat. Then it was gone, and amid the creaking of cooling stone and the rush of tortured air, they heard the old man sigh. Fireballs! Always fireballs! Can't the young cast anything else? The magister stood unharmed on empty air, watching the chain. Much shortened now, its surface cracked and blackened from fire, moved to the next man. He proved to be dead already, of fright or self-spell or a stray glass shard, and the chain drifted on. Twice more it burst, and then another merchant was spared. He fled sobbing, leaving only the mage royal of Athalantar hanging alive before the magister. Hawklin looked right and left at the headless things in the air around him and snarled in fear. I must confess that killing you will bring me satisfaction, the old man said. Yet I'd be more pleased still if you renounced all claims to this realm here and now and agreed to serve Mistra under my direction. Hawklin cursed and with trembling hands he tried to shape one last spell. The magister listened politely and then shook his head, ignoring the shadowy taloned beast that appeared in the air before him. Its cruel claws passed right through the old man, and then faded away as the last link of the chain of binding burst. Blood spattered on the stone floor far below. Leaving the corpses hanging in grisly array, the magister turned to regard the youth crouched watching in the surviving corner of the balcony. There was a dangerous glint in his eyes as they met Elminster's awed gaze. Are you a mage lord, boy, or a servant of this house? Neither. Tearing his gaze free with an effort, Elminster leaped from the balcony, landing hard on the blood-spattered stones below. The old man's eyes narrowed and he lifted a finger. A wall of flames sprang up in a ring around the thief who spun around, the sharpened stub of an old war sword suddenly in his hand. Fear lent Elminster anger. His voice trembled with both as he faced the old man standing on air above him. Can ye not see I'm no wild spells wizard? Are ye no better than these cruel mages who rule Athalantar? He waved his blade at the roaring flames around him. Or are all who wield magic so twisted by its power that they become tyrants who delight in maiming, destroying, and spreading fear among honest folk? Are you not with these? the magister asked, spreading his hand to indicate the bodies hanging silently around him. With them? Elminster spat. I fight them whenever I dare and hope one day to destroy them all so men can walk Athalantar free and happy again. His face twisted at a sudden thought. I sound a bit like a high minstrel, don't I? He added, more quietly. The magister regarded him thoughtfully. 
That's not a bad way to think, he said quietly. If you survive the dangers of talking the same way. A sudden smile lit his face, and Elminster found himself smiling back. Unseen by them both down the hall, a pair of eyes appeared amid swirling points of light in the flames flickering around the canted wreckage of the collapsed feast table. They watched the boy and the floating mage and looked thoughtful. Can ye really see all that men are and think? Elminster asked, awkwardly blurting out the question. No, the magister replied simply. His old brown eyes looked down into unflinching blue-gray ones as he made the crackling wall of flames die away to nothing. Elminster looked once to see what had befallen, but made no move to flee. Standing on the rubble-strewn, blood-spattered floor, he looked back up at the old wizard. Are you going to blast me or let me go? I have no interest in destroying honest folk and very little at all in the affairs of those who have no magic. I see you have mage sight, lad. Why don't you try your hand at sorcery? Elminster gave him a dark look. His voice was scornful as he said, I've no interest in such things or in becoming the sort of man who wields magic. Whenever I look upon mages, I see snakes who use their spells to make folk fear them like a whip to drive others to obey, hard, arrogant men who can take a life or... He raised hard eyes to look at the destruction all around. The eyes watching from the flames shrank down to avoid notice. Destroy a hall in a few breaths and not care what they've done, so long as their whims are satisfied. Leave me out of the ranks of wizards, Lord. Then staring up at the old man's calm face, Elminster knew sudden fear. His words had been harsh, and the magister was a mage like any other. The mild old eyes, though, seemed to hold approval. Those who don't love hurling power make the best mages, the magister replied. His eyes seemed suddenly to bore deep into Elminster's soul like seeking darting things, and sadness was in his voice again as he added, and those who live by stealing almost always rob themselves of their own lives in the end. The taking gives me no pleasure, Elminster retorted. I do it to have enough to eat, and to strike against the mage lords where and when I can. The magister nodded. That's why ye might listen, he said. I'd not have wasted my breath otherwise. Elminster stared up at him thoughtfully and then stiffened as he heard the sudden approaching thunder of running booted feet echoing in the passages nearby. That sound could mean only one thing, armsmen of Athalantar. Save thyself, he snapped, without stopping to think what a ridiculous warning that was to the highest archmage in all the world, and darted toward the nearest archway that did not ring with footfalls. He was still three running strides short of it, when men with halberds and crossbows burst into the room, but the puffing merchant with them stabbed a finger at the floating mage and bellowed, There! By the time the volley of quarrels and hastily conjoined flames had torn through suddenly empty air, both the running boy and the eyes in the licking flames that played about the ruin of Haviland's once grand table had vanished. A breath later, the floating corpses suddenly fell from the air, striking the stone floor with wet, heavy thuds. White-faced armsmen drew back, calling aloud on Tempest to defend them and Tyche to aid them. Elminster took one door out of the kitchen, found himself in a dead-end cluster of pantries, and raced frantically back to the kitchen's other smaller door, offering his own quieter prayer to Tyche that it not be another pantry, when he heard Haviland's furious voice snarl, Find that boy! He's no part of my household! Cursing aloud, Elminster snatched open the door. Yes, this was the way the terrified cooks had fled. He took the stairs two at a time until at a bend in the stair several halberds crashed together in front of him, striking sparks. Snarling armsmen struggled to tear them free of the stair rails and wrestle them around to stab downward. 
but L had already seen a third helmsman lumbering along the passage above with a ready crossbow. He leaped back down the stairs in a single bound, landed hard on his haunches, and sprang sideways into an evil-smelling alcove. A breath later, a crossbow quarrel cracked off the wall nearby and rattled down into the kitchens. A second quarrel followed, speeding deep into the throat of the foremost armsmen racing up the stairs. Elminster didn't spare the time to watch the man gurgle and fall. He was looking around the dark alcove for the scullery door. There, wrenching it open, he skidded across the noisome floor through a maze of sloped boards where meat was washed and buckets where food scraps were thrown, hoping the house was old enough to have... Yes, L seized the pole ring and hauled up the trapdoor of the refuse pit. He could hear the waters of the run rushing past in the darkness below as he slid feet first down to join them. The drop was farther than he thought it would be, and the waters numbingly cold. L's heels struck a mucky bottom for a moment, and he twisted to one side to come up off to one side of the door above. Trying to ignore the unseen slimy lumps floating in the water with him, he came up gasping for breath and in time to hear a quarrel crack off the hatch somewhere above and behind him, followed by the shout, The sewers! He's gone below! Elminster swam with the rushing river trying not to make noise. He didn't trust the avid armsmen not to come down after him or lower torches and try their archery along the river tunnel. The chill of the waters crept into him as they carried him around a corner and away. It seemed the first chance he'd had in a long while to collect his wits. The Mage Royal and at least three other Mage Lords had been swept away in a single night, but the Hand of Elminster had done nothing to them. He hadn't even a bite of supper or a spare coin from the house to show for his efforts. Elminster gives thee thanks, Tyke, he murmured into the rushing darkness. He managed to hang on to his head in that chamber of death, he supposed that was something, something even mighty wizards hadn't managed. Prudence stifled the whoop of exultation that suddenly rose within him, but it warned him as he was swept out of the darkness into the blue, lamp-lit dimness of evening beneath the docks. He turned his head to look up at the dark spires of Athelgard and grinned his defiance at them. The feeling lasted until he'd clambered out of the water onto a disused dock and started the cold, dripping walk home. If he'd been Farl, he'd have taken his knowledge of who'd died in that chamber to swoop down on a hand's worth of houses this very night and seize riches their owners would never claim before relatives or lesser vultures knew man or treasure was missing, and be safely gone into the night. But I'm not Farl, Elminster told the knight, and not even all that good a thief. What I am is a good runner. To prove it, he outran the armsmen who came around a corner just then, halberd in hand, who with a startled shout recognized the youth he'd almost spitted in a stairway in Haviland's house not twenty breaths ago. Their pounding pursuit took them along a winding street lined with the walled gardens of the wealthy. As they ran under overhanging trees, a dark shadow reached down from one of them and struck the armsmen hard and accurately in the face with a cobblestone. The man pitched to the cobbles with a clatter, and Farrell dropped lightly down onto the road, calling, Eladar! Elminster turned at the top of the road and looked back. His friend stood with hands on hips, shaking his head. Can't leave you alone for an evening, I see, Farrell said as El puffed his way back down the street. As he came up, his friend was kneeling on the guard's neck, expertly feeling for purses, spare daggers, medallions, and other items of interest. Something important's happened, Farrell said, not looking up. Haviland came running in, all out of breath, and said something to Fentarn. And we were all ordered out of the house, and the armsmen after us to be sure we were turned out into the street, while the lot of them ran somewhere. Ran, L, I tell you. I didn't know any high and mighty merchants remembered how to run. I was where the important thing happened, Elminster said quietly. That's why this one was chasing me. Farrell looked up at him, eyes alight. Tell, was all he said. Later, Elminster replied, let me describe the dead first, and once ye've named them, we can visit whichever unsuspecting incipient houses of grief bid fair to have the heaviest loot lying around for the taking. Farl grinned fiercely. 
Suppose we do just that, O prince of thieves. In his excitement and the effort of lifting the guard's body, he did not see Elminster stiffen at the word prince. We're fair out of room in there, Farrell said in satisfaction when they were safely away from the boarded-up shop where their takings were cashed. Now let's go somewhere where we can talk and not be seen. The burial ground again? Fair enough, once we make sure it's free of lovers. They did so, and Elminster told Farrell the tale. His friend shook his head at El's description of the magister. I thought he was just a legend, he protested. Nay, El said quietly. He was frightening. Ah, but it was magnificent, the way he ignored their best spells and calmly judged each and struck them down. The power. Farrell cast a sidelong glance at his friend. Elminster was staring up at the moon, eyes bright. To have that much power some day, he murmured, and never have to run from an armsman again. I thought you hated wizards. I, I do. Mage lords, at least. There's something about seeing spells hurled, though, that fascinates, eh? I felt that. Farrell nodded in the moonlight. You'll get over it once you've tried to fire a wand or speak a spell over and over again and nothing happens. You learn to admire it from a distance and keep well clear, or be swiftly slain. Gods be damned wizards. He yawned. Well, a good night's work. Let's get some slumber under saloon, or we'll be snoring somewhere when full day comes again. Here? Nay, two of those dead at least have family vaults right here. And what if their servants, sent to clean up the tombs and the brush for burial, are fearful enough of walking dead to demand an escort of armsmen? Nay, we need to find a roof elsewhere. A sudden thought came to Elminster, and he grinned. Hannibur's? Farrell grinned back. His snores had wake a corpse. Exactly. They laughed and hastened back through the dark streets and alleys of the city avoiding aroused bands of armsmen who were tramping aimlessly about in the night, looking for a running youth in dank leathers and an old mage strolling along in the air, and no doubt inwardly hoping they'd find neither. As the half-light that heralds dawn stole down the river and into Hastarl, El and Farl settled down on Hannibur's roof, wondering at the silence from below. What's become of his snoring? El murmured and Farrell shrugged his own puzzlement in reply. Then they heard the small sound from below that meant Hannibur had slid open the eye panel on his back door. They exchanged raised eyebrows and bent to look down into the alley, in time to see Shandaith Laren, called the Shadow for her smoothly silent ways, and perhaps the most beautiful woman in all Hestarl, come lightly up the alley to Hannibur's back door. They heard her say softly, I'm here at last, love. At last, the baker rumbled as he drew the door warily open. I thought ye'd never come. Come to the bed ye belong in now. Elminster and Farl exchanged delighted glances and clasped hands with fierce joy in the night. Then, all thoughts of sleep gone, they settled down to listen to what befell in the room below and were fast asleep within seven breaths. The hot sun woke the two exhausted, filthy thieves sometime in the late morning, and once they were awake, the smell of fresh-baked rolls and loaves wafting up from Hannibur's shop made sure they stayed that way. Stomachs growling, the two thieves peered carefully down at the bedroom below. They could just see Shandate's elbow as she slept the day peacefully away. Don't seem right that she should sleep when we can't, Farrell complained, rubbing his eyes. Let her sleep, Elminster replied. She's doubtless earned it. Come. They climbed carefully down the crumbling back sills and cross beams of the shop next door and went off to the silver bit baths, only to find folk lined up. Whence this sudden urge for cleanliness, good sir? Farrell asked a sausage vendor they knew by sight. He frowned at them. Haven't ye heard? The Mage Royal and a dozen other mages were killed last night. The dirge walk begins at high sun. Killed? 
just who could manage to slay the mage royal. Ah, the sausage seller leaned close, confidentially, pretending not to see the eight or so folk who crowded or leaned out of the line to listen. There's some who say it was a mage they awakened from sleeping in a tomb all these years since the fall of Netheril. Nay, a woman standing near put in, "'Twas, and there's some, the sausage seller went on, raising his voice to ride over her, "'what says it was a poor wretch they caught and were going to eat, alive, so they say, for some foul magic. "'But when they sat down at the table he turned into a dragon and burned them all. "'Others say twas a beholder, or a mind flayer, or some at worse. "'Nay, nay,' the woman said, pushing in, "'that's not it at all, but meself the sausage vendor said, elbowing her back and raising his voice again so that it echoed back off the stone wall across the alley. I think the first tale I heard is the true one. Their wickedness was punished by a visit from Mistra herself. Yes, that's it. Twas just that as happened, I tell thee. The woman was hopping up and down in her excitement now. Her capacious bosom heaved and rolled like tied bundles on the docks in high winds. The mage royal thought he had a spell that would bring her to heal like a dog, so he could use her power to destroy all wizards but ours, and conquer all the lands from here to the great sea beyond Elambar. But he was wrong, and she— She turned them all to boars, thrust spits up their behinds, and seared them in the hearth fires. The gleeful voice belonged to a man nearby who stank of fish. Nay, I heard she plucked off all their heads and ate them an old woman said proudly, as if King Belor personally had told her. Ah, get gone with you. Why'd she do that, eh? The man next to her stepped on her foot hard. She hopped in pain, shaking her finger under his nose. Just you wait, clever nose, just wait and see. If they has carved wooden heads when they're born past us, or their heads covered with the burial cloaks, then I'm right. And there's some folk in Hestarl, as'll tell you, Berdice had tears never wrong. Just you wait. Farl and Elminster had been trading amused looks, but at this Farl smiled and said out of the side of his mouth, changing his voice so that it sounded gruff and distant, I suppose as thou wouldn't put money on it, Harry. In an instant, the alley was a bedlam of shouting, red-faced Hestarl folk, holding up fingers to indicate their wagers. Wait a bit, wait a bit, Elminster said, and silence fell. Eladar the Dark never talked. It always distresses me to see ye wager, he said, looking around earnestly, because after there's so much hard talk and people furious at those who didn't pay. So if ye must wager, and ye know I don't throw my coins about thus, I'll write down thy claims and all can be settled fair after. There was much talk, and then a growing agreement that this was a good idea. Elminster tore the sleeve from the rotten shirt he was wearing. Some got ink from the street scribe in trade for a quill that he'd stolen out of a window a ten-day ago, and was still carrying in his boot, and set to work, scratching out sums with a rough-pointed needle. In the rush, none of the folk noticed Farl met several heavy wagers standing always for the headless side. Elminster worked his way along the line to its head, dodged inside to continue wagering, hung the scribbled sleeve on a high nail, and plunged headlong and fully clothed into the old wine-press tub that served as the bath. The water was already gray with filth, and Elminster came out again just as fast, pursued by the furious proprietor. They dodged around the rinse pump while Farl worked the handle, dousing them both with rather cleaner water. And then Elminster thrust four silver bits into the man's hand, leaped to retrieve the wager sleeve, and scampered out again. "'Gods blast thee! Tis a gold piece ahead this day!' the man bellowed after them. El spun around, disgusted, and tossed a handful of silver bits in the bathkeeper's direction. "'He's a worse thief than we've ever been!' he muttered to Farl as they headed for a good place to hide the sleeve. It seemed fitting that the folk of Hastarl were willing to pay good gold to see the backs forever of the mage royal and a good handful of mage lords besides. Or a better, Farl agreed. Word of what had befallen was all over the city. 
folk talked of nothing else around them as they walked, and something of the air of a festival hung over the city. Al shook his head at the open laughter, even among the patrols of armsmen. Well, of course they're happy, Farrell explained to his wondering partner. It's not every night that some helpful young thief, even if he does prefer to give all the credit to some mysterious mage who conveniently came out of thin air and just as helpfully vanished back again into it, downs the most hated and feared man in all Athalantar and many of his fellow mages, not to mention a bunch of men that shopkeepers in this city owe a lot of coins to. Wouldn't you be in their place? They just haven't thought about which cruel mage lord will step forward to proclaim himself mage royal and make them even more fearful than before, Elminster replied darkly. The wide streets along the route of the dirge walk were filling already. Folk who owned finery and bath facilities of their own to prepare for its wearing were pushing for the best positions, unaware of the flood of less polite and poorer neighbors who would shortly be charging in to seize the vantage points they wanted, regardless of who thought they owned it already. In most such processions, a good score of folk ended up crushed under the wheels of the carts, shoved forward by the press of leaning, shouting common folk. Are you thinking of what houses may be standing empty this good day, groaning with the weight of coins for the taking? While all Hestarl turns out to watch corpses paraded by? Farrell asked lightly. Nay, Elminster said. I was thinking of switching the bucket the bathkeeper sits on for another, taking the one he's filling up with coins right now, and in its place leaving a bucket of... Dung? Farrell grinned. Too risky, though, by far. Half the folk in line would see us. Ye think they don't know what we do for a living, Farrell? Even ye can't be that much of an idiot, Elminster replied. Farrell drew himself up with an air of injured dignity. Tis not that, good sir. Tis that we have a reputation to maintain. Everyone may know we take, aye, but none should ever see us doing the taking. It should be magic, do you see? Like those wizards you're so fond of. Al gave him a look. Let's go take things he said, and they strolled off to arm themselves for the workday ahead. One house topped the list of places to loot, and they hastened hence, wearing livery that was not their own but that served to conceal carry bags strapped to their backs and bellies and to hide the handfuls of daggers they both carried. They dropped over the back wall into a pleasant garden, crossed it like two hungry shadows, and swarmed up a climbing thorn flower to a balcony. A servant was asleep in the sun in the room beyond, seizing a prize opportunity while his master was out of the house. This is too easy, Farrell said as they sped up the stairs to a gilded door. He thrust his dagger into the carved, snarling lion in its center and waited while the spring-loaded darts flashed away harmlessly down the stairs. Don't these fools realize that the shops that sell them thief traps are always run by thieves? He dug his blade into one of the lion's eyes, and the cut glass eye popped out of its setting to dangle from the end of a cloth ribbon. Finding the wire in the opening behind the eye, Farrell cut it and swung the door open. L looked back down the stairs as they went in, but the house was silent. The bedchamber was a vision of red and deep pinkish tapestries, cushions, and couches. I feel as if I'm in someone's stomach, Farrell muttered as they crossed this sea of red. Or waiting around in an open wound, Elminster agreed, striding up to a silver jewel coffer. As he reached it, a hard-thrown dart flashed past his fingers. Farrell spun, dagger in hand to stare into the eyes of two women and a man who were climbing swiftly in through a window. They were all clad in matching black leathers and bore a sigil on their breasts, a crossed moon and dagger. This loot belongs to the moon claws, said one woman in a steely whisper, her eyes hard. Ah, no, Farrell replied disgustedly, hurling his dagger. Gangs! His blade spun through the air to plunge through the hand of the other woman, the hand that had been sweeping up with a dart in it. She screamed and fell to her knees. Elminster hurled a dagger hilt first into the man's face, tossed a cushion after it, and then sudden rage took hold of him. 
He leaped forward to plant a kick so hard in the man's gut that he groaned aloud as his toes struck the armor plate there, but its wearer was driven headlong back out the window to fall screaming to the garden below, a garrote waving uselessly in his hands. So noisy, so unprofessional, Farrell murmured, snatching up the jewel coffer. The wounded woman was fleeing for the rope at the window she'd come in by, sobbing from the pain and shaking blood all over the red carpets. Hey, that's one of my good blades, he complained as the other woman leaped at him, hurling one dagger and raising another. Farrell ducked and swept the coffer up. Her blade struck it and shot into the ceiling, where it struck a roof beam and stood quivering. The woman tried to reach over the coffer and slash his face, but Farrell simply stepped around her, keeping the coffer between them, his head low and out of reach, and shoved her away with its end. She slipped on the carpet, and he brought the coffer down hard on her head. She collapsed soundlessly, and Elminster gently laid her unconscious companion atop her, handing Farrell his blade. Farrell examined its bloody tip and wiped it on the woman. Dead? Elminster shook his head. Just asleep, too hurt to defend herself. They knelt together over the gem coffer, scooping and snatching in real haste, until Farrell said, Enough. Use the rope. Let's be gone. They paused to check the firmness of the gang's grapnel, and then hastily clambered down, Farrell first. The male thief lay sprawled senseless on the turf, with a shocked-looking servant gazing down at him. Seeing the rope dance and jerk, he stared up at them. Then he screamed and ran, and from the window above them, the two thieves heard an angry shout. God be damned, let's hope they have no crossbows, Farrell snarled, slipping down the rope as his hands burned. Then suddenly, sickeningly, the rope was no longer attached, and they were falling. There was a thud and a grunt from below as Farrell landed. L tensed at the thought he might soon land atop his partner, but Farrell was already up and sprinting out of the way. Elminster tried to relax as the turf swiftly rushed up to meet him. The landing was hard. He got up, wincing, his right foot hurt, and beside him lay the man he'd kicked, mouth open and face white. A sick feeling rose in him, but as he scrambled to his feet, he saw the man's hand move feebly, grasping for a window sill that wasn't there. Elminster and Farrell sprinted together across the garden and scrabbled hastily up and over the wall. They dropped into the street outside and began strolling nonchalantly toward the nearest cross street. But a heavy cloth-yard shaft hummed low over the wall and struck the high wooden gate of the house across from them. Farrell stared up at it. By the gods, a proper archer. Let's be gone. So it was at an undignified run that the two fetched up, puffing behind the boarded-up shop to lose loot and gear. Then Farrell smote his forehead. Gangs, he hissed. They've always someone to spare. Must have set a watcher. He turned and ran back the way they'd come, motioning to Elminster to hurry on down the alley. Elminster continued to flee, moving purposefully, but not running, looking around warily from time to time. He'd gone two streets farther when Farrell dropped down from a nearby rooftop, puffing and said, Right, let's dump all of this and buy some of Hannibal's hot buttered rolls. We've earned an early even feast. The Watcher? Elminster asked. I threw a blade at him and missed by half a league, but he was so startled he fell over backward off his roof and split his head open on the edge of a wagon below. He'll be watching nothing forevermore. Elminster shuddered. Farrell shook his head and looked gloomy. What did I warn you? Gangs. There goes the high tone of Hastarl. Six. Squalor Among Thieves There is one sort of a city that's worse than one where thieves rule the night streets, the sort where thieves form the government and rule night and day. Yurkid Bayaran of Calumport, The Book of Black Tidings, Year of the Shattered Skulls the best Kalashite silks rarely made the long and perilous way up the pirate-infested and storm-racked coast of the Great Sea in numbers enough that Elambar, Uthtower, and Yarleith did not drink them all in, leaving some for the long, arduous pole-barge journey up the Delambir. 
It was rarer still for the merchants who owned such barges to stop in tiny provincial Hestarl, where homespun was the favored wear, and a good sword scabbard was more admired than an elegantly cut jerkin. It was rarer yet for the shining, ornamented purple and emerald tatan weaves from the fabled cities of the sea breeze farther south to accompany the silks. Crowds at the docks were heavy. Some of the fat, strutting cloth merchants didn't even bother to climb the streets to the tall, narrow shops of the master tailors, but sold all their wares on the docks. Farl and Elminster thought themselves subtle indeed not to try for a single thread that first exciting landing. When a second followed, they left it alone too, and watched from afar as the unfortunate grab artist of the Moon Claws was caught stealing silks, whipped skinless, and hanged from the city wall. The master tailors had no guild because the mage lords did not hold with guilds. They did, however, meet earnestly over wine and roast boar in the dancing dryad feasting house and come to a business agreement of mutual advantage. A lass who served them at table and collected rather too many pinches for her liking told Farl and Earlminster, in return for four gold coins, what had been decided. "'Twas money well spent,' Farl judged. Elminster, as was his wont, said nothing. And so this moonless night found them on the roof of a warehouse overlooking a certain dock, waiting for the creak of oars and surreptitious shining of unshuttered lanterns that would mark the arrival of the private shipment to the master tailors, including, it was rumored, cloth of gold and amber buttons. It was a crisp, breezy night, the first heralding of leaf fall to come, and another cold, damp winter. But wrapped in their dark cloaks, they hadn't time to grow stiff and cold before the flashes of lamplight were seen glimmering over the dark waters below. The two thieves waited in patient silence for their victims-to-be to help fully load the wagons, four in all and heavily laden, then slid silently down from their perch, avoiding the lumbering hire guards who clustered around the lead wagon. It was the work of but a moment to hurl a stone over into the heap of rusted metal pans in the alley behind the confectioner's shop, and while heads and blades were turned that way, to slip up into the fourth wagon from the other side of the street. Then they'd have a breath or six to sort before another diversion became necessary to cover their leaving. It was about the time of the fourth breath that they heard a startled oath from somewhere nearby, the scream of a wounded horse and the skirl of steel. Competition? El breathed into his friend's ear, and Farl nodded. Our diversion, he murmured, provided by the moon claws, no doubt. Wait a bit now. That horse means they've got at least one bow with them. Let the fight get well underway before we go out. The fight obliged and the two companions hastened to finish sorting and stowing their loot for carrying. When they were done, they drew their daggers and unlatched the back doors of the wagon and peered cautiously out into the night. A face with a blade held already beside it was glaring up at them. Farl leaped high to avoid the man's thrust, landed with both feet atop the blade, and jumped down on the sword-wielder's arm, burying his dagger in that face before the man even had time to cry out as El jumped to the cobbles beside them, staggering under the weight of their booty. Farl tugged his dagger free and hurled it into the night, which seemed to be full of running men and drawn swords. It struck the brow of a higher guard, who cursed, clutched at the streaming blood, and ran. Farl scooped up the long sword that had fallen from the shattered arm of his first victim and hissed, Come on, out of this! They ran to the right, toward one of the rising side streets where folk dwelt who were too respectable to live in hovels, but not rich enough to have walls around their homes. Daggers flashed and spun in the night on all sides, but the moon claws hadn't a decent blade tosser among them. It seemed the guards had been inept, or spineless, or paid off. The fight was over. All the other folk yet alive in the street were moon claws. Farl and El didn't waste breath on curses. They dodged from side to side erratically to discourage the Moonclaw's archer and plunged along the street, puffing for breath. The expected humming of a seeking arrow came to their ears accompanied by a startled curse from close behind them. The arrow wobbled past them strangely. 
Farrell frowned at it and looked back. A Moonclaw's man who'd been pursuing them was stumbling and rubbing at his shoulder. Dare they shoot again? El gasped. With their own folk? Hasn't stopped them yet, Farrell puffed. Keep dodging. The next arrow came as they reached the top of the street and turned aside to duck along an alley, crouching low. The humming grew louder and they both dived to the cobbles. The arrow whipped low over them and cracked into some shutters across the way just as a patrol of armsmen shouldered out of the alley, halberds held high. The patrol captain peered down in the dimness at the two men sprawled in front of him and snapped, Get that light up here! Something befalls! Swords out! The moon claws had a second archer, it seemed. His shaft hit home with a solid thump, and the captain gurgled, spun around, and plunged to the cobbles, strangling on the long, dark shaft through his throat. Farrell and El rolled to their feet while startled armsmen were still wrestling their halberds down, and ran down the alley past the patrol, hooking the feet out from under the only armsmen who tried to block their path. As the soldier crashed to the cobbles, Farrell swarmed up a draper's outside wooden staircase with El close behind. The roof was an easy leap from the rail, but slippery with puddles of rainwater. The next roof was thatch, and they burrowed thankfully into its far slope to catch their breaths. They looked at each other in the darkness, panting. There's naught for it, Farrell said a frantic few breaths later, but to form our own gang. Tyche Adis, El murmured. Farrell looked at him. Don't you mean Mask, Lord of Thieves? Nay, Elminster replied. I was praying that this gang does not end our friendship or our lives. Farrell was silent for a long time. Then Elminster heard him murmur, O oh, Lady Tyche, hear me. Ah, Nanitha, those velvet hands! Farrell was laughing, and then he stopped. That's it! We call ourselves the Velvet Hands. Groans and laughter rang round the tiny room. It was dusty and stank of decades of salted fish. But the owner of the warehouse was dead, and the two broken-down carts they'd carefully jammed together in the mouth of the alley made it unlikely any patrols would get close enough to hear them. Over a dozen folk were in the room, keeping a wary distance apart with careful eyes on each other and their hands close to their weapons. Farrell eyed them all and sighed. I know none of you are delighted at this idea, but everyone here knows it's band together or be slain, or leave Hestarl to try our luck elsewhere, in strange places where we'll be marked as suspicious outlanders and find a local gang of thieves waiting to sink knives into us. Why not join the Moon Claws? Clarn rasped. He was one of the Blay and Bar brothers who lounged together by a window where they could give a signal to someone outside. On what terms? He asked reasonably. Every time Eladar or I have crossed paths with them, they tried to put their blades into us before a word was exchanged. We'd start out on the fringes, all of us, untrusted and expendable. More than that, Elminster put in, drawing startled looks from all over the room. I've wondered at all those leathers and matching badges they wear. Expensive, that, and right from the outset, before they'd taken two coins to rub together. Good weapons, too. Does that remind all ye of anything? A private bodyguard, belike? An army in Hastarl that strikes at thieves? Us, whenever they see us? That sounds like the work of someone in the hire of a mage lord, or the king, or someone rich and important. What better way to rid the city of thieves and arrange accidents for thy rivals but than to put thine own band on the streets? There were thoughtful nods all around the room now. Now that, fat old Chaz Lara said, scratching herself, makes more sense of the mess than I've heard since I first saw him, and it explains why some armsmen seem to look the other way when they strike out, under orders belike. I, young Regeyer said, idly turning a little knife in his fingers as he perched atop a barrel taller than he was. As usual, he was very dirty. But then so was the barrel, and a peering eye might have missed him, but for the flash and turn of the little blade. Well, I think it's so much smart lies and fancy castles talk, Clarence snarled, and I'll not listen to more of it. 
Ye are fools, all of ye, if ye listen to these two dreamers. What have they but smart tongues? He strode out of his corner to stare around the room, and like a silent wave rolling in his wake, his two brothers came to stand at his back in a solid, threatening wall of flesh. If there's to be a band to rival the Moon Claws, I'll lead it. Velvet hands, indeed. While these two perfumed dancing lads are strutting and crowing, my brothers and me can make ye rich, guaranteed. Oh? A very deep voice rumbled out from one dark corner. And just how, Blay and Bar, are ye going to manage to make me trust thee? After watching thy bullying and blustering in the alleys these past three summers, all I know of ye is that I'd best never turn my back, or thy blade'll be in right sharp. Clarence sneered. Jardine, everyone in Hastarl knows ye're as strong as an ox, but anyone might give ye a good run in a race of wits. What can ye know of planning or— More than some folk, Jardine growled. Where I come from, planning always means some clever jack is going to try to trick me. Why don't ye go back there, then? Enough, Clarn, Farrell said with cold scorn. Trust is something the rest of us can never have when you're near, that's for certain. You'd best leave. The red-maned man turned on him. Afraid ye'll lose mastery of this little band of pawning hands, eh? Well, let's just see who speaks for ye here. Elminster stepped a silent pace forward. Yes, yes, we know your pretty boy does, as well as anything else ye ask him to do. Amid his coarse laughter, Jardine lumbered forward a pace, eyes hard. Regeer leaped down lightly from his barrel, and Chaz Larla wheezed forward too. Clarn looked around. Tassabra? The lithe figure in the deepest shadows shifted slightly and said in a low, musical voice, Sorry, Clarn. I side with Farl too. Fa! Gods frown upon all ye fools! Clarence spat on the floor, turned, and strode grandly out, his silent brothers Korlar and Othkin backing watchfully away to guard his going. I thought he was thy lover, another man murmured from the shadows. Take care, Lauren, Tassabra's voice was testy. That rutting boar, my lover? Nay. He was but a plaything. Jardine looked to Farl, who nodded. The huge man walked out of the room, moving with surprising silent lightness. Clarn might well have less time in life than he realized. Farl stepped forward. Are we agreed, then? Do the velvet hands fare forth in Hestarl from this night on? Aye, came the rough voice of one-eyed Tarth. I'll follow your orders. And I. As Larla said, wheezing forward. So long as ye turn not into one of those cold hearts who thinks himself the true ruler of his city and sends us out to stab armsmen and mage lords all the night through. There was a general rumble of agreement. Farl grinned and bowed. We have an agreement then. As our first work together, let's get out of here with blades ready, and as I bid, in case the moon claws are waiting for us with bows or have told a patrol when and where to expect us. Can I have first blood? Rayergar asked eagerly. Behind him they heard Tessabra's low laugh. Just be sure it's not yours, she said. The darkness covered the look he gave her, but they could all feel it. There were chuckles in the night as they went down the stairs together. All Hestarl knew the noble Atlantan families Glarmere and Trumpet Tower had been joined that same night in a true love match. Purest Trumpet Tower had worn a high-plumed hat and cloth of gold doublet specially crafted for the occasion, with his usual bell-trimmed hose and best curl-tip shoes. Strapping on his father's lightest sword, he proudly paraded his lady to the shrines of Sune, Lathander, Helm, and Tyche, before the hand-fasting was completed under the Sword of Tear. The father of the bride had gifted the happy pair with a statue of the rearing stag Athelantar, the beast, not the dead king, that had been sculpted from a single gigantic diamond, and was worth more than some large castles. 
The servant who carried it around all day on a glass-domed platter thought it might well have been heavier than some castles, too. Under a heavy guard, this eminently practical gift had been installed in the bridal bedchamber at the foot of the bed, where, as old Darigo Trumpet Tower had put it with a wink and a leer, "'Twould be a fine position to watch." Nanawake Larmere had worn an exquisite sky-blue gown crafted by the elves of far-off Chantel Othrier. Her mother had proudly announced it had cost a thousand pieces of gold. Now it lay crumpled on the floor like so much discarded wrapping, which is precisely what the squeakily excited purist thought it was, as the newly wedded couple toasted each other with sparkling moon-bubble wine and turned to raise their glasses to saloon, that she might smile down upon the bridal bed. The first pale rays of her radiance had peeked in the window far enough to touch the statue of the stag with moonlight, where it stood rampant and watchful on its own table at the foot of the bed. Neither man nor wife noticed the deft pair of black-gloved hands reach up from under the bed and take away the gem-headed hairpins Nanaway had just drawn out, to let her hair cascade unbound down her elegant back, to purists' breathless delight. Both newlyweds, however, did notice the sudden appearance of a pair of booted feet that blotted out the moon and then crashed through the fine glass of the largest arched bedchamber window, followed by their owner, a woman clad in tight-fitting black leathers with a badge on her breast, who wore a black half-mask. The shapely intruder smiled at them sweetly as she drew a needle-thin blade from one boot and approached the stag. In all this excitement, none of the three heard an exasperated sigh from under the bed. Scream just once, she warned softly, and I'll slide this into you. Having been handed the idea, Nanuay screamed just once. Piercingly, too, shards of glass fell from the window frame with a tinkling clatter. The woman's face darkened into a snarl, and she ran across the room, poniard raised to stab. Seemingly by itself, a footstool beside the bed leaped up from the floor to catch her in the face. She reeled, lost her dagger, and fell heavily sideways into a wardrobe, which promptly toppled slowly and grandly over on top of her. Nanaway and Pyrrhist both boldly seized the initiative, shrieking in unison. Downstairs, befurred and bejeweled elders of both families heard the mighty crash and the screams. They raised knowing eyes and grins toward the ceiling and then toasted each other. Ah, yes, Derigo Trumpet Tower said, leering over his glass at a Glarmere lass almost half his age, and blowing his bristling mustache out of his wine with a practiced puff. I remember well my wedding night, the first one at least. I was sober for that one. Twas back in the year of the Gorgon Moon, as I recall. A dark figure rose up from beneath the bed, crept across the room, and ducked behind a lounge onto which Pierist had grandly tossed his boots, one after the other, not so long ago. The intruder was safely out of sight before the next two thieves in leathers burst in through the other two windows, raining fresh glass onto the thick fur rugs. Pierist and Nanue clutched each other, naked but not noticing any more, and howled in fear, clawing at each other's backs in a frantic attempt to get going elsewhere, anywhere. The two fresh arrivals wore the same masks and tight leathers with breast badges as the first one. One was a woman, the other a man, and both were looking wildly about the room. Where's she gone, then? Hush, Minter, you'll rouse the house. Don't use my name. God damn thy tongue. They drew daggers from their boots and approached the terrified couple on the bed, who screamed and tried to burrow under the fur-trimmed silk sheets. Hold, damn ye! Minter reached for a fleeting foot, missed, and got hold of an ankle. He pulled. A vainly struggling purist clawed at the sheets and managed to drag them off his wife, who knelt on the bed and screamed again, piercingly. Across the room, a glass figurine shattered, causing the black-gloved hand that had been reaching up from behind the lounge for it to withdraw, with a hasty curse. Purist trumpet tower was hauled from the bed to bounce and then sprawl on the carpet at Minter's feet, gibbering in fear. 
Minter flipped him over, reflecting briefly on how ridiculous other naked men look, and snarled, Where'd she go? He waved his dagger under the man's nose for effect. Who? Who? Pierce shrieked. Minter pointed with his blade at the whirlwind that was his partner Isparla, who was plucking gem coffers and silken underthings from the floor and tables around and tossing them all onto one of the sheets on the floor. As they watched, she scooped up the stag, grunted in surprise under its weight, staggered off balance, slipped on the carpet, and fell on both elbows atop the piled loot. She moaned in pain, and the stag in her grasp slipped free and thumped down sideways onto one of her hands. She grunted again, louder. Another like her who came in before us, Minter growled, indicating his partner. Uh, under the wardrobe, Pierce panted, pointing. It fell on her. Minter turned and saw a ribbon of dank blood running from under the wardrobe, which was as large and probably as heavy as a long-haul wagon. He shuddered. He kept on shuddering all the way to the floor as a figure rose from under the bed and brought a perfume bottle down on his head. Esparla clambered to her feet, saw the figure with the shards of the perfume bottle in his hand, obligingly spat, Velvets, again! And through her dagger, the figure obediently dived back behind the bed, and the dagger flashed harmlessly across the room. A titanic sneeze came from behind the bed. Nanaway screamed again, and the woman in black leathers slapped her across the face backhanded as she leaped past, grabbing for the elusive sneezing figure. She tripped over the stag in her haste, hopped, and moaned in pain. The stag thumped over onto its side, and a shard of diamond broke off it. The mysterious person behind the bed was curled up and shaking in the throes of uncontrollable sneezing, but managed to drive the broken perfume bottle into the moon claws woman's face, which she had just stuck around behind the bed. Isparla recoiled, rearing up on the bed, and Nanaway slapped her back, hard. Her masked head whipped around. She snarled, leaned forward, and there was a meaty smack as her face met the brass chamber pot that Pierist's shaking hands had just swept upward. Isparla collapsed silently across the bed. Nanuway, kneeling beside her, saw blood flowing from the masked woman's mouth onto the silken sheets and helpfully screamed again. Pierist saw what he'd done, threw the chamber pot down in horror. There was a sharp crack as it struck the stag and then a hollow metallic gonging when it skipped across the room and rolled to a stop, and fled across the room howling. A dark figure burst up from behind the lounge and sprinted to intercept him. Pierist was two running paces from the safety of the bedchamber door when the figure caught up with them. They crashed into the door together. It boomed, burst open from the impact, and was instantly smashed shut again by their falling bodies. Downstairs, the befurred and bejeweled elders of both families heard the crash, raised their eyebrows at each other, and poured another toast. Well, Janatha Glarmir said brightly, staring around as color rose prettily into her cheeks, they certainly seem to be hitting it off, don't they? Hitting sounds like it would be about right, Derigo Trumpet Tower agreed with a guffaw, leering at her. I remember my second wife was like that. Elminster rose from atop Pierist's unconscious form, made sure the door was bolted this time, and hurried to where Farrell, eyes still streaming from the perfume, was staggering away from the bed. We've got to get out of here, he muttered, shaking Farrell. Damned moon claws, his partner snarled. Grab something to make all this worthwhile. I have, El said. Now let's be gone. His words rose into an excited shout as a new pair of leather-clad figures swung in the window using yet more silken lines. They landed running, blades out. Elminster swept up a small glass-topped table, spilling figurines in all directions, and hurled it hard. His target ducked, and the table sailed harmlessly out the window, just as one of the figurines landed hard on his foot. Elminster hopped in pain, roaring. The grinning moon claws man closed in on him, raising a gleaming blade as the other one dived to grab the nude, shrieking woman on the bed. The table fell through the night to explode in shards of glass and twisted spars of brass on the cobbles far below. Some of them clattered on the windows of the feasting hall and the parlor. 
The befurred and bejeweled elders of both families turned at the sound, and more eyebrows were raised. They wouldn't be fighting, would they? Janatha Glarmere said anxiously, fanning herself to conceal her burning cheeks. It certainly seems lively. Nay, Dorigo Trumpet Tower roared. That's just, what did they call? Oh, I, foreplay. You know, the fun and games beforehand. Great big room up there to chase each other around in. He sighed, looking up at the ceiling. Obligingly, it shook under another sharp, booming crash, and a cloud of dust drifted down. Wish I were younger and Pierist was calling for help. Promptly, there came a faint, quavering cry. Help! Well, Dorigo said in delight, if the lad ain't the very shining image of his old uncle indeed. Where are those stairs? Hope I can remember how to do the deed after all these years. Elminster danced backward, wincing. The Moonclaw's man lunged at him, blade flashing, and then grunted in surprise as Farl reached out and wrapped himself around the man's leg. The Moonclaw's thief toppled like a felled tree, and Farl stabbed him in the throat before he'd even stopped bouncing. The stag statue cracked and, somewhat smaller now, spun away from under the man's sprawled body. Elminster saw what Farl had done, turned his head away, and promptly emptied his dinner all over a blue-dyed fur rug from Kalimshan. Well, that's one rug we won't be taking back with us, Farl called merrily as he sprinted across the room to where the last Moonclaws woman was struggling with the sobbing bride. Just as he got there, the thief managed to get her hands on Nanue's face and throat and looked up. Farl didn't slow. He planted a firm fist in her mask as he ran past. She hadn't even hit the carpet when he leaped out the window, one of the swing lines hissing through his gloved hands as he slid down in haste. Elminster snatched up a hand-sized jewel coffer to add to the hairpins he'd stowed in his boots, thrust it down the front of his shirt to free his hands for climbing, and ran after Farl. Screaming, Nanue ran the other way, toward the door where her husband lay senseless. Elminster tripped over the stag, cursed, and ended his flight to the windows in a helpless roll. The statue slid away across slick tiles exposed when rugs were nicked up in the battle, and caroomed off a wall, spitting pieces of itself in all directions. L fetched up against the window sill in an untidy heap, unseen by the Moonclaws man who swung grandly in the window at that moment and stepped right over the thieving prince, his eyes fixed on the statue gliding to a gleaming stop in the moonlight. Aha! A king's ransom. Mine, the thief bellowed, hurling a dagger out of habit at the nude woman fleeing across the chamber. The flashing fang struck an upright mirror which pivoted on its pintles, overbalanced, and came crashing down on Nanue. She shrieked and leaped desperately backward, skidding helplessly on the rugs. The mirror crashed down beside it and shattered, shards bouncing on the tiles. Nanue rolled away blindly to escape them and overturned an ornamental table crowded with scent bottles. The reek that arose was incredible. It even made the thief, gloved hand about to close on what was left of the stag, recoil. This sudden movement sent him skidding on a fragment broken off the statue, and he sat down hard, jarring a portrait down off the wall. Roruld Trumpet Tower, Scourge of the Sturges, depicted holding a glass of blood aloft in one hand and a wrung-out limped-winged Sturge in the other, landed with a crash that shook the room, hopped forward as the frame shivered, and smashed down atop the thief. The stag spun away again, still growing smaller. Nanaway sobbed at the overpowering smell as she wallowed in glass shards and spilled perfume. She was drenched with half a hundred secret oils and glowing daubs, and the tiles were so slippery she couldn't find footing. At length, weeping with frustration and at the smell, she started to crawl toward the nearest rug. It was the one Elminster had recently decorated. Nanue recoiled from it, selected another as her goal, and crawled in that direction, weeping with fresh energy. Elminster shook his head in disbelief at the scene of devastation in the room, caught hold of the rope, and was gone into the night. Behind him there was a sharp tearing sound as a gloved hand holding a dagger punched up through the heart of Roruld Trumpet Tower. 
cutting a hole in the massive portrait so that its masked Moonclaw's owner could emerge and look wildly around the room for... There, the stag lay in a serene pool of moonlight near the bed, starred now with many cracks. The thief hastened to scoop it up. Mine at last! Nay, responded a cold voice from the window. Tis mine! A dagger was flung but missed, coming to a quivering rest in a wooden wall carving with a solid thunk. The first thief sneered as he scooped up the stag, then realizing the other Moonclaw's man couldn't see his expression through the mask, made a rude gesture with the statue. The second thief snarled in rage and threw another dagger. It flashed across the room and passed just in front of Nanue's nose. The crawling bride hastily changed course again, scuttling back across the tiles toward safety behind the lounge. The thief with the statue strode toward the window. Keep back, he warned, waving his dagger. The second thief scooped up one of the fallen gem coffers and calmly flung it at the head of the first thief. It hit home and burst open, spilling a glistening rain of gems to the floor. The first thief joined them in the general cascade, the stag flying up from his hand. End over end it spun through the air, toward the window. No! The second thief lunged desperately after it, slipping and sliding on the bouncing gems. His gloved hands stretched, reaching, reaching, and into the very tips of his straining fingers the proud stag fell. He clung to it in gloating triumph, skidding across the floor with the momentum of his desperate run. Ha! I have it! My precious! Oh, my precious stag! And then the gems under his boots slid him hard into the low window sill, and he kicked helplessly, toppled, and with a shriek fell out into the night, wailing and was gone. Nanue saw the thief disappear, shivered, and came carefully to her feet, turning again toward the door. She must get out. Another pair of thieves in black leathers swung in through the windows. Oh, dung heaps! Nanue wailed, and started yet another desperate dash for the door. The thieves looked around at the wreckage and carnage, and swore horribly. One bounded forward into the room, swept up the masked woman from the bed, threw her over his shoulder, and made straight for the window again. The other sprinted down the room after Nanaway to snatch her for a ransom. She screamed and was slipping on rugs, trying not to crash into the door in her haste, and falled on the crumpled pierist when something heavy hit the door from the other side. The bolt twisted and jammed, and Nanaway slid helplessly into the wall. Snarled curses echoed through the door from the passage beyond, and then it shook under another thunderous blow. Nanue scrambled aside, shrieking at the thief who grabbed for her kicking legs. The door splintered then and flew inward, hurling the thief a good distance away across the firs. He rolled to his feet, and two daggers gleamed as he drew them. The moon claws thief saluted the nude woman with them and advanced menacingly. Nanue screamed again. Darigo Trumpet Tower looked around the ruined bedchamber in bewilderment. At his feet lay his nephew, and right beside him, his terrified bride on her knees, shrieking as she crawled toward Darigo. Darigo looked up again, mustache bristling. An intruder in black leathers was coming at him in a run, daggers gleaming in both hands. There wasn't even time to leer down at Nanue, who, he couldn't help noticing, looked like a fine wife indeed. He looked up at the onrushing thief again and drew a deep breath. T'was time to uphold the honor of the trumpet towers. With a roar, Darigo trumpet tower charged across the room. The thief swept his daggers up to stab, but the old man took one in the arm without flinching and smashed home a bone-shattering blow to the thief's jaw. Still roaring, he snatched at the reeling man's throat before he could fall, picked up the thief by the neck the same way he carried turkeys in to be cooked at home and strode across the room streaming blood. Straight to the shattered windows he went, lifted the thief, and hurled him out into the empty darkness. He listened for the thud from the cobbles far below, nodded in satisfaction when it came, and went back for another thief. Nanue decided it was safe to faint now. As the second thief sailed out into the night, the blushing bride sank gracefully down on Pierist's chest and knew no more. Word was all over the city by mid-morn how the old blustering warrior Darigo Trumpet Tower 
had fought a dozen thieves in the bridal bedchamber of his nephew while the unhearing lovers had calmly consummated their match, and how he, Derigo, hurled every one of the moon claws in uniform out the high windows to their deaths in the courtyard of Trumpet Tower House. Farl and L raised eyebrows and tankards of strong ale to the news. It sounds as though one of them rescued Esparla and got out again, Farl said, sipping. How many does that leave? Elminster asked quietly. Farl shrugged. Who knows? The gods and the moon claws alone. But they lost Weira, Minter, Anathe, Oberig for certain, and probably Irtil too. Let's say we're a lot more even after last night, though they did blunder in on a perfectly good grab job and lose us all but the little stuff. One of the hairpins broke too, Elminster reminded him. Aye, but we have both pieces. Little lost there, Farrell said. Now if we... He broke off, frowned, and bent his head to listen to an excited whisper at a table nearby, laying a hand on Elm's arm to bid for silence. Elminster, who'd been holding his peace, continued to do so. Aye, magic, doubtless hidden away by King Uthgrail years agone. One man was saying, leaning forward almost into the friend's face to avoid being overheard. In a secret chamber somewheres in the castle, they say. Farl and Elminster leaned forward to listen carefully. A moment later, the need to do so passed. A minstrel came in, bounded up onto the nearest table, and cried the tale at the top of his young, excited voice. In truth, it was a tale straight out of the legends minstrels kept shining. A chest of magical Ayun stones had been found in the castle, hidden away years before, probably by or on the orders of King Uthgrail. The mage lords are and remain in heated disagreement about who shall have them and how they'll be used. By decree of King Belor himself, the stones glowing and floating about by themselves, giving off faint chimings and musical sounds like harp chords from time to time, are on display, guarded by the officers and senior armsmen of Applegard in a certain audience chamber no wizards are allowed to approach until a decision is made. As they left the tavern, the excited minstrel was declaiming in ringing tones that he'd seen the stones himself, and that this was all true. Farl smiled. You know, we have to go for those stones. Elminster shook his head. Ye couldn't turn thy back on them and still be Farl, master of the velvet hands, he said dryly. Farl chuckled. This time, Elminster told him firmly, ye should wait. Let the moon claws spring the trap, and go in only if ye can see a safe, clear way to do so. Trap? Don't ye smell the hands of calculating wizards in this wondrous tale? I do. After a moment, Farl nodded. Their eyes met. Why did you say ye? Farl asked quietly. I am done with thieving, Elminster said slowly. If ye go after these wonderful magical stones, ye must do it alone. I'll be leaving Hastarl after I do one more thing. Farl stood frozen, eyes very dark. Why? Robbing and slaying hurts folks I have no quarrel with and brings revenge no closer to the mage lords. You saw the stag statue? The grasping hands of thieving only take what's precious and make it battered and broken and worthless. I've learned as much as the street can teach, and have had enough. Elminster stared into Farl's stunned eyes and added, Seasons slip away, and the things I've not done eat at me. I must leave. I knew it was coming, Farl admitted, his face growing very red. It's the scruples that assured it. But this one thing more, t'wouldn't be a betrayal, would it? Elminster shook his head and spoke slowly and deliberately. I've never had a friend as close and as true as Farl, son of Hawklin. Suddenly their arms were around each other in a tight embrace. They stood in the alley and wept, pounding each other on backs and shoulders. After a time, Farl said, Ah, El... What am I to do without you? Take up with Tassabra, Elminster said. 
and added with a gleam in his eye, ye can show her appreciation in a more satisfying way than ye can with me. They stepped back from each other, and then, slowly, both grinned. So we part, Farrell said, shaking his head. Half our wealth is yours, Elminster shrugged. I'll take only what I need for the road. Farrell sighed. So it's loot for me, and killing mage lords for you. Mayhap, Elminster said softly. If the gods are kind. Part 3 Priest 7. The One True Spell in ancient days, sorcerers sought to learn the one true spell that would give them power over all the world and understanding of all magic. Some said they'd found it, but such men were usually dismissed as crazed. I saw one of these crazed mages myself. He could ignore spells cast at him as if they did not exist, or work any magic himself by silent thought alone. I did not think he was mad, but at peace, driven by urges and vices no longer. He told me the one true spell was a woman, that her name was Mistra, and that her kisses were wonderful. Halifon Tharnstar, avowed of Mistra, tales told to a blind wizard, Year of the Wyvern. The night was warm and still. Elminster took a deep breath and counted out most of what Farl had insisted he take. He owed a debt, and besides, the other matter he'd meant to see to this night would probably kill him. Then it would be too late to pay any debts. When he was done, he was looking at a heap of coins, a hundred regals bright in the moonlight. In the sun, come morn, They'd blaze their true gold color, but he'd probably not be around to see them one way or another. Elminster shrugged. At least his life was his own again, and he was free to pursue any folly he desired. So, of course, he reflected wryly, here he was, bent on one last thiefly act. He slung the coins together in a sack, tight so they'd not clink, and set off over the rooftops in search of a certain bedchamber. The shutters were open to let in any breezes that might drift by, to cool a sleeping bridal couple whose furnishings failed by far to match those of the trumpet towers. Elminster had been delighted to hear of their betrothal, even if it would cost him most of the coins he'd worked for. He stole in over the sill like a purposeful shadow and grinned down at them. The bridal garter was exquisite, a little thing of lace and silk and ribbon. Impishly, Elminster reached down and stroked it. Take it as a trophy? But no, he was a thief no more. Shandaith stirred as she felt the light touch high on her thigh. Yet deep in dreams, she stretched out a hand to the familiar warm and hairy bulk of Hannibal, snoring as deep as any drunken tavern singer could. As Elminster smoothed her new bridal garter back into place where Hannibal had tied it on her hip, she smiled but didn't awaken. Elminster noted other gifts, too, a stout cudgel and a new apron lying on the carpet on Hannibal's side of the bed, and the hilt of a dagger protruding like a winking eye from beneath Shandaith's pillow. He laid his bridal gift carefully between them. It was a tight fit between the smooth flank and the hairy one, and it took all his thiefly skills to avoid a clink and rattle as he slid the coins into a smooth sweep of gleaming gold from end to end of the bed. When he'd crammed in all the regals he dared, there were still over a dozen left. He laid the last of his belated bridal gift gently on Shandaith's belly, and left hastily as the touch of cold metal made her stir in earnest. Saloon was riding high in the deep blue sky over Hestarl as Elminster stood on a rooftop, looking across the empty, silent street at the crumbling front of the disused Temple of Mistra. The place was dark and decaying, and from where he stood Elminster could see the massive lock on the door. 
The mage lords, it seemed, didn't want anyone in Hastarl worshipping the mistress of all magic but themselves, and they could do that in the safety and privacy of their own tower inside Athelgard. Yet they hadn't dared desecrate Mistress Temple. Perhaps their power was rooted in it, and striking here could shake their mastery of sorcery and their grip on the realm. Perhaps he could force Mistress' hand, just as she had forced his when she let his parents be slain. Or perhaps Elminster admitted to himself as he stared at the temple, he was just weary of doing nothing that mattered, wasting days on rooftops looking for a chance to steal this bauble or that. Wizards might not dare desecrate Mistress Temple, but Elminster would, tonight. The world, or at least Athelantar, would be a much better place without any magic at all. Destroying one temple, though, could hardly hope to do that, but perhaps it might bring down Mistress' curse on the city, so no wizards could work magic within its walk. Or perhaps the temple held some item of magic he could use against the wizards. Or perhaps it just held his death. Any result would be welcome. Elminster eyed the shabby peeling paint and the motionless stone bat things adorning both front corners of the roof. They clutched the tops of the temple's front pillars with many claws, and their beaks hung open hungrily. They did not glow under his mage sight, but perhaps the magical gargoyles Minstrel sang of didn't glow. The only magic he could see was lower down and visible to all. Faintly glowing letters over the doors spelled out the words, I am the one true spell. Elminster shook his head, sighed, and began to climb down from the rooftop. Revenge, it seemed, was a demanding business. He could see no spells on the lock, and it surrendered easily to his metal probes. Farl had taught him well. Elminster looked up and down the silent street one last time, and then eased the door open, stood for a few breaths in its shadow to let his eyes adjust to the darkness, and slipped inside, dagger ready. Dust and empty darkness. Elminster peered in all directions, but there didn't seem to be any furnishings in the Temple of Mistra, only stone pillars. Cautiously he stepped sideways until he was well away from the door, Traps were usually right in front of doors, and stepped forward. Something was not right about this place. Oh, I, he'd expected to feel watched, his skin creeping with the singing tension of slumbering spells waiting all around him. And that was here, all right. There was something else, though. Some... Of course, a place this big and empty should echo back the sounds he made. Yet there were no echoes. Elminster opened a belt pouch, took out one of the dried peas every thief carries to scatter and make pursuers trip, and cast it ahead of him into the darkness. He did not hear it land. El swallowed and took a cautious step forward. He was in an entry hall, separated from a great open chamber beyond a row of massive, smooth, curved stone pillars. Featureless cylinders, as far as he could tell, Nothing moved in the thick blankets of dust over the floor. Al cast a last look back at the door he'd drawn closed and then walked into the darkness. The great chamber was circular and reached up high overhead to unseen heights. It must go clear to the roof Elminster had looked at outside. There was a circular stone altar in the center of the room and balconies, three tiers of them, curving all around the vast open space. The chamber was dark, empty, and silent. And that was it. Nothing here to desecrate. No acolytes. The door behind him suddenly clattered open, and as men with torches came in, Elminster ran toward the back of the temple, seeking pillars to hide behind. Many men, armsmen, at least two patrols with spears in their hands. Spread out, said a cold voice, and search. No one dares enter a temple of Mistra just on a lark. The speaker strode forward, lifted a hand, and sketched some sort of salute or respectful gesture toward the altar. 
Then he said calmly, We shall have light. And at his words, though he cast no spell, the very stones around Elminster began to glow. All of the stone in the temple began to shine until a soft, pearly white radiance filled the room, revealing the young thief for everyone to see. In this case, everyone was more than a score of armsmen, advancing across the chamber with grim faces and ready spears. The man who'd spoken stood in their midst and said, Just a thief. Hold weapons. What if he runs, Lord? The robed man smiled and said, My magic will force him to walk where I want him to and nowhere else. He gestured, and Elminster felt a sudden tugging at his limbs, a tingling, numbing, trembling akin to what he'd felt on that terrible day in the meadow above Heldon long ago. His body was no longer his own. He found himself turning, sick despair rising inside, and walking toward the men. No, toward the altar, a bare circular block of stone with not even a rune to grace it. The armsmen raised their spears and ringed him in as he came. The law holds that those who desecrate temples be put to death, an old armsman growled. On the spot. Indeed, the robed man said, and smiled again. I, however, shall choose that spot. When this fool's on the altar, you may throw your spears at will. Fresh blood on Mistra's altar will allow me to work a magic I've long wanted to try. Elminster strode steadily on toward the altar, raging inwardly. He had been a fool to come here. This was it, then, his death, and an end to his futile fight against the mage lords. Sorry, father, mother. Elminster broke into a run and charged the altar, hoping he might somehow break free and knowing he could do nothing else. At least he could die trying to do something. The wizard merely smiled and crooked one finger. Elminster's rush became a smooth trot until he stood in front of the altar. The mage turned him about again until they stood facing each other. Then the wizard bowed. Greetings, thief. I am Lord Ildru, mage lord of Athalantar. You may speak. Who are you? Elminster found that he could move his jaws. As you said, mage lord, he responded coldly, a thief. The wizard raised an eyebrow. Why came you here this night? To speak with Mistra, Elminster said, surprising himself. Ildru's eyes narrowed. Why, are you a mage? No, Elminster spat. I am proud to say. I came to get Mistra's aid to cast down mage lords like you, or curse her if she refused. The wizard's brows shot up again. And just what made you think Mistra would aid you? Elminster swallowed and found he couldn't shrug or move anything except his mouth. The gods exist, he said slowly, and their power is real. I have need of that power. Oh? The traditional way, the wizard said pleasantly, is to study long and hard for most of a lifetime and abase oneself as an apprentice and risk life in trying spells one doesn't understand or in devising one's own new magics. What colossal arrogance to think Mistra would just give you something when you asked for it. The colossal arrogance in Athalantar, Elminster said softly, is held by mage lords. Your hold on this land is so tight that no other men in it have the luxury of colossal arrogance. There was a murmur somewhere among the ring of armsmen. Ildru glared around, and abrupt silence returned. Then the wizard said theatrically, I weary of your bitter words. Be still, unless you want to plead. Elminster felt himself being forced backward to clamber up onto the altar. No spears yet, the mage lord ordered. I must work a spell first to learn if this youth is all clever words and deluded dreams, or if he holds some secrets yet. The wizard raised his hands, cast a spell, and then peered narrowly at Elminster, frowning. No magic, he said as if to himself. 
and yet you have some link to sorcery, some minor ability to shape. I've not seen such before. He stepped forward. What are your powers? I have no magic, Elminster spat. I abhor magic and all that is done with it. If I freed you and studied what it is within you to see where your aptitude lies, would you be loyal to the stag throne? Forever. The mage's eyes narrowed at that proud, quick answer, and he added, And to the mage lords of Athalantar? Never. Elminster's shout echoed around the room, and the mage sighed again, watching the raging youth struggle vainly to spring down from the altar. Enough, he said in a bored voice. Kill him. He turned away, and Elminster saw a dozen armsmen, and probably more he couldn't see behind him, raise their spears, heft them, and take a pace or two back for a good throw. Forgive me, mother, father, Elminster said through trembling lips. I... I tried to be a true prince. The mage lord whirled about. What? And then the spears were in the air, and Elminster glared into the wizard's eyes and hissed, I curse the Ildru of the mage lords with my death and the... He broke off in confusion. He hadn't expected to get this far in his curse, and he could see the wizard had raised his hands to weave some spell, crying out, Wait! Stop! No spears! He could also see the armsmen staring at him as if he were a dragon, a purple dragon with three heads and a maiden's body at that. And the spears! They hung in the air, motionless, surrounded by pearly radiance. Elminster found he could move and whirled around. There were spears on all sides, aye, a deadly ring of points leaping in to transfix him, but they all hung motionless in the air. And by the look on the wizard's face, it was none of his doing. Elminster flung himself flat before the strange magic faded away. His move brought his face down low against the altar top in time to see two floating eyes fade away and a flame leap up from the bare stone. Armsmen shouted and backed away, and Elminster heard the mage lord cry out in astonishment. The flame climbed, crackling, and then from it bolts of flame roared out, consuming the spears where they hung. The spears became spars of flame that curled slowly and faded into smoke. Elminster watched open-mouthed. A golden radiance was stealing outward from the altar now, washing over him. Armsmen shouted in real fear and backed away. Elminster saw them turn and reach for blades and try to run, but they seemed to be shimmering and moving slowly as if they were figures drifting in a dream. Slowly and more slowly still the armsmen shifted as flames that did not burn them sprang up and surrounded their bodies. Then they stood still and silent, frozen and unseeing, frozen in flames. Elminster spun around to look at the mage lord. The wizard stood as still as the rest, golden flames flickering before his staring eyes. His mouth was open, and his hands raised in the gestures of a spell, but he moved not. What had befallen? The flame pulsed and twisted. Elminster whirled back to face its changing flickering, and it shaped itself into someone, someone tall and dark-robed and shapely, who strolled calmly over to stand by the brazier, a human woman, a sorceress? Eyes of molten gold met his, and little flames danced in them. Hail, Elminster Amar, Prince of Athalantar. Elminster took a pace back, shocked. No, he'd never seen this great lady before, or anyone so beautiful. He swallowed. Who are ye? One who has been watching you for years, hoping to see great things, came the reply. Elminster swallowed again. The lady's eyes held dark depths of mystery, and her voice a musical lilt. She smiled and raised an empty hand, and suddenly she held a metal scepter. Lights pulsed and winked down its length. Elminster had never seen anything of the like before but it blazed with blue mage fire in his gaze, 
and its very look shouted that it held power. With this, the lady said quietly, you can destroy all your foes here at once. Merely will it and speak the word graven on the grip. She released the scepter, which rose a little, and then drifted smoothly through the air toward Elminster. He watched it come, eyes narrow, then snatched it out of the air. Silent power shuddered in his grasp. Elminster felt it crackle and roil around in him, and his face brightened. He raised it, turning to face the motionless armsman, feeling a fierce exultation rising in him. The lady watched him. He stood still for a long moment, then carefully bent and set the scepter down on the stone floor at his feet. Nay, he said, lifting his eyes to meet hers. "'Twould not be right to use magic against men who are helpless. That's just what I'm fighting against, lady. Oh? She raised her head to stare at him in sudden challenge. Are you afraid of it? Elminster shrugged. A little? He watched her steadily. More afraid of what I'd do wrongly. Thy scepter burns with power. Such magic could do much ill if used carelessly. I'd rather not see the realms laid waste by mine own hand. He shook his head. Wielding a little power can be pleasure. No one should have too much. What is too much? For me, lady, anything. I hate magic. A mage slew my parents on a whim, it seems, or for an afternoon's entertainment. He destroyed a village in less time than it takes me to tell ye what befell. No man should be able to do that. Is magic then evil? Yes, Elminster snapped, then looked upon her beauty and said, Or perhaps not, but its power twists men to indulge evil. Ah, she replied, is a sword evil? Nay, lady but dangerous. Not all folk should have them to hand. Oh, who is to stop tyrants and mage lords, then? Elminster frowned angrily. Ye seek to trick me with clever words, lady. Nay, came the soft reply. I seek to make you think before you offer your own clever words and quick, sure judgments. I ask again, is a sword evil? Nay, Elminster said, for a sword cannot think. The lady nodded. Is a plow evil? Nay, Elminster replied, raising an eyebrow. What mean ye? If a blade is not evil, but may be used for evil, is not this scepter the same? Elminster frowned and shook his head slightly, but did not reply. Those eyes of light held his steadily. What if I offered this scepter to a wizard, an innocent apprentice in some other land, not a mage lord? What would you say to that? Elminster felt anger rising in him. Was everyone who worked sorcery given to fencing with clever words? Why did they always toy with him as if he were a child? or a beast to be slain or transformed with but a passing thought. I would say against it, lady. No one should use such a thing without knowing first how to use it, and knowing its work well enough to realize what changes it will work in Faroon. Sober words for one so young. Most youths and most mages are so full of whim and pride that they'll dare anything. Her words calmed him a little. At least she listened and did not dismiss him out of hand. Who was she? Did Mistra bind wizards to guard every one of her temples? Elminster shook his head again. I am a thief, lady, in a city ruled by cruel wizards. Whim and pride are luxuries only rich fools can afford. If I want to indulge in them, I must needs do it by night, in bedchambers or on rooftops. He smiled thinly. 
thieves, and indeed farmers, beggars, and folk who own only a small shop or hand trade, methinks, must keep themselves under rather more control by day, or soon perish. What would you do? the sorceress asked curiously, eyes very bright. If you could work magic and become a wizard as strong as those who dwell here. I'd use my spells to drive all the wizards out of Athelantar so folk could be free. I'd set a few other things right, too, and then renounce magic forever. For you hate magic, the lady said softly. What if you did not, and someone gave you the power and told you that it must be used, and you must be a wizard? What then? I'd try to be a good one, Elminster replied, shrugging again. Did temple wizards just talk to every intruder all the night through? Still, it felt good to speak openly at last to someone who listened and seemed to understand but not judge. Would you make yourself king? Elminster shook his head. I'd not be a good one, he said. I have not the patience. He smiled suddenly and added, Yet if I found a man or a maid who'd wear the crown well, I'd stand behind him or her. That, I think, is the true work of a wizard, to make life in the lands he dwells in good for all who dwell there. Her smile, then, was dazzling. Elminster felt sudden power in the air around him. His hair crackled, and his skin tingled. Will you kneel to me? the sorceress asked, striding nearer. Elminster swallowed, mouth suddenly dry. She was very beautiful, and yet somehow terrifying, her eyes and hair alight with power like flame waiting to burst forth. Trembling, Elminster held his ground and asked, Lady, what is thy name? Who are ye? I am Mistra, came a voice that crashed around him like a mighty wave smashing on rocks. Its echoes rolled around the chamber. I am the Lady of Might and the Mistress of Magic. I am Power Incarnate. Wherever magic is worked, there am I. From the cold poles of Toril to its hottest jungles, whatever the hand or claw or will that works the sorcery, behold me and fear me. Yet behold me and love me, as all who deal with me in honesty do. This world is my domain. I am magic, mightiest among all those men worship. I am the one true spell at the heart of all spells. There is no other. Echoes rolled away. Elminster felt the very pillars of the temple shaking around him. He wavered in awe, like a man struggling in a high wind, but kept his feet. Silence fell, and their eyes met. Golden flames burned in her gaze. Elminster felt as if he were burning inside. Hot fire raced along his veins, pain rising in him like an angry red wave. Man the goddess said, in an awful whisper. Do you defy me? Elminster shook his head. I came here to curse thee, or desecrate thy holy place, or demand aid from thee. But now, no. I wish ye hadn't let the mage lords slay my parents and ruin my realm, and I would know why but I have no wish to defy ye. What do you feel instead? Elminster sighed. Somehow he felt he had to speak the truth since her first words to him, and it was still so. I fear ye, and... He was silent for a time, and then what might have been a smile touched his lips, and he went on. I think I could learn to love ye. Mistra was very close to him now, and her eyes were dark pools of mystery. 
She smiled, and suddenly Elminster felt cool and refreshed, at ease. I let mages use spells freely, so that all beings who use magic may escape tyranny. But from that freedom comes such as the mage lords in this land, she said. If you would overthrow them, why not become a mage yourself? It is but a tool in your hand, and it seems to fit your hand better than many I have seen grasping at it. Elminster took a pace back, lifting his hands in an unconscious warding gesture. Mistra halted, eyes suddenly stern. I ask you again, will you kneel to me? Eyes locked on hers, he knelt slowly. Lady, I confess I am awed, he said slowly. But if I serve thee, I'd rather do it with my eyes open. Mistra laughed, eyes sparkling. Ah! but it is long since I've met such a one as you. Then her face was again solemn, and her voice low. Extend your hand, freely and in trust, or go unharmed. Choose. Elminster extended his hand without hesitation. Mistress smiled and touched it. Fire consumed him, spun him down helplessly into nothing and beyond, and whirled him away into golden depths as a thousand lightning bolts struck through his heart and roared back out of him as consuming flame. Elminster screamed, or tried to, as he was flung away into many-hued madness, a place of blinding light and blazing pain. He roared, and when darkness rushed up to meet him, he plunged headlong into it, striking it as if it were a stone wall, dashed against it. He was gone. It was the cold again that awakened him. Elminster sat up, half expecting to see the burial ground slumbering around him, and found instead the temple still and dark. Power yet flowed in it, though, in a silent, invisible web of stirrings all around him, from the bare altar to the armsman and the mage lord, who stood motionless all around the circular chancel. Now he could feel magic as well as see it. Awed, Elminster looked all around. He was naked. Everything had been burned away to lie in ashes around him, except for the lion sword, which lay beside him, unchanged from its ruined state. Taking it up with a smile, the mistress of magic knew his duty, too, it seemed. He got to his feet. The blue glow of magic was everywhere in this vast chamber, but brightest of all behind him. He turned and beheld the altar. Mistra was gone, and her scepter with her. But as he looked, words flamed out brightly on the altar. He hurried forward to read them. Teach thyself magic and see the realms. You will know when to come back to Athalantar. Worship me always with that keen mind and that lack of pride, and you will please me well. Serve me first by touching my altar. As he finished reading, the words faded. When the altar was bare and dark again, he reached forward tentatively, paused in sudden trembling fear, and then laid a hand firmly on the cold stone. He thought he heard a faint chuckle somewhere nearby, and then darkness claimed him again. 8. To Serve Mistra did I ever tell thee how I first came to serve Mistra? No? Ye won't believe a word of it, nay the less. The way of the lady seems strange to most men, but then most men are sane. Well, more or less. Sundral Morthen, the way of a wizard, year of shining shards.
The world was drifting white mists. Elminster shook his head to be free of them and heard a bird calling. A bird? In the depths of the dark, empty temple? He shook his head again and realized with a start that his bare feet stood on moss and earth, not cold stone. Where was he? Al found himself struggling now to break free of the mists, clouds in his mind, not the world around. Shaking his head, he heard bird calls again, and a soft rustling, a sound he remembered from long ago held in, breezes blowing through leaves. He was in a forest somewhere. As the last of the mists fell away, Al looked around and caught his breath. He stood in the heart of a deep wood, with dusk woods and shadow tops and blue leaf trees standing all crowded together around him. The ground beneath them, a dim and mushroom studded place stretching off into gloomy rolling distances. He stood in sunlight on a little knoll where several old giants of the forest had toppled, leaving a clearing into which the sun could reach. It was a small patch of sunlit moss where a large flat stone lay, and beyond it, a tiny crystal clear pool. The lion sword lay on the stone. Mistress Magic must have brought it here with him. Elminster bent forward to take it up. There was an unfamiliar swaying sensation at his chest as he knelt. Frowning, he looked down and saw the breasts and the smooth curves of a maid. Elminster stared down at himself in astonishment and ran a wondering hand over his body. It was solid and real. He looked wildly around, but he was alone. Mistra had turned him into a woman. Clutching the reassuring familiar hilt of the lion sword, El crawled forward across the rock until he could stare down into the placid waters of the pool. He studied his reflection there, seeing his own sharp nose and black hair, but a rather softer face with a pert mouth, now frowning in consternation, a long neck and below it, a slim-hipped, rather bony woman. He was Elminster no more. As he stared down, something seemed to grow in the depths of the pool, something blue-white and leaping, a flame. El sat back. A flame was burning under the water, a flame with nothing to feed on, a flame that was rising and becoming golden. Mistra, he reached out an eager hand to touch the flame as it broke the surface, never thinking that it might destroy him until it was too late and his slim fingers were already feeling coolness. A voice seemed to speak in his mind. Elminster becomes Elmara to see the world through the eyes of a woman. Learn how magic is a part of all things and a living force in itself, and pray to me by kindling flame. You will find a teacher in this forest. The flame faded, and Elminster shivered. He knew that voice. He looked down again in wonder. Now he was, Elmara, she said aloud, and repeated it, her voice more musical than before. She shook her head, suddenly recalling a knight in Hastarl bought with stolen coins at Farl's urging. She remembered hot kisses and smooth, cool shoulders sliding soft and curved under his fingers, which wandered with tentative awe. If he went into such a room now, he'd, she'd, be on the other end of the lovemaking. Hmm. So this was Mistress' first trick. Almara twisted her lips wryly, shivered again, and then drew a deep breath, Elminster, the upstart prince whose failed battles had made him known to at least two mage lords, was gone, at least for now, perhaps forever. His cause, she vowed, would never die, but end fulfilled. That might take years, though, and for now, Almara murmured. So now what? A breeze rustled the leaves again in answer. Shrugging, she rose and walked all over the little knoll, noting that her stride was subtly different, shorter and swaying from side to side more, but there was nothing else to be found except moss and dead leaves. She was alone and nude, 
the occasional twig sharp under her bare feet. What to do? There was no food here and no shelter. The sun already felt hot on her head and shoulders. She'd best get into the shade. Mistress' voice had said she'd find a tutor in the forest, but she was reluctant to leave the pool, perhaps her only link to the goddess. But no, Mistra had said that El should pray to her by kindling flame, and there was not enough wood or leaves on this knoll to do that. Mistra had also said she'd find a tutor, and that implied she'd have to look for one. Elmara sighed, juggled the lion sword thoughtfully, and squinted up at the sun. This forest looked like the high forest above Helden. If this was the high forest, going south would bring her to its edge, and perhaps food, if she couldn't find anything to eat among the trees, and to some idea of where exactly she was. The ground under the trees was dark and rolling, with sharp slopes and little gullies everywhere. If she left this knoll, she doubted she could ever find it again. That thought made her remember the pool, and she knelt and drank deeply, not knowing when she'd next see water. Right, then. Time waited on no man, or woman, she reminded herself wryly, wondering how long it would take to get used to this. As she set off down into the trees, she did not look back, and so didn't see the pair of floating eyes that appeared above the pool, watched her go, and seemed to nod approvingly. She walked all day, and her feet were cut to ribbons. She winced as she went and left a bloody trail. She'd have to get into a tree before dark, or some prowling forest cat or wolf would follow her trail. If it bit her throat, she'd be dead before she could wake. Almara looked around uneasily. The endless forest seemed dark and menacing now as the small glimpses of sunlight turned amber with sunset, and twilight came creeping. Should she light a fire? It might attract beasts that could eat her, but yes, only a little one, and let it die out before she slept. A flame to pray to Mistra. She'd do this every night, she vowed, beginning now. She bent down and gathered a dry tangle of twigs from under a large leaf and spread them on a nearby rock. Then she stopped in confusion. How could she make them burn? With a flint eye, but she had no flint nor steel. A moment later, she smote her forehead and made a disgusted sound. Of course she did. The lion sword. She raised it, shaking her head at her slow wits, and rang it off the rock. A spark jumped. Yes, this was the way. She set about belaboring the edge of the rock with the stoutest part of the blade, the unsharpened length just below the hilt, and pushed kindling in around where she struck to catch any spark. The ringing sounds she made echoed a long way under the trees, and sparks jumped and winked where she didn't want them, disdaining her dry kindling. Frustration and then anger rose in her. Could she do nothing right? I'm trying, Mistra, she snarled, but... She broke off as the white glow arose at the back of her mind. Use her mind to call up fire? She'd never done more than nudge things a trifle, or slow falls a bit, or staunch bleeding. Could she? Well, why not try? She bent her gaze on the sword and summoned up the white fire within, building it with her anger until it blazed up and filled her mind. Then she brought the sword crashing down on the rock. A spark leaped up and seemed to grow, expanding into a little ball of light before it arced back down and faded away. Elle's eyes widened. She stared down where the spark had been, then shrugged and began the process of building the fire in her mind again. This time, the spark glowed white, expanded, and Elmara set her teeth and willed it to drift sideways and keep blazing, and it settled down into the kindling. A curl of smoke drifted up. El watched and grinned in sudden exultation. She blew ever so gently at the kindling, and then shifted some twigs and a leaf so they'd catch. If only the god smiled. Yes, a tiny flame rose, a tongue of faint amber that licked at the leaf and spread brown over it as it fed, growing higher. El trembled, suddenly aware that a painful throbbing was beginning in her head, licked her lips, and said over the flame, 
My thanks, great Mistra. I shall try to learn and serve thee well. The flame soared suddenly, almost burning her nose, and then winked out, gone as if it had never been. Elmara stared at where it wasn't, then sat back, holding her suddenly splitting head. No normal flame would behave that way. Mistra must have heard her. She knelt there for a few breaths, hoping for some sign or word from the goddess, but there was nothing but darkness under the trees and a faint whiff of wood smoke. But then why should she expect anything more? She'd never seen Mistra in all her life before last night, and there were other folk and other doings in Faroon besides Elminster of Athelantar. Elmara, she corrected herself absently. What did gods spend their days at, anyway? And then a booted foot came down softly on the ground she was staring at, treading firmly on the lion sword. She gasped and looked up. Proud eyes, elven eyes, stared down at her, and their gaze was not friendly. A hand was extended toward her, and there was a sudden glow of light from his palm. The bright radiance grew, stretching out straight down at her, until the tip of a sword of light was in front of her chin. Tell me, a light, high voice said calmly, why should I let you live? Delsaran sniffed suddenly and raised his head. Fire! The tree he'd been shaping fell back limply under his hands as his magic faltered. Quick anger turned the tips of his ears red. Here, in the very heart of the old trees. Yes, Berithrin agreed, but laid a restraining hand on his friend's arm. But a small one, Terry. He raised his other hand, sketched a circle in the air with two fingers, and spoke a soft word. A moment later, an intent face appeared in the air between them, the face of a human woman. Delsaran hissed, but said no more as they heard the woman speak. My thanks, great Mistra. I shall try to learn and serve thee well. The flame soared then, and their spell vision exploded into a tiny twinkling of blue sparks. Delsaran's jaw dropped. The goddess heard her, he said in grudging disbelief. Beorthrin nodded. This must be the one the lady said would come. He rose a silent shadow in the gathering night gloom, and said, I shall guide her, as I promised. Leave us be, as you promised. Delsaran nodded slowly. The lady grant us success. His lips twisted wryly. All three. Beorthrin laid a silent hand on his shoulder, then was gone. Delsaran stared unseeing at the tree he'd been shaping, and then shook his head. Humans had slain his parents, and their axes had felled the trees he'd first played in. Why did the lady have to send a human? Didn't she want the people to be guided in learning her service and true mastery of magic? I guess she thinks elves are wise enough to guide themselves, he said aloud, smiled almost wistfully, and got to his feet. Mister had never spoken to him. He shrugged, set his hand reassuringly on the tree for a moment, and then slipped away into the night. Elmara stared up at the sword. There is no special reason, she said at last. Mistra brought me here, and... She gestured down at herself, and a sudden blush stole across her face. Changed me thus. I mean no harm to you or this place. The elf regarded her gravely for a moment and said, Yet there is the will in you to do great harm to many folk. Elle stared into his eyes and found her throat suddenly dry. She swallowed and said, I live to avenge my slain parents. My foes are the mage lords of Athalantar. The elf stood silent, as still and dark as the trees around. The sword of light did not waver. He seemed to be awaiting more words. Elmara shrugged. To destroy them, I must master magic or find some ways to destroy theirs. I met with Mistra. She said I'd find a tutor here. Do ye know of a wizard or a priest of Mistra in this wood? The sword vanished. Blinking in the sudden darkness, El heard that light voice say simply, Yes. 
Silence followed. Afraid of being left alone in the night in this endless forest, El asked quickly, Will ye guide me to that person? To her own astonishment, her voice quavered. You have found that person, the elf replied with an undertone that might have been satisfaction or quiet amusement. Give me your name. El... Elmara, she answered, and something made her add, I was Elminster until this morn. The elf nodded. Barithrin, he replied. I was Brayer to the last human who knew me. Who was that? Al asked, suddenly curious. Those grave eyes flickered. A lady mage, dead these three hundred summers. Al looked down. Oh. I'm not over fond of questions you'll find, the elf added. Look and listen to learn. That is the elven way. You humans have so much less time and always gabble questions and then rush off to do things without waiting for or truly understanding the answers. I hope to curb that in you, just a little. He leaned forward and added, Now lie back. L looked up at him and then did so, wondering what would come next. Unconsciously, she covered her breasts and loins with her hands. The elf seemed to smile. I've seen maids before, and all of you already. He dropped silently into a crouch and said, Give me your foot. El looked at him in wonder, and then raised her left foot. The elf cupped it. His touch was feather soft, and the pain slowly ebbed away. El looked at him in wonder. The other? He said simply. She let her heeled foot fall and extended the other to him. Again the pain fled. You've given the forest blood, he said, which satisfies a ritual some find unpleasant. His grip on her heel became stronger, and he made a surprised sound and let her foot fall. A moment later, he moved like soundless liquid or a smooth flowing shadow. The elf was kneeling by her head. Allow me he said, and added, Lie still. Elmara felt his fingers touch her lightly over each eye and linger there, and slowly, very slowly, the ache in her head subsided, the pain stealing away. With it went all her weariness, and she was suddenly alert, eager, and awake. What? My thanks, sir. What did you do? Several things. I used simple magic, what you'll need to learn first, then I winced at being called Sir, and waited patiently to be called Brayer, and seen as a person, not some sort of magic-wielding monster. The words were lightly spoken beside her ear, but Elmara felt her answer was very important. She raised her head slowly to find those eyes staring into hers from only a finger's length away. Please forgive me, Brayer. Will ye be my friend? Impulsively, she leaned forward and kissed the face she could barely see. The elf's eyes blinked into hers as her lips touched a sharp-boned nose. Brayer did not pull away. His lips did not meet hers, but a moment later Elmara felt soft fingers stroke the length of her chin. That's better, daughter of a prince. Now sleep. El was falling down down into a void of warm darkness, before she even had time to wonder how Brayer knew his, her father had been a prince. Perhaps she managed to think as whispering mists rose in her mind. All Faroon knew it. You began as all younglings do, awed by magic. Then you learned to fear it and hate those who wielded it. After a time you saw its usefulness as a weapon too powerful to ignore. Mastering it or finding a shield against it then became a necessity. Brayer fell silent and leaned forward, watching intently as blue magefire danced at the tips of Elmara's fingers. He gestured, and obediently she made the fire move up and down each finger in turn, racing along her tingling skin. You wonder not why I waste so much of your brief life with a child's playing about with magic, Brayer said flatly. It's not to make you familiar with it. You are that already. It's to make you love magic for itself, not for what you can do with it. Why, 
Elmara asked in the elven manner, reflected fire dancing in her eyes as her gaze met his. Should a man or a maid love magic? Her teacher remained silent, as he did all too often for her liking. They looked into each other's eyes until finally she added, I would think that leads to bent men who wall themselves up in little rooms and become crabbed and crazed, chasing some elusive spell or detail of magecraft, and wasting their lives away. In some it does, Brayer agreed. But love of magic is more necessary for those who worship Mistra, priests of the goddess, if you will, though most see no difference between such folk and mages, than it is for wizards. One must love magic to properly revere magic. Almara frowned a little. There were a few gray hairs in her long, unruly black mane now. She studied magic for two winters through at Brer's side, praying to Mistra each night, without reply. Hastarl and her days as a thief seemed almost a dream to her now, but she could still remember the faces of the mage lords she'd seen. Some folk worship out of fear. Is their respect any the less? The elf nodded. It is, he said simply, even if they do not know it. He rose, as smooth and silent as ever. Now put away that fire and come and help me find even feast. He strode away through the trees, knowing she'd follow. Elmara rose, smiled a little, and did so. They spent their days thus talking while she practiced magic under his direction, and then foraging in the forest for food. Once the elf had shown her how to take the shape of a wolf, then bounded off to run down a stag with her stumbling along behind. In all their days together, she'd never seen him do anything but guide her, though he left her side every nightfall and did not return until dawn. He always chose the spot where she slept, and her mage sight told her he cast some sort of magical ring about her. Brayer never seemed tired, or dirty, or less than patient. His garb never changed, and there was never a day when he did not come to her. She saw no other elves or anyone else, though he'd once confirmed they were somewhere in the high forest, supposedly home to the greatest kingdom of elves in all Faroon. On her first morning in the forest, He'd brought her a rough gown of animal hide, glossy high boots of unexpected quality, a thong for tying the lion sword around her neck, she kept it wrapped in a skin to avoid cutting her breast, and a trowel for digging her own privy holes. To clean herself, she scrubbed with leaves and moss and washed in the little pools and rivulets that seemed to be everywhere in the endless forest. Then she commented that one seemed to find water unexpectedly around every third or fourth hillock or gully. Brayer had nodded and replied, Like magic. That memory came to Elmara suddenly. She looked ahead at the elf gliding among the trees like a silent shadow and suddenly scrambled to catch up with them. As always, when she hurried, twigs cracked and leaves rustled under her feet. Brayer turned and frowned at her. She matched his frown and asked the question that had risen in her. Brayer, why do elves love magic? For a fleeting moment, a grin of exultation washed across his face. Then it was gone, and his face held its usual expression of calm, open interest. Yet El knew she'd seen that look of delight, and her heart lifted. The elf's next words sent it soaring. Ah, now you begin to think and to ask the right questions. I can begin teaching you. He turned and walked on. Begin teaching me, Elmara asked his back indignantly. So just what have ye been doing these past two seasons? Wasting much time, he told the trees ahead calmly, and her heart came crashing down. Tears welled up in her and burst forth. Elmara sank down on her knees and wept. She cried a long time, lonely and lost and feeling worthless, and when the tears were all gone, she finally sat up wearily and looked all around. She was alone. Brayer, she cried. Brayer, where are you? Her shout echoed back at her from the trees, but there came no reply. She sank down again and whispered, Mistra, aid me. Mistra, 
Help me. It was growing dark. Elmara looked wildly in all directions. She was in a part of the forest they'd never walked in before. With sudden urgency, she called forth Magefire and held up her blazing hand like a lantern. The trees around seemed to rustle and stir for a moment, but then a tense, watchful stillness fell. Brayer, she said into the darkness. Please, come back. A tree nearby wavered and bowed, and then stepped forward. It was Berithrin, looking sad. Forgive me, Elmara. Two running steps later, Elmara crashed into him and threw her arms around him, sobbing. Where did you go? Oh, Brayer, what did I do? I am sorry, lady. I did not mean my words as a judgment. The elf held her gently but firmly, rocking her slightly from side to side as if she were a small child to be soothed. With infinite tenderness, his hands stroked her long, tangled hair. Elmara pulled her head back, tears bright on her cheeks. But ye went away. You seemed to need a time to grieve, a release, the elf said softly. It seemed churlish to smother what you felt. More than that, sometimes things must be faced and fought alone. He took hold of her shoulders and gently pushed her away until they stood facing each other. Then he smiled and raised a hand, and it suddenly held a steaming bowl. A heavenly scent of cooked fowl swirled around them both. Care to dine? Almara laughed weakly and nodded. Brayer whirled his other hand, and out of nowhere a silver goblet appeared in it. He handed it to her with a flourish. When Al took it, Brayer spun his hand grandly again, and this time two ornate forks and dining knives appeared. He gestured for her to sit. Elmara discovered she was ravenous. The forest bustards had been cooked in a mushroom sauce and were delicious, and the goblet proved to be full of the best mint wine, incredibly clear and heady. She devoured everything. Brayer smiled and shook his head more than once as he watched. When she was done, another flourish of the elf's hand produced a bowl of warmed vinegar water and a fine linen cloth for Elmara to wash her face and hands with. As she wiped grease from her chin, she saw his grave expression had returned. I ask again, Elmara, do you forgive me? I have wronged you. Forgive? Of course. El stretched forth her newly cleaned hand to squeeze one of his. Brayer looked down at her hand on his, and then back up at her. I did to you what we of the forest consider a very bad thing. I misjudged you. I did not mean to upset you, nor make it worse by leaving you to your grief. Do you recall just what was said between us? Elmara stared at him. Ye said ye'd wasted much time these past two seasons, and only now could begin to teach me. Brayer nodded. What question did you ask to make me say so? El wrinkled her brow, and then said slowly, I asked you why elves love magic. Brayer nodded. Yes. He waved a hand. All the dinner things vanished, and a vivid ring of blue mage fire raced into being around them. He settled himself cross-legged and asked, Do you feel up to talking the night through? El frowned. Of course. Why? There are some things you should know, and at last are ready to hear. Almara met his grave eyes and leaned forward. Speak then, she whispered eagerly. Brayer smiled. To answer one of your questions directly for once, we of the people love magic because we love life. Magic is the life energy of Faroon, lass, gathered in its raw form and used to power specific effects by those who know us. Elves, and the stout folk, too, deep in the rocks beneath us, live close to the land, part of it, linked to it, and in balance with it. We grow no more numerous than the land will bear and shape our lives to what the land will support. Forgive me, but humans are different. Elmara nodded and waved at him to continue. Brayer met his eyes with his own and said steadily, Like orcs, Humans know best how to do four things. Breed too rapidly, 
covet everything around them, destroy anything and everything that stands in the way of any of their desires, and dominate what they can't or won't bother to destroy. Elmara stared at him. Her face had paled, but she nodded slowly and again gestured for him to continue. Harsh words, I know, said the elf gently, but that is what your kin mean to us. Men seek to change Faroon around them to suit their own desires. When we, or anything else, stand in their way, they cut us down. Men are quick and clever. I'll give them that, and seem to stumble on new ideas and ways more often and more swiftly than any other people. But to us, and to the land, they are a creeping danger, a creeping rot that eats away at the forest and every other untouched part of the realm, and at us with it. You are the first of your race to be tolerated here in the depths of the wood for a very long time, and there are some among my folk who would rather you were safely dead, your flesh feeding the trees. Elmara stared at him silently, face white and eyes very dark. Brayer smiled slightly and added, Death is a goal too few of your race strive for, but one more laudable than many they do pursue. Elmara let out a long, shuddering breath and asked, Why then do you tolerate me here? The elf reached out a hand slowly and tentatively, and as Elmara watched in wonder, he squeezed one of her hands just as she had done to him earlier. Out of simple respect for the lady, I undertook to guide you, he said, and to turn you into ways that could do us the least damage down the years if the gods willed that you should live. His smile broadened. I've come to know you and respect you. I know your life's tale, Elminster Almar, Prince of Athalantar. I know what you hope to do, and it would be mere prudence to aid one dedicated to fighting our most powerful and nearest foes, the Mage Lords. Your character, especially your strength in setting aside your hatred of magic long enough to agree to serve the lady, and in clinging to sanity and dignity when she made you a woman without warning, have made my task more than a duty and prudence. You have made it a pleasure." Elmara swallowed, feeling fresh tears well up and run down her cheeks. Ye, ye are the kindest and most patient person I've ever known, she whispered. Please forgive me for my tears earlier. Brayer patted her hand. The fault was mine. To answer the question that has just occurred to you, Mistra made you a maid both to hide you from the mage lords and to make you able to feel the link between magic, the land, and life, women are able to feel it better than men. In the days ahead, I can show you how to feel and work with that link. Ye can read my thoughts? Elmara cried, drawing back from him sharply. Then why by all the gods didn't ye just tell me what I needed to know? Brayer shook his head. I can only read thoughts when they're charged with strong emotion and when I'm very close by. More than that, few folk can truly learn by having every idle thought answered in an instant. They don't bother to think about or remember anything, but merely come to rely on the one answering them for all wisdom and direction. Elmara frowned, nodding very slowly. Aye, she said softly, you're right. Brayer nodded. I know. It's the curse of my race. Elmara looked at him for a moment, and then whooped with laughter. After a few helpless breaths of mirth, she broke off at a sound she'd never heard before, a deep, dry sound. Berithrin of the people was chuckling. Dawn was stealing through the trees when Brayer said, Too tired to go on? Elmara was stiff with sitting and swayed with weariness, but she whispered fiercely, No, I have to know. Say on. Brayer inclined his head in salute and said, No, then, the high forest is dying, little by little, year by year, under the axes of men and the spells of mage lords. 
They know our power, and being insecure in their own, feel they can only win the safety of their realm by destroying us. He waved one hand in a slow arc at the silent trees around them. Our power is rooted in the shiftings of the seasons. It is drawn from the vitality and endurance of the land, and it is not a thing of flashing battle spells and destruction. The mage lords know this and how to force us to fight in ways and places where they know they can defeat us, so we often dare not fight them openly, and they know that too. I've lost many friends who would not admit the mage lord's power rivaled or overmatched our own. Brayer sighed and continued. You, and others like you, we can aid in your own battles against them, and we will. So long as you respect the land and live with it, our ways lie together, and our battle shall too. When you need aid against the mage lords and call to us, we shall come. This we swear. A moment later, half a dozen trees around them shifted and stepped forward, and his words were echoed by a fierce chorus. This we swear. Elmara stared around at all of the solemn elven eyes, swallowed, and bowed her head. And I in turn swear not to work against thee or the land. Show me how to do this, please. The elves bowed in return and melted away again into the forest. El swallowed. Are they always here as trees around us? Brayer smiled. No. You happened to pause and weep in a special place. El gave him a fierce expression, but it slid into a smile and a weary shake of her head. I am honored, and understand your people enough now not to step wrongly with each stride. She yawned helplessly and added, I think I'm more than ready to sleep now, too. Promise to show me, finally, some earth-shaking spells in the days ahead? Berithrin smiled. I promise. He reached out and stroked her cheek, and as his spell sent her instantly to sleep, caught her shoulder and lowered her tenderly to the mossy ground. Then he settled down beside her and stroked her cheek again. In her little time left in the forest, he would keep careful watch over this weapon against the mage lords. More than that, he would keep careful watch over his precious friend. 9. THE WAY OF A MAGE The way of a mage is a dark and lonely one. This is why so many wizards fall early into the darkness of the grave, or later into the endless twilight of undeath. Such bright prospects are why the road to mastery of magecraft is always such a crowded one. Jalivar Thurun Trail Tales of the North, Year of the Sundered Shields A flame was suddenly dancing above the rock, in air that had been empty a moment before. Elmara caught her breath. Mistra? she asked, and the flame seemed to brighten for a moment in response, but then it faded away into nothingness, and there was no other reply. Elmara sighed and knelt beside the pool. I hoped for something more. A little less pride, lass, Brayer murmured, touching her elbow. Tis more than most of my folk ever see of the lady. She looked at him curiously. Just how many of the people worship Mistra? Not many. We have our own gods, and most of us have always preferred to turn our back on the rest of the world and all its unpleasantness and keep to the old ways. The problem is that the rest of the world always seems to reach out and thrust blades in our backsides while we're trying to ignore it. Al grinned at his words, despite their tragic meaning. Backsides? I never thought to hear an elf say that. Brayer's mouth crooked. I never thought to see a human hear an elf say it if it comes to that. Do you still think of us as unearthly, tall, and thin, noble creatures gliding around above it all? I... I... I suppose I do. The elf shook his head. We have fooled you with the rest, then. 
We're as earthly and as untidy as the forest. We are the forest, lass. Try not to forget that as you walk out into the world of men. Walk out? Elmara frowned at him. Why do you say that? I can't help but read your thoughts, lady. You've been happier here than ever before in your short life. But you know you've learned all you can here that'll make of yourself a better blade against the mage lords, and you grow restless to move on. He held up a hand as she made a small sound of protest and went on. Nay, lass, I can see it in you and hear it in you, and for you it is right. You can never be free, never be yourself, until your parents have been avenged and you've set Athalantar back to what you think it should be. You're driven by this, and it's a burden no one in Faroon can lift but you, by doing the deeds you've set yourself. He smiled wryly. You didn't want to leave Faro, and now you don't want to leave me. Are you sure you shouldn't stay a woman the rest of your days? Elmara made a face and added softly, I didn't know I had a choice. Not yet, perhaps, but you will. When you start to become a realm-shattering archmage, thus far you've become familiar with magic and by the grace of Mistra call up and shape what slumbers in the land around. Did you truly think this prayer now and all the others each night were wasted? I... You've begun to fear so, yes. I'm telling you differently, Brayer said, almost sternly, and stood up in a single smooth movement. He reached down a hand to assist her to rise and added, I'll miss you, but I won't be sad or angry. Tis time for you to move on. You'll return when you must. My task hasn't been to teach you spells that'll blast mage lords and their dragon steeds out of the sky but to teach you familiarity with magic and wisdom in the use of it. I am a priest of Mistra, yes, but there's a priestess of Mistra greater far than I am. You must go to see her soon, outside the forest. Her temple is at Lady House Falls, and she knows more of the ways of men and where you should go in the days ahead. Almara frowned. I... ye are right... I do grow restless, but I don't want to leave. The elf smiled. Ah, but you do. Then his smile vanished, and he added, And before you go, I'd like to see that revealment spell cast properly for once. Elmara sighed. It's just a spell I've a little trouble with, one among, what is it, two score or more? Brea raised his eyebrows and hands together. Just a spell? Lass, lass, nothing should ever be just a spell to you. Revere magic, remember? Else it's just a faster sword or longer lance to you, only a grubbing after more power than you can grasp by other means. It's not that to me, Almara protested, turning on him angrily. Oh, before I came here, perhaps, do you think I've learned nothing from you? Easy, lass, easy. I'm not a mage lord, remember? El stared at him for a moment and then managed to laugh. I did hold my temper and tongue better when I was a thief, didn't I? Brayer shrugged. You were a man, then, in a city of men, with a close friend to joke with, and you knew every moment that lack of iron control would mean death. Now you're a woman, attuned to the forest, feeling its flows of emotion and energy. Little things are more intense outside the crowded city, more raw, more engaging. He smiled and added, I can't believe I've started babbling so much, and like a human sage, too, since you've been here. Elmara laughed. I have done some good then. Brayer flipped the tip of one of his ears back and forth with a finger, a gesture of mild derision among elves, and said, I believe I mentioned a revealment spell. Elle rolled her eyes. Didn't think I could lead ye into forgetting about it forever. Brayer gave her an imperious wave that she knew meant get on with it and folded his arms across his chest. Elmara assumed an apologetic little last smile for a moment, 
then turned to face the pool. Spreading her arms wide, she closed her eyes and whispered the prayer to Mistra, feeling the power within her surge up her arms and outward, expanding. She opened her eyes, expecting to see the familiar blue glows of magic on the pool, perhaps on the rock where Mistra's flame had manifested, and when she swung around here and there on Brayer's body, where he wore or carried small tokens of magic. Ah! Uh. Staggered, she stepped back, letting her hands fall. Everything was bright and blinding blue wherever she looked. Was the whole world alive with magic? Yes, Brer replied calmly, reading her thoughts again. At last you are able to see it. Now, he went on briskly, you were still having a little trouble with casting a sphere of spells, were you not? She turned angry eyes on him, but recoiled again, astonished. The tall, dignified elf she knew stood watching her, but in the special sight the spell gave her was revealed a blaze with magic of great power, and the blue-white glow around him rose into the shadowy shape of a dragon. Ye, ye're a dragon! Sometimes, Brayer shrugged, I take that shape, but I'm truly an elf who's learned how to take on dragon shape, not the other way around. I'm the last reason the mage lords did so much dragon hunting in Athalantar. The last reason? The others, he said tightly, are dead. They saw to it very efficiently. Oh, Elmara said quietly. I'm sorry, Brer. Why? he asked lightly. You didn't do it. Tis the mage lords who should be sorry, and I and my kin are counting on you to make them so some day. Elmara drew herself up. I intend to, soon. The elf shook his head. No, lass, not yet. You aren't ready. And a single archmage, no matter how mighty, can't hope to succeed against all the mage lords and their servant creatures if they whelm against you. He smiled and added, And you haven't even learned to be an archmage yet. Set aside revenge for a time. Tis best savored when one waits a long time for it anyway. Elmara sighed. I may die of old age with the mage lord still lording over Athalantar. I've read that fear in your mind often since we first met, Brayer replied, and I know it will drive you until your death. Or theirs. It's why you must leave the high forest before it starts to feel like a cage around you. Elmara took a deep breath, then nodded. When should I go? Brer smiled. As soon as I've conjured up crying towels for us both. Elves hate long, sad farewells even more than humans do. El tried to laugh, but sudden tears welled up and burst forth. You see, Brayer said lightly, stepping forward to embrace her. Elmara saw tears in his own eyes before they embraced fiercely. The night was soft and still and deep blue overhead as El left the familiar shade of the forest and headed across the rolling hills toward distant Lady House Falls. She felt suddenly naked, away from the sheltering trees, but fought down the urge to hurry. Folk in too much haste made excellent targets for outlaws with bows, and with no foe in sight and a heavy load of sausage, roast fowl, cheese, wine, and bread riding between her shoulder blades, she really had no need to hurry. She struck the Hastarl Road and almost immediately passed by the last marker cairn. It felt marvelous to set foot outside the kingdom of the stag for the first time in her life. Almara breathed deeply of the crisp air of fast-approaching leaffall and looked at the land around as she went. She was wading through waist-deep brush, where the great fires had been set ten years agone to drive the elves out of all these lands and take them for men. But men huddled in ever more crowded cities and towns along the Delambir, and summer by summer the forest crept back to reclaim the hills. Soon the elves, more bitter and swifter with their arrows than they'd once been, would return too. Here shadow tops rose like a dark stand of halberds, there two hawks circled high in the clear air. She went on with joy in her step, and did not halt until it grew too dark to go on, and the wolves began to howl.
She'd expected more than a few ragged stone cottages and a tumble-down barn, but the road ran on and up through the trees toward a distant roar of water. This must be Lady House Falls. The road narrowed to a deep-rutted cart trail and turned east. A little path led off it into the trees, along which came the sound of water. Elmara took the way it offered and came out in a field broken by a huge fire-scarred sheet of rock, with the rushing river hard by and a high-peaked hall in front of her. Ivy was thick on its old stones, and its door was dark, but to Elmara's mage sight it blazed blue, the heart of a web of radiant lines sweeping out across the fields and down the trail she had walked upon. That strand blinked beneath her feet. She stepped aside hastily and advanced thereafter by walking on the mosses beside the trail. She almost fell over the old woman in dark robes who was kneeling in the dirt, planting small yellow-green things and covering them over deeply. I was wondering if you'd stride right through my bed without seeing me at all, she said without looking up, her voice sharp-edged but amused. Elmara stared and then swallowed, finding herself shy. My pardon, lady, in truth I saw thee not. I seek the glories of Mistra, I know. The wrinkled hands patted another plant into its resting place, like so many tiny graves, El thought suddenly, and the white-haired head came up. Elmara found herself looking into two clear eyes of green flame that seemed to thrust right through her like two emerald blades. Why? El found herself bereft of words. She opened her mouth twice, and then the third time blurted out, I... Mr. spoke to me. She said it had been a long time since she'd met such a one as me. She asked me to kneel to her, and I did. Unable to meet that bright gaze longer, Elmara looked away. Aye, so they all say. I suppose she told thee to worship her as well. She wrote that, aye. I... What has life taught thee thus far, young maid? Elmara raised steady blue-gray eyes to meet that glittering green gaze. The old woman's eyes seemed even brighter than before, but she was determined to hold them with her own, and she did. I've learned how to hate, steal, grieve, and kill, she said. I hope there's more to being a priestess of Mistra than that. The wrinkled old mouth crooked. For many, not much more. Let's see if we can do better with thee. She looked down at the bed in front of her and tapped thoughtfully at the loose earth. What must I do to begin? Elmara asked, looking down at the dirt. There seemed to be nothing of interest there, but perhaps the priestess meant that she should tend plants, as Brayer had wanted her to learn the ways of the woods. She looked around. Hadn't there been a shovel thrust into the earth nearby? As if the old woman could read her thoughts, as of course she doubtless could, El thought wryly, the priestess shook her head. After all these years, she said, I've learned how to do this right, lass. The last thing I need is eager but careless hands mucking in, or a young impatient tongue asking me questions more than Eve through. Nay, get ye gone. Gone? Go and walk the world, lass. Mistra doesn't gather toothless chanting men or maids to kneel to stones carved in her seeming. All Faroon around us is Mistra's true temple. She waved a bony hand. Go and do as I bid thus, and listen well, lass. Learn from mages without yourself taking the title or spell-hurling habits of a wizard. Spread word of the power of magic, its mysteries and lore. Make folk you meet hunger to work magic themselves, and give those who seem most eager a taste of spell-casting, for no more payment than food and a place to sleep. Make maids and men into mages. Al frowned doubtfully. How shall I know when I'm doing right? Is there anything I should not do? The priestess shook her head. Be guided by your own heart, but know that Mistra forbids nothing. Go and experience everything that can befall a man and a maid in Faroon. Everything. Al frowned again. Slowly she turned away. That sharp voice came again. Sit down and eat first, fool head. 
Bitterness lends the weak-witted wings. Always try to make a stop to eat into a time to think, and you'll think more in a season than most think in all their days. Elmara smiled slightly, threw her cloak back, and sat, reaching for the shoulder sack Brer had given her. The old woman shook her head again and snapped her fingers. Out of nowhere, a wooden platter of steaming greens appeared in front of El. Then a silver fork blinked into being above it and hung motionless in the air. Reluctantly, El reached out for it. The old woman snorted. Frightened of a little magic? A fine advocate of Mr. Yulby. I have seen magic used to slay and destroy and rule through fear, Elmara said slowly. Wherefore, I'm wary of it. She took firm hold of the fork. I did not choose to look upon Mistra. She came to me. Then be more grateful. Some wizards dream of seeing her all their lives and die disappointed. The white-haired head bent to regard the dirt again. If you hate or fear magic so much, why have you come here? Silence stretched. To do a thing I am sworn to do, Almara said finally. I need strong magic and to understand what it is I wield. Well, then, eat and get you going. Mind you try some of that thinking, I suggest. Thinking of what? That I leave to you. Remember, Mistra forbids nothing. Think of everything? T'would be a welcome change. The old woman watched until the young maid in the cloak was gone through the trees. Then she went on watching. A few trees were nothing to her. Finally she turned and walked to the temple, growing as she went, her shape shifting and rising until a tall and shapely lady in shimmering iridescent robes strolled to the temple door. She turned once more to look where Elmara had gone. Her eyes were dark and yet golden, and little flames danced in them. Seen enough? The voice from the darkness within the door was a deep rumble. Mistra tossed her head, long glossy hair slithered and danced. This could be the one. His mind has the width, and his heart the depth. The temple rippled, flowed, and shifted, even as she had done, and split, revealing itself as a bronze dragon rising away from around a much smaller stone house. The dragon stretched out gigantic wings with a creak and a sigh, and inclined its head until one wise old eye regarded the goddess. Its voice was a purr so deep that the front of the stone house shivered, as did all the others, those many, many others. Having this skill doesn't mean one must or will use it rightly and take the true path. True, Mr. answered, a certain soft bitterness in her tone, and then she smiled and laid a hand on its scales. My thanks, faithful friend, until next we fly together. As gently as if it were brushing her with a feather, the dragon stroked her cheek with one massive claw. Then it drew in its wings and melted, dwindling down into the form of a bent, wrinkled, white-haired woman with bright green eyes. Without a backward glance, the priestess went into the temple, moving with the slow gait and bent back of age. Mistress sighed, turned away herself, and became a dazzling web of lights that whirled and spun faster and faster until she was gone. The sack Brayer had given her proved to hold over twenty silver coins at the bottom, wrapped in a scrap of hide. That was not so many that she could afford to hurl them away for a warm bed every night, at least before the deep snows came down on the world. Hedges and thickets were her bedchambers, but Elmara usually warmed herself of evenings at an inn with a hot meal and a seat as close to the hearth as she could manage. Lone young women walking the roads were few, but conjuring a little mage fire and looking mysterious always kept any over-amorous local men at a distance. This night found her in the latest house of raised flagons, somewhere in the Mlembrin lands. 
To all who would listen, she spun tales of the glory of magic, tales drawn from what Brer and Helm and the streets of Hastarl had told her. Sometimes these tales won her a few drinks, and on nights when the gods smiled, someone else would tell stories of sorcery to top her own, and thereby tell her more of what most folk thought of magic, and win her new marvels to tell on evenings to come. She had hopes of that happening this night. Two men, at least, were edging forward in their chairs, itching to unburden themselves of something, as she warmed to the height of her most splendid tale. And the last king and all his court saw of the nine royal wizards, they were standing on thin air, facing each other in a circle, already higher than the tallest turret of the castle, and rising. Elmara drew breath dramatically, looked around at her rapt audience, and went on. Lightnings danced ever faster between their hands, weaving a web so bright that it hurt the eyes to look upon it. But the last thing the king saw ere they rose out of sight was a dragon appearing in the midst of those lightnings, fading in, he said. And then a curtain across a booth in the back of the room parted, and Elmara knew she was in trouble. The eager men turned hurriedly away, and the room filled with the sudden tension centered on a splendidly dressed curl-bearded man who was striding across the room toward her. Rings gleamed on his fingers, and anger shone in his eyes. You, outlander! Elmara raised a mild eyebrow. Good man? Lord to you, I am Lord Mage Dunstein, and I bid you take heed, wench. The man drew himself up importantly, and Elmara knew that though he looked only at her, he was aware of everyone in the room. The matters you so idly speak of are not fancies, but sorcery. The Lord Mage strutted grandly forward and said sharply, Magic interests everyone with its power, but it is, and rightly, an art of secrets, secrets to be learned only by those fit to know them. If you are wise, you will cease your talk of sorcery at once. At the end of his words, the room was very still, and into that silence Elmara said quietly, I was told to speak of magic wherever I go. Oh, by whom? A priestess of Mistra. And why, Lord Mage Dunstein asked with silken derision, would a priestess of Mistra waste three words on you? Color rose in Elmara's cheeks, but she answered as quietly as before. She was expecting me. Oh, who sent you out into Faroon to seek priestesses of the Holy Lady of Mysteries? Mistra. Elmara said quietly. Oh, Mistra, of course, the wizard scoffed openly. I suppose she talked to you. She did. Oh, then what did she look like? Like eyes floating in flame, and then as a tall woman, dark-robed and dark-eyed. Lord Mage Dunstein addressed the ceiling. Faroon is home to many mad folk, some so lost in their wits, I've heard, that they can delude even themselves. Elmara set down her tankard. Ye've used many proud, provoking words, Lord Mage, and they tell me ye think thyself a wizard of some local importance. The wizard stiffened, eyes flashing. Elmara held up a staying hand. I've heard many times in my life that wizards are seekers after truth. Well then, so important a wizard as thyself should have spells enough to determine if I speak truly. She sat back in her chair and added, Ye bade me speak no more of magic. Well then, I bid ye, use thy spells to see my truth and stay thine own talk of madness and wild lies. The Lord Mage shrugged. I'll not waste spells on a mad woman. Elmara shrugged in turn, turned away, and said, As I was saying, the last the king ever saw of his royal wizards, their lightnings were chaining a dragon they'd summoned, and it was spitting fire at them. The Lord Mage glared at the young woman, but Elmara ignored him. The wizard cast angry glances around the room, but men carefully did not meet his eyes, and from where he wasn't glaring, there came chuckles. After a moment, Lord Mage Dunstein turned, robes swirling, 
and stalked back to his private booth. Elmara shrugged and talked on. The moon was bright, riding high above the few cold fingers of the cloud that crept along above the trees. Elmara drew her cloak closer around herself. Clear nights like this brought a frost chill and hurried on. Before seeking the inn, she'd chosen a fern-choked hollow ahead to bed down in. Far behind her, branches snapped. It wasn't the first such sound she'd heard. Elmara paused to listen a moment, and then went on, moving a little faster. She came to the hollow and darted across it, clambering up its far bank and turning to crouch among the bushes there. Then she did off her cloak and sack and waited. As she'd expected, the stalker was no excited young lad wanting to hear more of magic, but a certain lord mage moving uncertainly now in the darkness. Elmara decided to get this over with. Fair even, lord mage, she said calmly, keeping low among the ferns. The wizard paused, stepped back, and hissed some words. A breath later, the night exploded in flames. Elmara dived aside as searing heat rolled over her. When she had her feet under her again and her breath back, she forced herself to say laconically, A campfire would have been sufficient. Then she tossed a rock to one side, and as it crashed down through the brush, leaped to her feet and ran in the other direction around the edge of the hollow. The mage's next fireball exploded well away from her. Die, dangerous fool! Elmara pointed at the wizard who stood clearly outlined by moonlight and murmured the words of a prayer to Mistra. Her hand tingled, and the lord mage was abruptly hurled backward, crashing roughly through bushes. God spit on you, outlander, the wizard cursed, clawing his painful way to his feet. Elmara heard cloth tearing and another hissed curse. I don't hurl fire at women whose only offense is not cringing before me, Elmara said coldly. Why are ye doing this? The Lord Mage stepped forward into the light again. Elmara raised her hands, waiting to ward off magic, but no spell came. Dunstein snarled in anger. Elle sighed and whispered a spell of her own. Blue-white light outlined the mage's head, and she saw his features twist and struggle as he found himself compelled to speak truthfully. The string of fearful curses he was spitting became the words, I don't want half the folk in Faroon to work magic. What price my powers then, eh? Dunstein's voice rose into a wordless shriek of fear. You live now only at my whim, wizard, Elmara told him, pretending a casualness she did not feel. If his fear would just keep him from weaving another fireball. Swallowing her own rising fear, Elmara uttered another prayer to Mistra. When the tingling in her limbs told her its magic had taken effect, she strode off the lip of the hollow, walking on empty air to stand facing the wizard. She pointed down, trembling with the effort to hold herself in midair. I do not wish to slay ye, Lord Mage. Mistra bade me bring more magic into Faroon, not rob the realms of the lives and skills of wizards. The Lord Mage gulped and took a quick step back, he obviously thought less of his powers than he'd pretended to in the tavern. And so, Go to thy home and trouble me no more, Elmara said in a voice of doom, and I shall not bring down the curse of Mistra on thee. That sounded good. And the priestess had told him to try everything. If Mistra thought her words ill said, she'd doubtless say so soon enough. The night remained still and silent, except for the sounds made by Lord Mage Dunstein backing hurriedly away through ferns and brambles. Hold! Elmara put the ring of command into her words. She felt herself sinking slowly toward the ground as she turned her will back to her truth compulsion spell. Dunstein froze as if someone had tugged on a leash about his neck. Elmara said to his moonlit back, I was told to learn all I could from the mages I met. Where would you suggest I go to learn more about being a mage? The magic of her truth compulsion glowed brightly around the Lord Mage, but he did not turn, so Elmara did not see his twisted smile. 
Go see Ilhandil, ruler of the Kalashar, and ask him that, and you shall have the best answer any living man can give. Most intruders wandered in the maze, calling helplessly until Ilhandil tired of their cries and had them brought to an audience chamber or released the lions to feed. This young lass, however, strode through the illusory walls and around the portal traps as if she could see them. Ilhandil leaned forward to peer out the window in sudden interest as Elmara strode out onto the broad pavement in front of the great gate, peered narrowly up at it, and then walked without hesitation toward the hidden door, avoiding the golems and the statues whose welcoming hands could spit lightnings at those who stepped between them. The mad mage valued his privacy and life, and not many days passed without someone trying to deprive him of either. Thus his castle of sorcery was ringed by traps mechanical as well as magical. Now one of his long-fingered hands tapped idly on the table. He seized a slim brass hammer, lifted it, and rapped on a certain bell. At his signal, unseen men sweated below ground, and the paving stones suddenly opened up under the young woman, who obligingly plunged from view. Ilhundel smiled tightly and turned to the tall, handsome servant who stood patiently awaiting his orders. Gerotic obligingly glided forward. Lord, go and see that one's body, he said, and bring back— Lord, the servant's rapt word was urgent. Ilhundel followed his gaze even before he could raise his arm to point— the wizard wheeled around in his chair. The young intruder was walking on air, treading steadily forward on nothing and rising up out of the yawning pit. Ilhundel raised his eyebrows and leaned forward. Gerardic, he said decisively, go down and bring that maid to me, alive, if she can stay that way until you get there. A priestess of Mistra told me to learn about sorcery from mages, and a mage told me you were the best man alive to tell me what it is to work magic. Ilhundel smiled thinly. Why do you want to learn magic if you don't want to be a mage? I must serve Mistra as best I can, Elmara said steadily, even as she commanded me. Ilhundel nodded. And so, Elmara, you seek mages to tell you the ways of sorcery, so you can better serve the Lady of Mysteries. Elmara nodded. Ilhundel waved his hands, and darkness enshrouded the chamber, save for two globes of radiance that hung above the mad mage and the young intruder. They looked at each other, and when Ilhundel spoke again, his voice echoed with tones of doom. Know then, O Elmara, that you must apprentice yourself to a mage, and once you learn to hurl fire and lightning, slip away without a word to anyone, travel far, and join an adventuring band, then see the realms, face danger, and use your spells in earnest. The ruler of the Kalashar leaned forward, voice thinning in urgent precision. When you can battle a lich spell for spell and prevail, seek Ondil's Book of Spells, and take it to the altar of Mistra on the island called Mistra's Dance. Surrender it to the goddess there. His voice changed again, thundering once more. Once you know you hold Ondil's tome in your hands, look no longer on its pages, nor seek to learn the spells therein, for that is the sacrifice Mistra demands. Go now and do this. The light above the mad mage's high seat faded, leaving Elmara facing darkness. My thanks, she said, and turned away. As she walked back down the great chamber, the globe of light moved with her. The light faded beyond the great bronze doors, which ground shut with their usual boom. When the echoes had died away, Ilhundel added quietly, And once you've got me that book... Go and get yourself killed, mageling. Gerardic's handsome features melted soundlessly into the fanged and scaled horror of his true face. The scaled minion stepped forward and asked curiously, 
Why, master? The mad mage frowned. I've never met anyone with so much latent power before. If she lives, she could grow in magic to master the realms. He shrugged. But she'll die. Gerardic took another step, his tail scraping along the floor. And if she does not master? Ilhundel smiled and said, You will see to it that she does. Part 4 Magus 10. In the Floating Tower Great adventure? Ha! Frantic fear and scrabbling about in tombs or worse, spilling blood or trying to strike down things that can no longer bleed. If ye are a mage, it lasts only until some other wizard hurls a spell faster than thee. Speak to me not of great adventure. Theldon Fire Hurler Earson Teachings of an Angry Old Mage Year of the Griffin It was a cold, clear day in early Marpanoth, in the year of much ale. The leaves on the trees all around were touched with gold and flame orange as the brave blades reined in beneath the place they'd sought for so long. Their destination hung dark and silent above them, the floating tower, the lifeless hold of the long-dead mage Ondeal, hidden away in his bramble-choked ravine in the wilderlands somewhere well west of Horn Hills. Upright it stood, a lone crumbling stone tower reaching into the bright sky. But as the tales had said, its base was a ruin of tumbled stones, and there was a stretch of empty air twelve men or so high between the ground and the dark empty room of the tower's sixth level. Ondeal's tower hung patiently in the air, as it had for centuries, held up by an awesome sorcery. The blades looked up at it, and then looked away, except for the only woman among them, who stood with the wand raised warily, peering past her hawk nose at the silent waiting keep hanging above her. The blades had come here by a long and perilous road. In a spider-haunted sorcerer's tomb of lost Veravel, said by some to be the land of mages from which Netheril sprang, they'd found writings that spoke of the mighty arch-wizard Ondeal and his withdrawal in his later days into a spell-guarded tower to craft many new and powerful sorceries. Then old Longarn of the blades crafted a potion to make his limbs young again, drank it, and fell screaming into crumbling dust before their eyes, and they were without a mage. The brave blades dared not take the road again without so much as a light-bringing incantation to aid them. So when a young woman came to their inn and spun tales of the wonders of magic and proved she could work spells of a sort, they practically dragged this Elmara into their ranks. She was not a pretty woman, her fierce hawk nose and dark serious gaze made many a man and most maids draw back from her, and she rode garbed as a warrior in boots and breeches, avoiding the robes and airs of most mages. None of the blades felt inclined to lure her to bed, even if the threat of defensive spells weren't hanging around her. Her first demand was for time to study the spell books Longarn would never read again, and the second was for a chance to use them. The blades granted her that, riding out to make red war on a band of brigands who oppressed that land. In the crumbling old keep, the defeated band used as their stronghold, Elmara found wands they could not use and books of spells they could not read, and bore these out in triumph. All the next winter, as the howling winds piled up snow deep and cold outside, the blades sat before fires, sharpened their swords, and told restless tales of what bright deeds they'd done and what brighter things they would do when summer came again. Apart from them, the young sorceress studied. Her eyes grew deep-set and heavy-lidded, and her body ever more gaunt. She squinted as she went about and used few words, her wits distant and confused, for all the world as if the spells baffled her. Yet she could conjure fires in rooms that the winter had chilled, and light for them all to see by without enduring the smoke of fires and candles 
or the work of chopping firewood. The blades learned to keep out of her way, for their every plan brought from her an earnest torrent of moral questions. Should we slay such